Thank you and Dank Lu Nasidzu Usma Asi. Especially a, a huge Dank Lu Nasidzu Usma Asi to the Imanetlu Cultural Arts Program. At this time, I'd like to ask the attendees to please begin taking their seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the bendition and remain standing for the National Anthem of the United States of America and the Guam Hymn, which will be sung by Luke Tetauto. We also ask that you, re that you please remain standing for the delivery of the invocation by Polly Mike Chrysostomo. <laughs>
Sign up. Sign up. So proudly we've held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we've watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet Samoru Purita Nota Kantai Matu Nan Yagi Toru Ilu God Parai Onra Parai Gloria Abiba Isla Sin Paran Parai Onra Parai Gloria, Abiba Isla Sin Parad. Utodu i tempu i pas parahita, Zanginini langit na bendishon. Contrai piligru na fans of Fuham, Zeus protehi is languam. Contrai piligru na fans of Fuham. Zeus protehi is languam. Inifresi, genini mastakilu gihina soku. Imastakalum gi kurasonhu. Zani mas figu nani nat senyahu. Who fresh in my sadzu, Parabai Prutehi, Zan who defendi, I hinengi, I kotura, I lenguahi, I airi, I hanum, Zani tanu tamoru, Niren shaku, diretsu, genina zuus tata, Esti who are fitma, I hilu i biblia, Zani banderahu, I bandera and guahan. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Inanitata, Zanilahinia, Zen Spiritu Santo. Amen. Let us bless God whose might has created the earth and whose providence has enriched it. He has given us the earth to cultivate so that we may gather its fruits to sustain us in life. But as we thank God for his graciousness, let us also learn, as the gospel teaches, to seek first his kingship over us, his way of holiness then all our needs will be given us besides. Let us pray. O oh God, 
from the very beginning of time, you commanded the earth to bring forth vegetation and fruit of every kind. You provide the sower with seed and give bread to eat. Grant, we pray, that our Pacific Islands, enriched by your bounty and cultivated by human hands, may be fertile with abundant crops. Then your people, enriched by the gifts of your goodness, will praise you unceasingly, now and for ages unending. For we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Honorable leaders, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues and friends, from Iyakwe to Hafade, to Ali to Kasaleli, Rananim to Mogatin, Tiro to Talofa. Come on. Talofa. Very good. One more? One more time? Sherry said that the governor said, one more time. Talofa. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the 30th Pacific Islands Environment Conference. My name is Conchita San Nicolas Titano. I'm the chairperson for this event, along with my co-chair, the incomparable, where is she? Julie Men Juliana Mendoza. Wave. She's right back there. <laughs> to our visiting Native American family, families from the Washoe tribe. The, Wash the Washishu, Hunga Miheshi, from the Pasqua Yaki tribe, Amane Tovote M. Yevihenui. Did I get that right? <laughs> For those attendees who are first time travelers to this region, welcome to Guam. Welcome to the One Marianas. Welcome to magnificent Micronesia. Welcome to the Pacific, the Blue Continent. Come on. Let's go. We have a full schedule for this event, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming the administrator for the Guam Environmental Protection Agency, Mr. Walter S. Leon Guerrero, who will provide his remarks. Sir? So, Governor, I, I don't follow protocols very well, so we got a special thing, so I'm going to ask the, the team, the family of Guam EPA to come up here, please. So you guys just got to bear with me. If those that know me, I, I work hard. Again, I don't follow the protocol very well, but we make things happen. And for me and what I do with Guam EPA, I, I could not do anything with, this, with my family back here. And so I want them to introduce themselves to you so you know who Guam EPA, you know what these people do, and you can ask them, you can search them out. So with that, <laughs> Half a day. And Conchita means Koshayan way of saying our oh, greetings. So here I am, Lenwo for Koshayan. So anyway, my name is Petwin Haloka. Um, I'm very grateful and happy to be here. Uh, I uh, am the supervisor for the pesticide enforcement program. Just want to, I don't want to take too much time, but in 2010, and 2007, we created the Pesticide Act and regulations. Folks, there's a lot of things to say, but I want to say this. There has been a tremendous decrease in uh, illegal pesticide coming to Guam. We help with farmers, we help with uh, housekeepers, janitors, and cleaners, and we are developing ways to protect our folks and uh, people that call Guam uh, their home. And so I came here in 1980, almost 39 years from the island of Koshai. And I'm so proud to be a Guamanian. I'm doing the best I can. And so thank you all, and God bless you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Tatauta. I'm from the Airline Division. Half a day, I'm Maria Duenas, and I'm from the Solid Waste Division, Erin Land. 
Hi, um, I'm Laura Kanai, and I'm with the Solid Waste uh, Program. Ali. Francine Tideguy, and I'm with the Permit Team. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Marika Kesson from Water Pollution Control Program. I'm Meg Castro. I'm in the Admin Division. Lu Chuang, uh, got a blank. <laughs> Air pollution control. Um, in Vietnamese, we say, Chào các bạn. Today I'm uh, Reed Duggan. I'm with the uh, Brownfields program. Hi, Maganda Ngabi. My name is Edwin Aranza. I'm from Green Parcels. Half a day. My name is Michelle Lastimosa, Green Parcels, Desmoa, Hazardous Materials. <laughs> Half a day. My name is Arlene Ekfaji, and I am the board secretary and executive secretary to Walter. Connie of JE with the Administration Division. Buenas and half a day. I'm Angela Picardi. I'm with the Admin Division. Um, Kristen Finney. Um, I'm the Legal Counsel. Yeah. Hello, I'm Annie Leon Guerrero, Monitoring Program. Half a day, Helen Gumatata from Water Pollution Control. Half a day, my name is Verani Charfras, and I'm from Water Pollution Control. Yes. Yeah. Half a day, I'm Delianit from Environmental Monitoring and Analytical Services. Today, I'm Rudy Paulino from the Analytical Services Program. I'm the chemist who tests your beach water sample, beach water every week. All today, I'm Bob Salas. I work for the island of Guam under the monitoring program. Oh. <laughs> All today, I'm Galo Bulura and I work for uh, Green Parcels this more as ways. Buenas and half a day. My name is Renee Schnabel Chrysostomo, and I'm a biologist in the monitoring division. Half a day. I'm Sabrina Cruz Sablon. I work for the Solid Waste Program, handling the recycling activities. Half a day. My name is Francis Mendiola, Water Resources Management Program, Water Division. Half a day, uh, my name is Romeo Zacharias. I'm with Admin, Guam EPA IT. Half a day, I'm Dari Guzman for the Pesticide Enforcement Program. Half a day, I'm Brian Bearden with the US Public Health Service and I'm here on a detail agreement with US EPA serving as the Chief Engineer and Water Division Director. Bonus and half a day, Jesse Cruz, Environmental Monitoring and Analytical Services. Okay, finally, half a day, Maganda Umaga. I'm Mevani Hisita. I work for the Hazardous Waste Management Program. <laughs> half a day, everyone. I'm Carmen Sita Cortez, working for Safe Drinking Water Program. Menanda Sidus, Glenn Nicholas. The Solid Waste Management Program, Air and Land Division. Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Marquez with Water Division. <laughs> Buenas and half a day. My name is Velma Balahaja, and I'm with the permit team. Welcome to Guam. Half a day, my name is Elvis Ventura, Water Resources, Guam EPA, as an environmental engineer. He just wants it, thank you. Good morning, half a day, Mabuhay. 
My name is Noni Amar, Program Manager, Water Resources Management Program. Good day and welcome to Guam. My name is Roland Gutierrez with the Air Pollution Control Program. Buenas and half a day. Good morning. My name is Margaret Aguilar. Uh, I work the Nonpoint Source Program. Uh, let's protect our surface waters. Half a day. Uh, Don Kinata, uh, Has Waste Management Program. Half a day, everybody. <laughs> Governor. Thank you for joining us, Maga Haga of Guam. Uh, I'm going to take up, and to all our guests, all our visitors, all our facilitators, thank you. And I take the moment to thank Mr. Leon Guerrero and my team, Guam EPA. Um, everyone, it took a really, really long time to get this together, but I think it looks beautiful. So I appreciate my team. My team is badass. And yes, Guam, Lina La. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah. Oh, my name's JR. Padua. <laughs> Good morning and half a day. My name is Taryn Mesa. I'm a biologist with the monitoring program. Half a day. I'm Chris Duenas. I'm with the admin division and permit team. Half a day, my name is Rusli Gohoya, Water Pollution Control. Half a day, my name is Vincent Fry, I'm with Guam EP. Half a day, good morning, and uh, I'm Johnny Bedania from Water Pollution Control Program. Half a day, my name is Kiyoki Narcis, I work with the monitoring program. Half a day, welcome to Guam. I'm Mike O'Malley from Has Waste Management Program. Half a day, Guam is considered Titano, Air and Land Division Administrator. And I am Juliana Mendoza with the uh, Safe Drinking Water Program. And we, we are, are the chair, chair and co chair. Co -chair. <laughs> <laughs> so, so please give it up to the family of Guam EPA. Thank you. So, I, <laughs> Nick, come on. <laughs> Hi, half a day, everybody. Nick Rupley, Administrative Division. <laughs> so that uh, the two co chairs don't kill me because I took all my time already. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to introduce uh, a fellow cabinet member that uh, that took over and take, uh, doing the uh, Coastal uh, Coral Reef Symposium and our, our partner in this, uh, Tyrone Titano. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, for those of you who missed my um, introduction yesterday, I'm director of the Bureau of Statistics and Plans, and we're very proud to be a small contributor to the success of this event. And I want to congratulate my colleague, uh, Walter, and his impressive team for uh, bringing off this really, uh, truly uh, marvelous and valuable event. Uh, the staff of the Bureau have been involved in organizing the Coral Reef Symposium, which began yesterday. And the staff of our Coastal Zone Management Program over there, uh, Gil Sukanan and Marilyn Guerrero, are here to help provide additional support staff for this event. Uh, but the assignment the organizers of the event have given me is to introduce our next speaker. Now, for those of us who live in Guam who have just gone through a rather lengthy and intense gubernatorial election, we're all fairly familiar with the life and career of Governor Lulian Guerrero. But for the benefit of our off on guests, or those in the audience who are kind of too young to remember all the uh, she's done over her life, I'll just briefly go over it. Although she now holds Guam's highest elective office, Lulian Guerrero began a professional career not in politics, but as a nurse. She actually today remains uh, a registered nurse. She has been worked in clinics and hospitals in the mainland in Guam. She has held nursing management positions in both the public and private sector. 
And from nursing, she ran, tried for elective office and was successfully elected to five terms in the Guam legislature, where she held a number of posts, including Majority Leader and Chairman Rules and Chairman Committee on Health. And she tackled a broad array of issues dealing with the environment and indigenous rights and, uh, and health. And as a fact, is responsible for a number of landmark pieces of legislation, which still contribute to the well-being of this community, including laws banning smoking in restaurants and bars, and also creating a Healthy Futures Fund with a de designated revenue source for health programs. Uh, about, about a decade ago, she became president of the Bank of Guam, which is the island's first locally chartered bank. And under her tenure, the assets of the Bank of Guam doubled to be it being the $2 billion enterprise it is today. Uh, last November, she made history, being elected as Guam's first woman governor. And as governor, she's continued to push aggressively on a number of fronts, including the environment and areas dealing with zero waste, climate change, and yesterday signing a new executive order for Guam's new coal reef resiliency strategy. Lulian Gorel today as governor remains what she has always been, a fervent champion and defender of the environmental heritage of the people of Guam, whether it be inside the fence line or outside the fence line. It is therefore my privilege and honor to introduce, to give her welcoming remarks, our Magahaga, the Honorable Lourdes Liang Guerrero, Governor of Guam. Hafidei, buenas. Komen mamulika amzu. Komen magu famzu. Sa guahu gos magufu pagunadia. So, members of the 35th Guam Legislature, CNMI Senators, we have our CNMI Senator here, Jude Hoff Schneider. And I don't know if Francisco Borja is here. Also, our mayor, Eldon, uh, Edwin Alden, Rear Admiral Sashana Chatfield. Honored guests, my brothers and sisters from the Pacific Islands. And I do mean that very closely to my heart. Welcome to the 30th Pacific Island Environmental Conference. You know, um, we had a really good uh, opening with our local culture, singing to our Sina, to our mother, and also the Inafresi. And if you listen to the Inafresi, it really is talking about preserving our culture, our island, our people, our language, our air, our air and waters and, and saying that in a blessing way and saying that we promise on top of our Bible and our, and our flag that we will protect our people and we will in our rights honor what we have in our islands. So that is so appropriate and applicable to today's environmental conference. Last night, I was with a group of local Chamorro people, young and old, who was very passionate in protecting our environment, our culture, and our ancestors. Again, very applicable and very appropriate for today's conference. We in Guam are proud to host this important environmental conference that will address so many of the challenges that we in our Pacific Islands face in building sustainable communities and protecting our environmental heritage. So much of our identity as Pacific Islanders is tied to our relationship to our land, our relationship to our ocean, and our relationship to our sky above. Too often, this relationship is described in a Western context. But the bond that we as Pacific Islanders have with the environment predates contact with the Western colonial powers that have governed us for most of the past few centuries. It is a spiritual connection that ties us, in, ties us to our sense of place, 
of family and of community. To us, more is at stake here than environmental standards and economies. What is at stake here is the future of our respective culture and societies. My congratulations, therefore, go out to all those who worked so hard in organizing this event, including the two uh, twins up here, that's the chair and the co-chair, uh, Conchita Titanu and her co-chair, uh, Juliana Mendoza. Thank you. Of course... Of course, I have to give a great acknowledgement to our administrator, Walter Leon Guerrero, who, by the way, yes, is related to me. So I am very, very um, proud of my uh, primo over there. <laughs> and of course, his staff at the Guam Environmental um, administration and I love the uniform. I think it should be your uniform every day uh, at work. It gives a great new freshness, I think, and energy to uh, your uh, department. And of course, our Bureau of Statistics uh, Director Tyrone Titanu, who and his staff, who Tyrone, if you know him, uh, is a speed guy. He he has his speed is no less than a hundred miles an hour, and sometimes just listening to him makes me tired. So, but great ideas, you know. Really was very excited about this conference, and I know it's going to be a big and a good conference in this next few days. Corey Hines and the team from Jacobs Engineering. Of course, Therese Arroyo Metanani and her team at Greenlight Media Productions. And of course, all the federal and regional partners as well as private sector sponsors whose support was so vital in making this conference a reality. The theme of this year's conference, Greening Growth in the Pacific, truly speaks to what I believe is the right vision for the future of all our islands. In the past, it was a common place to present the need for growth and the need for a clean environment as competing considerations. In reality, we know that choosing between economic growth and the environment is a false choice. It is more than possible to both grow your economy and safeguard our environment. In fact, if you don't adequately protect our environment, the resulting consequences will kill our economy. This is especially true for us in the Pacific Islands, where major components of our economy, such as tourism, Fisheries and agriculture are based on an environment that is clean and sustainable. You have an impressive agenda that began earlier this week with training and certification programs and the Coral Reef Symposium at which I signed the executive order implementing Guam's new Coral Reef Resilience Strategy. But I believe what is most impressive is the practical solutions this conference is presenting to meet the challenges of our island and creating sustainable communities. There are demonstration projects in using recycled glass as construction materials and operational needs for large-scale composting of biosolids. And I have seen that bench that they made out of the plastic bottles. And actually, I was kind of concerned whether it would hold my weight. So I sat on it, and then the guy that made it, who is like maybe two times bigger than me, came to sit and I'm going, oh my gosh, is this bench gonna hold us? You, and so, and so uh, he did. He sat next to me and it, you know, it sustained us. There you go, bottle glasses, reuse, bottle um, plastic. And it's really, really nice. I liked it. I'm gonna put it in the lobby of my chambers so everybody can, can see. 
Um, also highlighted in this conference is the zero waste program that can battle climate change and save money for the taxpayers. In addition to sessions dealing with protecting the environment, there are also presentations on building a green economy and green construction, which are the keys to realizing the sustainable community which we all aspire to and are committed to achieving. So I wish you the best with all the information and the solutions in, that we're gathering here and bringing to Guam. We love to hear all your various diverse ideas, especially in the islands, as we are very common in our culture and in our ways. So uh, to all of us here in the Pacific Island, it is truly invaluable that you are here to share that with us. Sidzuus Masi to each and every one of you for your participation and support for this great endeavor and have a great conference. I am looking forward to hearing some of your recommended ideas. Thank you and Sidzuus Masi. Thank you, Magahaga Lourdes, Leon Guerrero. So I've been, the Chamorro word is tentagu, which means voluntold, not volunteer, voluntold by our Guam EPA administrator to introduce our next guest uh, keynote speaker. Mike Stoker is our regional administrator, USP, US EPA Region 9. Serves as a regional administrator for the EPA's Region 9 based in San Francisco. He leads the agency's efforts in Arizona, California, Hawaii, Nevada, the Pacific Islands, including Guam, America, Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, and the 148 tribal nations. The region spans eight time zones and is home to more than 50 million people. Mr. Stoker has spent his career serving the public and working as an attorney specializing in agriculture, labor, land use, and environmental law. He most recently served as Director of Government Affairs for United AG, the second largest agriculture association in California. Mr. Stoker was a member of Santa Barbara County's Board of Supervisors from 1986 to 1994, Chairman of the California Agriculture Labor Relations Board from 1995 to 2000, and California Deputy Secretary of State from 2000 to 2002. In addition, Mr. Stoker served on the Southern California Hazardous Waste Management Board of Directors from 1990 to 1994, as chairman of the Santa Barbara County Associations of Governments from 1991 to 1993, and as a chairman of the Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District from 1992 to 1994. He, he also served on the boards of several community organizations. Mr. Soker received his bachelor's arts degree in magna cum laude from the University of California, Berkeley, and his Juris Doctorate degree from Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, Tess. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Mike Stoker. Welcome to the island today. Well, thank you very much. Um, and it really is my pleasure to say half a day. I told that to Caro and John last night about 11.30 at night at the airport. Um, you know, I, I, first I want to thank G uh, Governor uh, Lu Leon Guerrero. You've, you've done just, uh, we, we had the fortune to meet the governor and when it was governor-elect in December when I came over and spent some time in Guam and also on my way over to uh, CNMI. Um, and she has just done a terrific, terrific job. And thank you very much for that executive order you use, issued yesterday to help preserve and protect our, our coral reef. Um, and I want to thank Walter and Fameo and, and uh, um, Ellie. You three, I mean, it's been now just over one year um, that I got this job. 
And I really feel the, these folks, they're, they're the folks that work for BECQ and America Samoa EPA and Guam EPA, uh, just like my folks in Region 9, you made me feel like I'm part of your family. And I, I just really can't thank you enough. Um, and it really is, uh, it's special to be here. Last year, the first time I met a lot of you was at the Pacific Islands Conference that we were hosting in San Francisco. And uh, how, how much we've all gotten to know each other over the last year uh, is really incredible. Uh, in the last year, this is my third trip to Guam. I've been to CNMI twice. I've been to America Samoa twice. No other regional administrator in their entire tenure has ever done that. And the reason is, and I think all of you know it, um, I, I told you all last June in San Francisco, the Pacific Islands are one of my top personal priorities. And as long as I'm a regional administrator dealing with the Pacific Islands and getting the resources you need uh, for us to be there for you will always be one of my top personal pi priorities. It, it is such a top personal priority, several of you are aware. Um, on Sunday, I was married in Santa Barbara, another beautiful place in, in the coast. And my now, uh, the first time she got introduced as Mrs. Mike Stoker was on Sunday in Santa Barbara. So the second time she's going to be introduced as Mrs. Mike Stoker, Debbie Stoker, my uh, wife who is here with me. And, and, and she can definitely attest, because she hears me hear about Pacific Islands all the time, how much this really is a top personal priority. Um, you know, the other thing, and I'm not making this up, John, John and Carl can let you know. You know, I, um, I basically review, I have to do the annual performance review for my 18 division directors. And then they do their reviews for the people that are under them. Literally, in the performance review that was added to what they have to put down that I'll, I now have to review is a section on what they've done, whether it's the air director, the water director, super fund director. There is a special section on their annual performance review for what they have done over the last year for the Pacific Islands. That, that was not on that performance review last October or November when I sat down with them. When I sit down with them this November, they have a section that they have to be uh, better, they better be showing me things that they're doing for the Pacific Islands. So um, th that's just another example of little things I can do to really kind of, I think, up the uh, attention that all the people in Region 9 will give to all the Pacific Islands and your needs. What I'd like to do now is spend just a couple minutes um, to talk about what we've been doing in the Pacific Islands and you know, what we've done over the last year and where I'd like to see us go in the, few year, the next few years ahead. When I started in this position, I, I was happy to learn that we had a te te team of people dedicated to the Pacific Islands, in, in addition to our Pacific Islands team, more than 60 people in the region. We have provided over $300 million in the last 10 years to help you have the safest drinking water you've ever had and much improved wastewater treatment facilities. If there's one thing you should know about me, it's the Pacific Islands are my pro top priority along with my native tribes and the U.S.-Mexico border. You can ask anybody, I mean, ask anyone in EPA. John McCarroll, my, and you all know John, my Pacific Islands director, he will tell you, and he's been, how long have you been with EPA, John? 20 years. 20 years. He will tell you that he's never been able to get things done like he can because he can call anybody up and say, this is what I need. And basically, he, kind of implying, you don't want me to call Stoker, do you, to, to ask if it should happen? And Carl and, and John have been getting the things that they need. They'll tell you like they never have before. Um, but I'd like to share some of the priorities that I have going forward over the next few years. One, building capacity with public health service engineers. Two, focusing on disaster recovery, not just emergency response. Three, helping the freely associated states. And four, protecting the ocean and coral reefs. 
First priority, PHS engineers. Um, in the past year, we have helped place four pub public health service engineers and one EPA person in the islands. They include a, ch a new chief engineer for Guam EPA who started in October, a new PHS engineer at the CNMI water utility in December, a new PHS engineer at America Samoa EPA in April, a new EPA staff to manage the BCQ water quality branch in May, and PHS engineer to manage the BCQ drinking water office on June 1st. That's a lot of technical experience, and I've been make, trying to make getting these PHOs a top priority. Um, for this job, I, I don't think I have interface with these, these incredible people at any time in my prior life. And since meeting them, and since seeing what they do in the field, and how they interrelate with the community, um, and what they can accomplish, these public health officers are one individual that can do so much, and they have my greatest respect. Uh, and I'm, I'm in the process trying to work to see us hopefully soon get a PHS or a PHO that can be uh, designated for the freely associated states that could be based down in the Marshall Islands, because I know, again, what that one individual will be able to do in terms of technical assistance to help uh, when it comes to safe drinking water and help to deal with wastewater issues. So I'd like a hand of applause for all those public health officers. You're the best of the best. S second priority, dis disaster recovery. When disasters hit, EPA is one of the main responders working with FEMA. When U2 hit Saipan and Tenian in October, EPA worked with FEMA and the CMI government to collect more than 1,500 down transformers, remove almost 200 shipping containers full of 75,000 items of household goods, and help bring back drinking water to 100% of Saipan's and Tenian's residents. I'm truly proud of the EPA effort. We had a continuous presence for six months in Saipan and Tenian from late October through late April. We had responders for all 10 regions that were out there deployed to help. But the disaster also presented an opportunity. Together with FEMA's regional administrator, Bob Fenton, who's over here, Bob, who um, is my counterpart, who we've established a great working relationship, EPA will focus on rebuilding the CNMI's infrastructure to be more resilient so that when the next U2 hits, there won't be as much damage. And I've been working with FEMA to create a new position at EPA to focus on U2 recovery through a two-year detail. There has never been a position like this before at EPA. And again, I think this is because of the incredible working relationship EPA Region 9 and, EP and, and FEMA Region 9 have. And in a supplemental disaster aid bill signed by the President, EPA will administer at least $66 million in recovery funds for CNMI, $10.4 million for water and wastewater, and $56 million to improve solid waste facilities. This is the first time in the history of the EPA that we will fund construction of solid waste landfills. Bob Fenton will join me t on a panel tomorrow where you can hear... <laughs> I applaud Bob Fenton and FEMA. That, this, was a, this was truly a collaborative effort. All those things didn't happen uh, without the collaborative effort of, uh, of, with Bob and myself and Region 9 and FEMA and EPA. And I'm saying we're going to be on a panel tomorrow, and we would both welcome you to join us if you want to hear a, bit, a little bit more about resiliency and our approaches and what we're doing going forward. My third priority, freely associated states. Um, I was with John in Saipan uh, for the second time in late January. And we were over there and John said, you know, it really, really is sad. It's really so unfortunate that EPA quit providing technical assistance to the freely associated states. And I go, well, I mean, I, I was just assuming, because I knew we hadn't been doing it since I 
came in as Region 9 administrator. And John said, um, you know, I asked him, I said, so was this like, it's just cut out of the budget in Congress. Was executive order? Did you know? Did the prior, you know, administrator of the EPA, did, did they discontinue it? What happened? He goes, No, your your counterpart, your predecessor, just unilaterally stopped it. And I don't think John. I don't think John will ever forget that minute. And I just looked at him and I said, Guess what, John? If a regional administrator can unilaterally stop it then a regional administrator can unilaterally recommence it. Consider technical assistance to the freely associated states <laughs> recommenced, which it is. Um, I've hey, I, 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 freely associated states a priority. I think cutting it. We're having audio problems here, it's cutting in and out. I, I've made the freely associated states a priority with my fellow political appointees at EPA, as well as with my partners at other federal agencies, especially Interior and State. That's why EPA has, has a representation at this conference from our Office of International Affairs from headquarters, and why new partners they've invited are also at the conference. And we're looking forward to all the help we can get. I've in instructed John McCarroll and my other directors to look for ways to provide more technical assistance to the freely associated states. One idea that we're pursuing that I somewhat referenced a minute ago um, is working with Interior and, and having a um, dedicated engineering circuit writer for the FAS, ideally a pH engineer that we'd like to place in, the, in those territories. For the heads of the freely associated states, EPA, um, EPAs who are here, you may already be hearing more about EPA technical assistance, but please tell me or my team what more we can do to help you. And as I look forward to traveling to Palau in September for the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force meeting, I look forward to getting to know you better here and hear what your ideas are that hopefully I can pursue between now and, and that meeting. Finally, uh, my priority on oceans and coral reefs. You know, I, my, I, well, even most of my friends here in the territories and for, for sure all the EPA folks back in Region 9 know that I'm an oceans guy. I'm a diver, uh, form, former triathloner. When I'm home in Santa Barbara on a Sunday, I'm an ocean swimmer. You know, oceans are in my DNA. And so I was really happy and honored when I was uh, named to be the EPA representative on the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force, which I've part I participated in for the first time last year in America, Samoa, and have attended several meetings back in Washington, D.C. since. Uh, by all accounts, what I've heard from a lot of people that have been involved with the Coral Reef Task Force over the years they, they, they've told me that I've taken the EPA's presence and involvement with the Coral Reef Task Force uh, to a place that had never been before. And I can just tell you, uh, with me on that task force, EPA is all in 100% on doing what we can collaboratively to make sure we restore and protect and enhance the coral reef. Um, that's why I'm happy to announce today that I have created a new position at EPA Region 9, a position that never had been created before, any other region or at the headquarter level. And that's the position of Senior Policy Advisor to the RA on Oceans. And um, I'm also happy to announce, and I think a lot of you may know him, the person that I named to that position is Hudson Slay, who has been working out of our Honolulu office who, like me, oceans are in his DNA. And Hudson, where are, there you are. Hudson, stand up. <laughs> the, the, this, this guy now has, and all the senior staff knows, he can go directly to any senior staff member in Region 9 like McCarroll can, and when he calls up on oceans, they're gonna be looking at oceans the way that they look at the Pacific Islands when McCarroll calls up. Um, we're, we're actually right now, in the, I'm in the process of putting together a, a, re, um, a Region 9 uh, Clean Oceans Coalition of probably what would be 20 of the 
most notorious, well-known uh, nonprofits worldwide that deal with marine de debris and microplastics, and focus their whole focus is 100% clean oceans. So you're going to start seeing Hudson Slay a whole lot more. So, you know, the bottom line is um, I'm always here to listen because I can only do things for you. I, you know, I'm going to find out one of two ways. My staff are going to tell me uh, or you can tell me. And I think all of you that have gotten to know me know how accessible I am. Um, and I will just give you a for instance on the many things that I've heard. I think a lot of you know a lot of things that we've accomplished. I've gone over a lot of them today. But before I leave this job, I want to be at a groundbreaking ceremony for that brand new Guam EPA building. <laughs> I'm committed to that. So, I, you know, I, I want to close with uh, thanking Walter and Conchita and Julie and all the rest of the Guam EPA. Stand up all again. Let's give them a round of applause. Come on, don't be shy. And, and I want to remind you what I thought was really a cool thing. Um, as you know, I have a tribal conference every year. Tri tri there we go. Tribal conference every year in October uh, to do for my 148 tribes. And last, when I had come back from, I think it was, you know, being over in America, Samoa, um, and after, you know, from having gotten to know many of you from the, the Pacific Islands Conference we had in San Francisco last year, um, you know, I, I told my staff, on my, my tribal staff, just like we have Pacific Island staff, I said, you know, I really think um, there's so much in common in terms of dealing with resiliency issues and infrastructure issues that, you know, I really think all the folks with, with the Pacific Islands would get a lot out of attending the tribal conference. And my staff said, no, I'll come, no, that'd be disrespectful. You can't suggest that, Mike. And, and I, I took their kind of cue on. I said, okay, I just think, I, you know, I'm, what I, I've gotten to know my tribes well. I know my Pacific Islands folks. I think they would get a lot out of it. So last October, the way that, that conference works, the first morning from about nine to noon, it's closed doors with all the leaders of all the tribes. And then they, basically that afternoon we started off and I give my welcoming remarks. And then they give a report uh, to what they talked about. And, you know, it was what was really, um, I'll never forget the moment when the person making the presentation delivering for, on behalf of all 140 tribes, said, um, the, said, you know, in, we know, Mike, you have this Pacific Islands Conference where you deal with America Samoa and the Mariana Islands and, you, you know, you, you, you deal with uh, Guam and you, you freely associated states. We really, really believe we've talked about it. And, you know, we w really would like Region 9 to invite the Pacific Islanders to our next tr tribal conference, <laughs> which I loved looking at my senior staff at that point. This uh, in terms of uh, this would be not the right thing to do. So remember, you're now going to get a con an invitation to our tribal conference uh, that will be t taking place. I forget which tribe is hosting it in Arizona, which will be next October. And I really do think you're going to you, you will get a lot out of that because how much there is in common. And the last thing I think for all ten of us with EPA, both from headquarters and Region Nine. I think we're going to have to have Pacific Island days that all of us will wear our shirts around to remind everybody in EPA how much the Pacific Islands are so important to the, the mission of protecting public health and environment for the Environmental Protection Agency. So thank you all again. I'm really looking forward to it. I could not think of a better place I would want to have a working honeymoon with my wonderful wife, Debbie, than the <laughs> Pacific Islands Conference. Thank you. All right, we are going to get started with our keynote speaker. Good morning, half a day. I'm Donya Rodriguez. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this keynote presentation. Um, our wonderful speaker is Froiling Great. He is currently works as the executive director of GAIA Philippines and is the Asia Pacific coordinator for the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, 
a worldwide alliance of more than 800 grassroots groups, non-GO, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and individuals in over 90 countries whose ultimate vision is just toxic free world without incineration. He currently leads the Zero Waste Cities Project, working with 26 cities across the Asian region. He is also president of Mother Earth Foundation, a nonprofit in the Philippines, working with cities and communities in establishing zero waste programs. A passionate advocate against the use of plastic, he has not used a single plastic drinking straw or shopping bag in more than 10 years. This and his love for composting has allowed him to reduce his household waste to less than two kilos for the whole year. I, it's amazing what he has done. I met him for the first time five years ago when I came to Guam for the Zero Waste Conference, and he did an amazing job. You saw his passion then. Obviously, five years later, his passion has not waned. He does amazing work with students um, across Asia, and it's my pleasure to have him come up here and speak on the work that he is doing. Let's give a big round of applause for Foiling Great. Half a day. Uh, the Honorable Governor Lourdes Leon Guerrero, um, Mr. Mike Stoker of the Region 9 of US EPA, and Mr. Walter Leon Guerrero of the Guam EPA. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends, a pleasant morning to all of you and Mabuhay. Um, Ms. Conchita and Ms. Juliana, and everyone, all the organizers of this conference. My gratitude and congratulations uh, to all of you for organizing this event. And thank you for having me here again. Uh, the first time I was here in Guam was five years ago when I first joined the uh, Pacific Island Environmental Conference five years ago. And when I was invited to come here again this time, I didn't have second thoughts because I had great memories the first time I was here, not only because this is such a beautiful place, it reminded me of home, but the, uh, more importantly, the warm welcome of everyone that time and this time um, made it worthwhile to, to, to come here. So again, uh, thank you for um, inviting me and uh, for having me speak here uh, this morning. So I am from the Philippines, and for this morning, I'll be sharing a few stories of what we've been doing there, as well as what we've been working at the international level. And uh, the topic that was given to me is the urgency of uh, green growth. And I really like what the governor said uh, in her keynote speech uh, this morning, is that the choice between sustainable development and economic growth is a false choice. And um, we strongly believe on, on this. Um, we had a few sessions yesterday on environmental education. And after presenting these sessions, uh, one interesting question that was asked of me yesterday was, are there frustrating days? I've been doing this work for about 18 years. And are there frustrating days? And how do you deal with that? That is a constant question that I have to, uh, to deal with, especially with news like, yes, there you go. So especially with news like this that we see every day, they say we have five years to work on something to mitigate the worst of climate change. And if you're on Facebook, you see this being shared almost every day by, by our friends. The last five years have been the hottest among uh, the recorded years that we've started recording. Every day we are, we are throwing away more than waste than what was generated in the Japan tsunami. The result is that in a study by uh, 2050, there'd be more plastic than fish in the ocean. And of course, this has impact on the organisms living in these oceans. Um, in, in some cases, 100% of these organisms have plastics inside or around these organisms. And for someone who um, likes seafood, this is a bothering uh, trivia or information for me. Um, half of the world's protein is coming from um, eating seafood or fish. So this is really scary for me personally. And of course, who can escape this daily barrage of news of whales or turtles or birds dying and uh, when they are open, you have pounds of plastic uh, inside these um, animals. Uh, recently, about uh, a month ago, there's a recent study which says that every uh, week, a 
credit card size of plastic is being ingested by each one of us. So it's not just affecting the ocean or the animals in there, but even us. Uh, so this is a, a grave concern. But I'm not here this morning to remind you of all this green news. I'm sure, I'm sure you all know this already. What I'm here um, this, this, this morning is to share the alternate story that in fact, success stories are already happening. And hopefully this would be, um, in a way, a bit of an effort to inspire all of us to not only continue what we're doing, but to do more. So for the next two slides, uh, I'll, I'll be asking everyone to look at the screen and tell me, what are the words or the, the, the picture that you see on the screen? Uh, I, I love showing these uh, pictures to kids and ask them, and I have a joke after. So everyone, uh, eyes on the screen. What is the word that you first saw? Good, what's the other word in there? When I give this presentation to kids, I, I like to joke just to break the ice and tell them, the first word that you see is what's inside of you. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's the, what the first word that you, you saw, but um, you would know. But um, what this picture tells me is that in, in some uh, cases, it's hard to see what's good or what's evil uh, in our everyday life, in simple things that we do. For example, when you go shopping, do you use a paper bag instead of plastic bag? Is that really what's good? Um, so we always have to ask these questions. Next, all eyes on the screen again. And don't be shy. I know we have a few of the kids here. But don't be shy and tell me what do you see inside the bottle. So what do you see inside the bottle? I think we're having technical problems on the other two screens, but if you can see here, can anyone tell me what's in, in inside the glass bottle? So someone said a male and a female, probably dancing or making love. But I'll tell you, in fact, it's not a picture of a man, a woman. What's inside the bottle are nine dolphins. So can you look for the nine dolphins? You found them? Yesterday when I showed this picture, a bunch of guys, after two minutes, still did not see the dolphins. <laughs> okay, so that tells you something, right? It, maybe it's time to see an ophthalmologist. <laughs> but what I like about showing this picture is that some things are not so obvious. We need to take a second look and really see what's in there and to have an open mind. And that is my main message for this morning. And I'll do that by sharing my own personal journey. And as introduced by um, our beautiful moderator this morning, I have not used a single uh, plastic bag actually for more than uh, 15 years now. And it has been quite a, a journey. So for the next 45 minutes, I'd like to share with you my uh, zero waste and plastic free journey and hopefully inspire you of what things are happening already in other parts of the world. So I'll start with um, sharing this picture to really show how um, I feel I belong in Guam actually because I'm an island boy. I uh, spent my weekends when I was younger um, swimming or uh, hiking in my little island in the central part of the Philippines. So this is my memory of my childhood. When I was 18, about 18 years ago, I moved to Manila for a university, and what I saw shocked me. This is a stereotypical picture of Manila. And of course, the traffic, all the buildings, all the people, the number of people who are there, the waste, the dirty water, is what welcomed me when I get off the ship, when I arrive in Manila. And that very moment, I realized this same thing could happen to the island that I call home. This is the future if we don't do something. And that very moment, I decided I need to do something. So I started with personal action, bringing my own bag when shopping. This is my uh, toiletry. So uh, it's a shampoo bar. It's packaging-free, plastic-free. My soap is uh, packaging-free, plastic-free. 
for quite some time, it's been doing what I can do at a personal level. But then I realized the problem is so much bigger that my personal action actually is almost insignificant. So after realizing that, I volunteered for a nonprofit. And what we do is we uh, conduct workshops to kids. And a part of this workshop, I shared the things that I've been doing, still focusing on individual actions. And pardon for how simple these uh, items are. Remember, I made this list when I was 18 years old, 18 years ago. So um, it's, it's quite simple. The idea really was to encourage people to act and do the simple things without drastically changing their lives. So I've done maybe 1,500 of these workshops um, with five, 50 kids or 3,000 kids in, in one venue. And um, one time I entered the bank and the teller uh, told me, uh, sir, you might not remember me, but I'd like to tell you that I have not used a plastic bag for five years now because I attended one of your workshops before. And that moment I said, I'm ready to die. I've, <laughs> I've done my part, right? I mean, all I wanted to do was change one person. And here is one person saying that just simply by attending one of those workshops, he stopped using plastic bag. But then thinking about it really, does that solve anything? Does it really make an impact in terms of how big the problem is? After again realizing this, I moved to another organization um, to work on uh, teacher training. So this is to multiply our impact. So we work with teachers, um, teacher training on environmental education using US programs. Some of you might be familiar with it, with it uh, Project Water Education for Teachers, or Project WET, and uh, Project Learning Tree. So we've been using that in, in the Philippines, uh, working with uh, these teachers. Uh, this is me, a different hairstyle a while back. <laughs> but I like showing this picture because it really shows why I love doing this. Um, at some point, things might get frustrating. But every time I spend time with kids and see the future that holds for them, uh, I know why we have to continue doing this. And I am very much re-energized. Then, after that, we said, OK, we have to go beyond just educating people. We have to prove that what we're saying is actually possible. So I moved to another uh, nonprofit, an NGO called Mother Earth Foundation, where we work with communities to establish zero waste programs. When I was moving uh, from that work to, to, to this new work, I was asking, why should we work on waste? It's such an unglamorous topic. Right? For, for, for someone who was 24 years old and deciding to move from what was an exciting job to a different organization to work on waste. But then when um, we look at what's happening in the Philippines, we know it is something that we have uh, to work on. For context, every person in the Philippines is producing about 0.2 to 0.6 kilograms of waste per day. That's still quite low compared to what is being produced in the US or other developed countries, for example. But all of these personal efforts allowed me in 2015, when I first measured it, to reduce my household waste to just um, two kilograms for the entire year. Um, when we again look at what's happening, we found out that 60% of um, the households in the Philippines admitted to burning their waste. Another 43% admitted to uh, dumping their waste in uh, bodies of water. And the result is this, what is commonly probably shown in your TV when the topic of waste or plastic pollution featuring Asian countries is being uh, portrayed. And it's true. Uh, even in uh, rural areas, we have compost pits. But what you'll see are uh, mixed waste, including plastics. Um, in urban areas, we have a collect and dump system where waste is collected and thrown away. But then we have to ask ourselves, when is away? Uh, in the last few days, I've um, read an, an article which says in an island setting, probably like Guam, where there's so much, uh, so limited space, there is no away. But even for big cities, what could be away for us could be home for someone else, right? So there really is um, no away. 
This is what's typically is away. This is a uh, dump site in the Philippines. Um, and if you look closer, there are waste pickers leaving around these dump sites because mixed waste are being thrown in uh, these dump sites. During one particularly nasty storm, a mountain of garbage covered these houses, killing hundreds of waste pickers and their families. That was about 20 years ago. It was a tragedy that uh, shocked the nation, but it also moved the government to pass a national law. We call it the Republic Act 9003, which mandated for a national program, an ecological solid waste management program. And it's quite an, an interesting law, actually. Um, it mandated decentralized waste management down to the household level where waste is generated. It mandated at source segregation, a materials recovery facility in every village or barangay, as we call it in the Philippines, a policy on no segregation, no collection, a closure on all dump sites, and a ban on open burning. It's a good law, but of course, the problem is always on the implementation, right? Um, going back again, we tried to look at what is the type of waste that we are uh, producing. So this is the waste profile in the Philippines. 63% is actually organics. We should be easily manageable simply by composting. About 15% is recyclable, 14% is residual, and then about 9% uh, special or hazardous waste. So knowing all of this information, we said we have to go beyond telling people what to do and show them that it can actually be done. So we partnered with one community. It's a uh, village in Metro Manila in the capital with a population of about uh, 15,000 people. That's about 3,000 households. That's a village in Metro Manila. Imagine these uh, people, 15,000 of them, dumping their waste in this what they call transfer station. So this is where they throw their waste every day. And every afternoon, every evening, the city would send five trucks to pick up waste dumped by 15,000 people. But the community said, enough of this. We want to change this. We want to do zero waste. So we worked with them, and we changed this place in less than three months from this into this. So it is now a materials recovery facility and an eco park. Before, when people pass by the pla this place, they would cover their nose because it's very smelly, it's mixed waste. But now, people come here to have a picnic or to celebrate their birthdays. It changed the way people viewed their waste and it showed that it is, in fact, possible. So it's not just about changing this particular place. It's really looking at the entire system so that this program is sustainable. So every sector has a role. The household is mandated to segregate their waste. The barangay is mandated to collect all their waste. And the city now only is left with managing residual waste, what cannot be composted or recycled at the community level. And you might be familiar with two streams or three streams of waste collection. In this particular village, they have several streams. Uh, organics goes to either feeding animals or composting. Of course, the recyclable goes to uh, junk shops. And then the residuals is collected separately. And we've seen this is actually working. 80% of the waste that the waste pickers collected was composted or recycled at the MRF. But if you look at what is produced in the community, more than 92% of the waste was actually reduced because the community changed into a zero waste uh, system. And they were able to do this by doing massive information and education campaign, going house to house, and uh, employing waste pickers to be formal waste collectors doing door-to-door -door segregated collection. Uh, so this is a typical uh, graphic or comics that we give to the household to, to show them what we're building in the community is not another dump site. It is actually something that they can go to and celebrate. So this also changed the lives of the waste pickers. So just for this one village alone, they hired 17 waste pickers to be formal waste collectors with a fixed salary, maybe compared to where you are. The salary is not much, but it's a massive um, increase to what they used to earn as informal waste pickers. Plus, they also have sole access to all the recyclables. So it changed the lives of the waste pickers as well. So from individual action to 
educating young people that they can also do individual action, to educating teachers, to working with one community, it came to a point where we had to uh, reassess. Are we still making the impact that's needed to really address this problem? The reality is that even if we have this model, there are still several dump sites all over the country because other places are not doing what this community has proven to be possible. So with this in mind, we work with one whole city now. It's still quite a small city with uh, 300,000 people, a million daytime population being the provincial capital of um, this province. But the waste is still significant. So we still employ the same system of working with waste pickers, decentralized um, system. And for this one city, they were able to increase their waste diversion by 55% in six months. They are now at around 82% um, after six years of doing this for the whole city. So that is a waste diversion for the whole city. They were able to do this by establishing materials recovery facility for all of their 35 villages or barangays. They have 180 MRF distributed, one for every school, one for every community, and one for every uh, subdivision. It also created green jobs Waste pickers who were hired as formal waste collectors, receiving now a fixed income, a fixed salary as uh, part of the program. And prior to this, the city actually had a uh, waste to energy facility, but they had to close it for two reasons. One, they realized the technology is not viable because waste is mostly organics. They have to spend more energy to burn the waste. And second, after they shifted to a zero waste program, there's not much, much waste to burn anyway. So they have to close it and really um, pursue their uh, zero waste program. And then they look at, okay, so this is the type of waste that we produce. Uh, we are currently at 82%. If we will increase our composting and recycling rate, probably we'll achieve about 93%. We'll still have this problematic part, the 7% for, for this city. And they looked at what are these problematic materials that can never be addressed through composting and recycling. And one of which, of course, is plastic bag. So the city decided, OK, we'll ban plastic bag, but it's not an outright ban. They have to work with the people. So what they did for the first three months, it's one day per week, plastic free day. You cannot get a free plastic bag every Friday. After three months, they said, OK, this time, no more free plastic bags. If you want plastic bags, you have to pay for it. After one year, it's totally, even if you have to pay for it, it's not allowed. They totally banned plastic bags. And we've seen it's possible as well. If you work with the people, 95% complied in the first six months of the project. And uh, the governor said this morning, zero waste would actually lessen the cost of taxpayers, what taxpayers spending on uh, waste. And we've seen this to be true in the Philippines in our zero waste model. These are the cities in Metro Manila. And one city is spending about $20 million every year, about a billion pesos, just for waste collection. That's just for one city. Our zero waste city, without a zero waste program, should be spending 70 million pesos. That's about $1.5 million. When they shifted to a zero waste program, they were able to reduce their cost down to 12 million pesos. <laughs> Meaning the city is saving now about a million dollars every year simply by shifting to a zero waste program. Now our work is to scale it up. So uh, this is not just limited to one village or one uh, city. This work is currently being replicated in 16 cities around the Philippines and in one whole province in the northern Philippines. But we didn't go, uh, we didn't stop there. Right now, uh, we have a project in Gaia. Uh, we call it the Zero Waste Cities Collaboration Project, where we are working with 15 member organizations across four countries in India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines to replicate this, the same model, with a bit of uh, localization depending on the local context. But um, it's really uh, building on the same principles of uh, zero waste. So this is being implemented here as well. Now, the question is, if all cities would go zero waste, are we able to solve the problem of plastic pollution? The reality is, 
our model would show it's beyond the capacity of cities to manage this. So uh, thankfully, about three years ago, I was part of a global movement called the Break Free from Plastic. And for me, this is my evolution in my, in my zero waste work, working on a personal level, working with one community, working with a city, now working with more cities, but now really elevating this at a global level and address the root cause of the problem. It's not just a litter problem. It's not just a waste management problem. Some of these problematic materials were, designed, were, were not designed to be managed in the first place. So the, the Break Free from Plastic has three strategic pillars. One is uh, zero waste cities. That's why we're working with more uh, cities right now. Uh, second is changing the narrative or the culture of the way we use plastic. And the third is we have to go beyond that and engage with the corporate who are producing these problematic materials in the first place. So part of this activity, we conduct not just clean ops, but uh, integrated to that are brand and waste audits to really identify what are we producing. And as part of our changing the narrative work, you might have seen this uh, news or study which identified top 10 countries responsible for marine plastic pollution. Number one was uh, in China, number two was Indonesia, number three was the Philippines. And for us working on zero waste work in these places, this study was actually insulting. Because number one, it's all based on assumptions. And second, it's based on um, the work by people who have not been on the ground. And third, this passes the blame on the countries more than who should be really responsible. So we're trying to change that by doing what we call the waste and brand audits, where we look at the amount of waste and the uh, types of waste produced in a community. And this is what we found. 45% of our waste in communities are unbranded. And this is where local regulation could come in. They could ban plastic bags. They could ban straws. They could ban uh, styrofoam containers, for example. But a bigger percentage is branded waste produced by these uh, corporations. And the top 10 alone in the Philippines is responsible for 63% of this problematic waste, waste that cannot be managed in the communities. And the four multinational companies are responsible for 41%. So meaning if just four companies shifted their packaging to something reusable or something recyclable, we'd be able to reduce residual waste by 41%. Um, and when we compared, the same companies that we found when we do our beach cleanups are the same companies polluting our communities. So this is one of our clear message for, for these uh, corporations. And we look at how much these companies are earning by selling these problematic products versus what our cities using our tax uh, money is spending to manage what they dumped on us. Because for a fact, uh, they know for a fact that when they were selling these products, we didn't have the infrastructure to manage them. Uh, last April, I was in uh, Switzerland to deliver a plastic monster to Nestle as one of the top uh, company uh, responsible for this packaging. And I talked to one person, and he said he was one of the engineers who helped design the sachet, the small multi-layer packaging that is very prevalent in the Philippines. And he said when they designed it 50 years ago, they didn't have any idea what would happen to it after. They were only interested in how they could sell more of their products. Right? So again, uh, part of our work is really to change how we view this problem. Who is really responsible? We're saying, yes, cities have a role. But even if all cities would do this, some problems are beyond our capacity in the community. Corporations have to do their part. So our ultimate goal in Break Free from Plastic is really a future free from plastic pollution. So that was my evolution, a personal um, action, com small communities to cities, now more cities, but now really engaging and changing the system that caused this problem in the first place. So what's next for me? What's next for us? And this is where I'd be interested to talk to some of you. My next dream is to really work on zero waste islands. It's a lot easier to implement um, waste management in big cities because we have the infrastructure, we have the resources. But the Philippines is more than 7,500 islands. Indonesia is more than 13,000 islands. And in most places, these islands, 
Even PET bottle, which is technically recyclable, is not being recycled because the cost of ship, uh, shipping them back to the capital is prohibitive. So there is a different demand to develop systems um, suited for the context of zero waste island that goes beyond just waste management. We really want to look at sustainable consumption, how people are buying, because in most of these islands, a lot of the food is imported from outside of the island. We want to connect composting with agroecology. Why don't we produce our own food and make it local and explore alternative delivery systems? If we're able to uh, work on these islands, then we're able to address a primary source of plastic leakage into the ocean. So my last message is that hopefully some of these examples would convince you that zero waste is not only possible, it is in fact already happening. When I tell stories of San Francisco um, as a golden standard for zero waste, some of our mayors would say, but that's San Francisco, they have all the money in the world. Now we have a counter model that even small cities actually can do it, right? So zero waste is not only possible, it is already happening. With that, thank you so much and good morning everyone. Ah, yes, so we have time for a few questions. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, sir, a very, uh, very interesting talk. And uh, I would like, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. My name is Mohamed Kulabi. I'm from the University of Guam. And uh, I would like to uh, say or tell a story very related to your topic, because actually this is exact, almost exact same topic that I have been working on and presenting. A uh, few years in, ago, we um, uh, uh, developed a uh, collaborative program with the University of Okayama. And so we did a wa waste management study in Guam. And we, um, uh, uh, our uh, result from the study was almost the same, uh, that about 80% of the waste uh, generated in Guam is compostable, and only 20% which is recyclable also. So anyway, um, I was presenting that uh, um, work at the university, uh, at the university in um, Hong Kong. There was a waste management conference. And then at the end of my talk, somebody came to me and introduced uh, uh, herself, a lady. She said that she is a secretary to one of the ministers of uh, Philippine environmental uh, offices. And she uh, took my card. And then later on, a few, um, few months later, I received an email from her inviting me to a, uh, a meeting that they had. She, uh, she said she's working with a couple of churches doing some environmental related um, uh, work. So uh, she invited me to go and give a talk, similar talk that I gave in, uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, and I, did, um, I said, that's fine. And then later on, she. Um, um, send me email that your accommodation and airfare is already being approved. So we will send that to you. Before uh, you come, we would like to have a synopsis of your talk so we can make flyers and, and you know, send it to, to our community. And in that uh, summary of my talk, I explain how the waste is generated, how much is generated, and what are the steps we can take to reduce the waste generation and also how to manage it. And then at the end, I wrote a paragraph saying that no matter what we do, what steps we take regarding the waste generation, we cannot remove the waste or solve the problem of the waste completely unless we lower the population rate. I said in Manila, in, Gu in the Philippines in general, the population, overpopulation is, I mean, it's just tremendous. Uh, and be, uh, it's very interesting that you mentioned in your talk that each person can generate so many kilograms per day and so many kilograms per year. And as long as there are so many people that you cannot control people, you cannot control waste. So this is something that I think is very, very important. A lot of these waste uh, management uh, strategies should include population control also. Thank you. 
I think there's no question, so yeah, I'll just. So we will try and keep maybe the questions a little bit shorter so we can try and get a couple extras, please. Great. Um, Aloha from County of Maui, recently retired recycling coordinator for after 30 years and opening my consulting business. I'm Dr. Hannah Steele. And my question is, what is your timeline? How many years are you projecting out that it's going to take to get the, all of the Philippines into your wonderful, wonderful system? So uh, we had a strategy uh, meeting uh, two months back and our goal is to have to reach a tipping point where zero waste becomes mainstream and we need to do that by working with 50 cities in the next three years and the idea is in the next 10 years the entire Philippines would be zero waste in 10 years. The problem is that uh, of course we are a non-profit and resources of course is limited but uh, I think one interesting trivia is that for the first city that I've shared it took us $20,000 investment for the city to be able to reduce their waste by um, 82%. And they save $1 million every year now. So the challenge is really the fighting the inertia the, that it's, it's hard to change when it's not as mainstream. So our goal using philanthropic money right now is to build 50 cities in three years. And after that, cities would have to do it on their own because it's mainstream. Thank you. Another question? One here, and then one here, and then we'll wrap up. Hi, I'm Susan Jamerson. I'm the environmental coordinator for the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. And I'm just wondering if you offered incentives to people to get them doing this. We, we offer a lot of programs, but people just don't participate. It's just easier to you know throw it all in the garbage and it goes away. Um, so I'm just wondering if there were some ideas to get people to participate. Um, in some it, it worked with incentives, but in this program, we did not offer um, educating people. The best incentive for them is that they've seen their communities change. And the impact is not just on waste management. For example, in one community, because of their uh, waste problem, dengue was also very prevalent. When they shifted to zero waste, dengue cases went down by as much as 95% in six months after they've implemented. So it's more of this benefit for the community, more than financial um, uh, incentives for the individual household. But it really boils down making people understand why we're doing it. And uh, in our session about um, environmental education yesterday, it's what we wanted to emphasize, that just having a policy is not enough. You have to work with the people and you have to give them the tools to meaningfully participate and do something to be part of the solution. Thank you. Half a day, um, Senator Perez. Um, I oversee the environment here in Guam and I'm really thankful and um, proud of all your accomplishments. Um, I think zero waste is, is the right time for us here in Guam as we are about to expand our, our landfill. And um, we're looking to reduce, um, at least extend the, the life of the landfill. My question to you is the success of your ca um, corporate campaign. Um, I was wondering if we can jump on that uh, as far as you know, making sure that we reduce the amount of packaging that goes into our landfill. In addition to toxins, uh, what is, how are you addressing uh, the toxins in, in um, the landfills uh, in the Philippines? Um, so for, for the landfills, so the, the separate regulation in the Philippines to, to address that, so that, that that's happening. But with our corporate work, uh, for example, there are two uh, ap approaches to this, I would say. One is to directly engage um, or work with these corporations, either from the inside or from the outside, and make them change. And the second one is through regulation. Because, uh, for example, with re retailers, when we t told them, you have to stop using plastic bags uh, in cities outside where we work. Um, and they said, well, we cannot stop plastic bags, using plastic bags, if our competitor is not doing it. So this is where regulation comes in. It levels the playing field for, for everyone. So um, for, for, for the Philippines, for our work, I think these are our two approaches, working with regulation to nudge these corporations and level the playing field. But at the same time, at the international level, part of why we're doing brand audits is to give a face to this problem and to say, 
Nestle, Unilever, you are the face of this problem, and you have to change. And we've seen um, some of these companies make uh, commitments. It's really up to us now to ensure that they follow up with these commitments. Thank you. Ferlin, so as we wrap up, maybe you, is there um, a really interesting partnership that you have engaged with on the work that you're doing here? Yes, so it's really, um, in our, yesterday we've shared how we've engaged the youth. Um, we have Zero Waste Youth Camp. We have a Zero Waste Youth Pilipinas, which is a group of young people who are mobilizing on the ground. One clear example, uh, some of our youth members made a petition um, to their principal to stop using plastic packaging in, in their school. And prior to um, we cannot ban plastic bags at school because it would be hard for the students. But when students are the ones who make and had no choice but to follow and remove all plastic packaging in the school, which for me demonstrated really the power of engaging the youth outside of our typical engagement with the city officials, with, with the government. So I think uh, that's the last question again. Thank you, everyone, and half a day. Oh, great. Thank you, Orlin. Well, this is a good test of our improv skills. <laughs> Welcome to my teammate. <laughs> So we're going to load the second video for you and not worry about playing the first one. What I wanted to do was to share with you guys a quick video that our team has created to help really show light to what we do in the, uh, in the mainland. Um, so first, let me introduce myself. My name is VN. And for those who have not met me before, my name actually means so. Let me take a deep breath. You know what this all makes a lot of sense? Because I'm the youngest of 11 kids, right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you too? Us too. And not only am I the youngest of 11 kids, I'm the mother of twins who are brought with me today. They're sitting here. <laughs> thank you. So my home and my dinner table is always a little bit of a madness where I can hardly ever finish a thought, much less a sentence. And so it makes all the sense in the world that today we're just going to go with the flow here. And I'll take a little, my time. So my name actually makes a lot of sense because as the youngest of 11 kids, my mom named me Vian because it means finished. <laughs> and this is probably why, because there's a little bit of a madness and chaos every day at home. Um, but the reason I'm here today is because the work that I've been doing over the last decade is to make sure that we are creating solutions to poverty and pollution. And because of the work we've done, we have led the team to create the biggest fund in history for low-income communities to green up, right? It's been $1.5 billion that we've created just for the poorest and most polluted communities in California in just three years. And when we created this fund, what we wanted to do was to say, this money shouldn't come from taxpayers. This should come from making big polluters pay. We heard an earlier speaker talk about the importance of making big uh, corporations responsible for the waste they put into our oceans, into our ground, into our earth, right? So the work that our team has been doing is to do the same thing and to make big polluters pay for the poison they dump into our air, right? We all agree? Yeah. Sounds good? Um, and, and that has led to a lot of other solutions that I'll talk a little bit more about today. But for me, when I came here, it was so grounding to think about that the conference, the Pacific Islands Environmental Conference, has been around for 30 years. And it makes all the sense in the world because 30 years is about how much time we have left to really, right? In 20, 30 years from now, it was 2050. And according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, if we don't significantly reduce pollution in the next 10 years, we're going to see significant disasters and climate change, superstorms, wildfires, which we've been seeing in California, and much more. 30 years is how far we've come with this conference. And in 30 years, if we don't do something, something drastic is going to happen. So that lands for me the significance of the event and our timing today. Let me just make sure I close this, because I think it's a little distracting. 
How are we doing? So far, I haven't tripped over myself. Everybody's alive. This is how it goes. This is, we're going to roll with it. Um, and for me, when I think about the work we're doing, and I think about the science and the policy, I hang out with a lot of really, really smart people. And because of the work we do, we've been able to work with presidents. We've been able to work with the United Nations, with in the EU. We've been able to do some incredible work. But for me, all of this is more now about home and heart and family. And in order to understand that, so for me, it starts with home and family. So 44 years ago, my mom was pregnant with me when she was getting on this rickety boat with me in her belly, nine other kids, her husband, and my grandma. They had to get out of Vietnam because of the war. They were to row 500 miles to Macau, where they had to cross treacherous waters that had claimed the lives of many of their families and friends. We eventually make it. Spoiler, I'm here, <laughs> causing a ruckus on the stage, as I should. But before I got here, right, we got to Oregon, where the only jobs my parents, who never learned to speak English, could find was working on farmlands, picking strawberries and snow peas, with me sometimes on their backs. We graduated from there to get to Oakland, California, where the only jobs my parents could find was in sweatshops. And they did that from the time I was three until the time I went to college, making shirts for about a quarter a piece. I didn't realize what it was, how unusual it was for someone like me to grow up in communities like Oakland until I actually got to college and realized that it wasn't uncommon for people. It's like booby traps now on stage. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't common for people at Cal, at UC Berkeley, to look like me. Right? I was dodging bullets in junior high school. We were having dropout rates that was higher than we had graduation rates. We actually had the dubious credit in the United States for having the most violent community where I was growing up. I'm not only talking about what those conditions were, I'm talking about what the con context was for which I was working and for which I grew up and understood my community. So in Oakland, California, where I and my kids are living, we are surrounded on all sides by freeways and highways. We have a dry cleaners down the street, which was storing chemical vats underneath the ground, leaking toxicity into the very soils with which we grow our fruits and vegetables. The area is called Fruitvale because we were growing fruits and veggies on which we were surviving and living on. So when I got to college, I thought, well, let's figure out what we can do about it. But I got righteously indignant when I realized this wasn't just Fruitvale, California. This was all over the country, and now realizing it's all, really all over the world. And that it is not a coincidence. If we think about it, and I ask you to imagine a community, the community in your area that was the most impoverished, that was the most polluted, imagine the faces. What do they look like? What are the families like? I bet you most of us will have a very similar answer. And because I know that, it tells me that this is not a coincidence. And I wanted to understand what was the systematic reason underneath that and to begin to create solutions for that. And so I set up my life to make sure that my education wasn't about escaping poverty, but it was about eradicating it. And how can we begin to do that? So, like all good troublemakers, I went to law school, right? And figured out that I wanted to change the laws, change the, the ways that we prioritize and run our, run our systems. How do we allocate our money? How do we allocate our revenues? I'll speed forward because the booby traps kept me a little bit delayed in with earlier, but suffice it to say that in the last few years, our team has created some policies that has been on the front page of newspapers all across. And one of the policies that I'm most proud to talk about how we've been building on this is something that was really wonky. It's called SB 535. Now, before you fall asleep, know that 
what we were trying to do is how do you begin to make the biggest polluters, the giants of the world, really begin to listen and be responsible as residents and neighbors to us. In California, we were able to create a carbon pricing program, right? You make the big polluters, the oil companies, the shells, the refineries, the Chevrons, the Exxon Mobiles. We said you have to actually begin to clean up and pay up. You have to clean up your pollution. You have to clean up the poison you put into our air. And then if you can't clean up fast enough, you have to pay for permits or allowances. And then that money has to be put into a fund. So for those who are wonks like me, you know that to be a cap and trade program, a carbon pricing program. The innovation that my team and my friends and I put together is that we said that money though does not belong just to the state. It belongs to the family and friends and the people in the community who actually paid for it already with their lives and their lungs. And so we set up Hodden to put a requirement which now has put 35% of that entire pot of money has been mandated to be directed into the communities most impoverished and most polluted. Now, as the youngest of 11 kids who went to law school, I usually think when I go into the room, I get to just complain and talk about the things I want. <laughs> yeah, no, no other youngest kids here? <laughs> oh man. Um, but for this, right, we realized that we had to go back to the community and say, we wanna listen. How do we make sure that this is the money and this is the investment that goes to the community and supports the vision that you have? We did a year of organizing, town halls, church meetings, webinars, phone conferences, and everything that the community told us that they wanted, the programs that were hiring from their community that spoke their languages, the programs that most helped them reduce the cost of living and improve the quality of life, we got those programs fully funded at the height of which the programs can absorb the money. And that's where the $1.5 billion have been put into. Now, those programs, for those who are online and want to go see these programs, you can check them out on climatebenefitsca.org. You can check all the programs, and then on the stories, you can check upliftca.org, a website I helped to create. Those programs went to free solar panels for families who could otherwise never afford it. It went to free energy efficiency programs for communities that could never afford it free bus passes for seniors and students, the biggest affordable housing program in California, which has a huge homelessness issue. It went to accelerating one million electric vehicles, buses, trucks, and passenger vehicles, and school buses now for kids. This is what it means, because those numbers, like I have twins, when you say 1.5 billion, it's like kajillion, gazillion, they all sound the same. But what it matters most is for the families who actually got the programs. So Maria Zavala, for instance, she got a free solar panel on a rooftop. She lives in Fresno, one of the most polluted, hottest areas, really hot in the summers, really cold in the winters. Her electricity bill was $200 on average each month. She got free solar panels and the next day or the next um, monthly bill came in and it was $1.50. It dropped $200. And that's money now she can invest, invest in the local community. That's a job that went to putting solar panels on a rooftop. And that was a contract to a local company that helped to install the solar contracts across the state. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a new clean economy. So after this law got passed, I started working with President Trump and the EPA to begin in, uh, looking at how we can replicate this nationally. Unfortunately, he did not, or the next administration did not continue this program. But as we were developing this and moving forward, we began to hear about communities that were even more dire than what we were seeing um, in Oakland, California. In fact, I was in the car driving one day with my twins. They were causing a ruckus then. Um, and suddenly the, the radio came on and we began hearing about Flint, Michigan and we all stopped. You guys know about Flint? Yes, yeah. So Flint, Michigan, four years ago, national news hit that their entire community got hit with lead poisoned water. 
10,000 kids who got lead-contaminated water, which causes brain damage. 4,000 undocumented residents who couldn't go to the hospital. They could only go to the clinic, and not even for treatment, only to just get tested to see how high your lead poisoning was. And it turns out they were getting 10 times more lead poisoning in their systems than is normal, than is appropriate. So we called up Flint and we asked, what can we do, how can we support? And they said, no one cares. And it hit me so deeply, because I bet you a lot of people feel that way now across the world. And it, it hit me deeply because that's how I felt when I was growing up. And they said, no one cares about Flint anymore. They only care about the next thing that Trump is tweeting about. No one cares about our lives. No one cares that four years later, we're still getting hit by poison. No one cares. And they asked us what we could do. And we said, we, they, I, we asked them what we could do. And they said, we want to get our stories out. And the video that I would have shown was the, some of the stories that we helped to create for the Flint moms. What they began to tell us was just heart-wrenching. Melissa Mays, the woman, the mother, who sounded the alarm about Flint, she and I met right when it happened. Her young boys were about my kid's age, about that size. They were rambunctious, they were causing ruckus, they were having fun in life. We were commiserating about the really expensive cost of organic berries and how hard it is to cut little fingernails and how vibrant their her kids were. We were honored to be able to help share their story on national news. We packed a bus with celebrities and artists from, from the Hulk to um, you know, the women who organized the Women's March and a bunch of other amazing people came to help support. We got it on the, their story back on CNN and MSNBC and all of these other outlets. And it was fantastic. We built a community. We were happy to be of support. A year after I went there, national news hit in 2016, right after Christmas, that the very community that I was living in, in Fruitvale, California, where my kids are living, had higher lead poison than Flint, Michigan because of the old housing stock and the lead paint that was chipping and getting into the soil, into the playgrounds, into kids' mouths. You know, the beautiful thing is, the mothers of Flint, Michigan reached out to me and asked what they can tell me about lead poison and how they could help. And not only that, other mothers came and helped me organize, and we were able to pass policies in my community in Oakland, California, that actually increased the protection for kids at school and to make sure that they were being tested and getting treated properly. I say all of that because the reason I'm here today in Guam is because we are very interconnected. We have an interdependent ecosystem, but more than that, we have an interdependent people and a body. And I'm here to talk a little bit about equity and about community and connectivity. I am so honored to be here and on this stage on the 30th year, and I'm thinking about 30 years out. And the fact that we are talking about a zero waste future is beautiful, but I also want to implore us to think about the fact that there are zero throwaway things, but we should also not be throwing away people. When I was growing up, people didn't think that people in Oakland mattered, that our voices were really powerful. When I was in Flint, there was an ongoing feeling of we don't matter. No one even cares anymore. And we dare to show up to say, yes, you do, and we will show up. And I am here because I truly believe what is happening here is something that matters to Oakland. I am so proud, as hard as it is to be a single mom with kids across the world, I am so proud to be showing my kids the beauty of other places and to be connected and to show up in solidarity to other communities. And I am here because what I understand is this is deeper for me than a solar panel. This is for me about how do we actually begin to build something, not just about the environment, but really about equity and justice. How do we build connectivity? How do we build community? And how no matter what doesn't work, how everything else seems to be going around and you're booby trapped on stage, how you're still gonna show up and get up, right? I wrote that in, yes. <laughs> how we're gonna show up and get up and do something again and again and try. 
So I'm really proud that we've been able to create really the biggest fund in history, but that doesn't make any difference if we don't really create the future that we really want to see for our kids. And for me, all of this work is to really fight for the future, and the future is worth fighting for. Thank you. As the director of the Division of Remediation Management, Ken Clue is responsible for all remediation activities in New Jersey, including those conducted by responsible parties, brownfield developers, uh, CERCLA, Recreate Corrective Action, as well as DEP funded response actions. Um, Ken is also acting, uh, currently serving as the past president of the Association of State and Territorial Solid Waste Management Officials. Ken began his career with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection uh, in 1985 as a field investigator evaluating sites for inclusion on the national priorities list. Uh, he has held many different managerial roles within the department, including Brownfield's administrator, where he was able to introduce innovative approaches to Brownfield remediation and redevelopment. Ken? So while we're dancing things set up here, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to this very special part of the world and, uh, and this very beautiful island. I have to say my uh, colleagues back home are very jealous <laughs> that I got the assignment. And um, quite frankly, many of them are doubting that I'm actually working. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to help me actually document the fact that I am. So I'm here today to tell you about a, uh, an innovative approach that the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection is pioneering to deliver government services to distressed communities. What started with one dedicated employee with a passion for coloring outside the lines to confront hard to solve problems in a desperately, desperately poor section of Camden, New Jersey by connecting with residents and building unusual partnerships has now expanded to a statewide initiative. The traditional stack and pipe and site by site approach has had its successes and it's been relatively um, uh, successful in getting some things accomplished, but to achieve environmental, social, and economic transformation in the areas with the greatest need, oh sorry, we really need to think bigger. We need to start thinking in terms of region and community and watershed. Only through this lens can we focus on the broader issues like urban revitalization, infrastructure redevelopment, and resiliency. It doesn't just happen though. We really have to be willing to change how we do business begin to take risks, and as I learned, be comfortable with uncomfortable. So why create a collaboration-based model? Well, I'll begin with a very personal story. Several years uh, after I was asked to lead the Office of Brownfield Reuse, I was asked by, a newly, uh, by one of a, uh, a colleague of mine who was looking for a change. Well aware of his passion, and creativity, I offered him an opportunity to join the office. So Frank McLaughlin was assigned to Camden County and Camden City, one of the poorest, well actually voted the most poorest, uh, the, the poorest and most dangerous city in all of the United States for many years. So Frank had a real challenge ahead of him. The project manager before him had little success but Frank was tenacious. So Frank went to Camden. Oops. I'm sorry. But as Frank's work progressed, he began to identify obstacles uh, and try to solve problems 
try to identify the problems that we as an agency could identify to gain the cooperation of the community, gain their trust, better serve their needs, and figure out how we could better serve the department by better implementing our mission. I'm actually struggling with this a little bit. I'm going to change the way I'm going ahead here. So eventually, after many years and many setbacks, Frank began to see success where others had failed. Well, how did he do this? Frank spent time in the community, lots and lots of time in the committee, community, and he actually became part of the community. You see, Frank lives in Princeton, New Jersey, and Princeton could not be any more different than Camden, New Jersey. So Frank would bring his kids, for example, on the weekends to participate in events, kids, uh, kids that his kids would never have seen participating in, in events that his kids never would have had an opportunity to participate in. He sought out other equally uh, passionate and like-minded individuals from the Department of Environmental Protection and for the first time, the DEP began to, set, began to start successfully implementing cross-program solutions in the city of Camden. He engaged non-traditional partners that were equally passionate and wanted to be part of the success. And then others began to seek Frank out. People like uh, organizations like the EPA, NOAA, and the Army Corps of Engineers. Initially, Frank's coloring out this outside the lines and departure from our mission were a problem for me and my management. But let me tell you when I became a believer. In 2009, the DEP was asked to complete a remedial investigation and a remedial action work plan for a 90-acre landfill that the community had identified this for the site of a community center. The center was being funded with a $57 million grant from the Ray and Joan Kroc Foundation. The only way the city was going to be getting that grant was if we were able to complete that remedial investigation by that deadline in a period of six months. Now, I had been with the department for decades, and I knew that no one can complete a remedial investigation, a remedial, uh, remedial action work plan in six months. So I was pretty sure, actually pretty certain, it couldn't be done. But I will tell you, Frank McLaughlin was relentless. And when asked by our commissioner, Lisa Jackson, who, as you know, became, uh, eventually became the uh, EPA administrator, if we could complete that and we were going to commit to do that work, despite knowing full well that we couldn't do that work, I said yes. And somehow, six months later, in great part due to Frank McLaughlin's role in that effort, we did it and I started to believe that the impossible was possible. You know, then there were other events. A few years later, at a press conference to publicize the uh, progress of the Croc Center development, we were going to be met by the uh, mayor of Camden. So the commissioner, all the higher level management of the New Jersey DEP, Frank McLaughlin and myself came to the city to meet the mayor. And as the mayor comes out, we all expect her to uh, go right up to uh, the commissioner of the DEP. She walks right past the commissioner and wraps her arms around Frank McLaughlin. Now, that was the second time. And then finally, at the open opening, the grand opening of the Croc Center, Salvation Army Center in Camden, the commissioner could not give the remarks. The deputy commissioner could not give the remarks. And it was up to me, but I decided to let Frank have the speaking engagement. And when Frank delivered, his remarks, and there were several hundred residents who were in attendance at that ceremony on their feet and shouting, Amen, I knew that Frank was making a difference in that community. So, the gentleman in the white shirt 
This is Frank McLaughlin. He is the man who really single-handedly pioneered this entire approach. On the right uh, is Father on, on my left is uh, Father Michael Doyle. He is the Monsignor of Sacred Heart Church in Waterfront South, the poorest and most dangerous of all the neighborhoods in Camden, New Jersey. Um, the man in the middle is uh, Andy Cricken. Andy Cricken is a trained chemical engineer from Princeton University. He runs the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority, the wastewater treatment plant located in Waterfront South. He's located in that community. He loves Camden. He loves the Camden residents. The most important thing is, as head of the CCMUA, Andy Cricken has money. And together, with, oh, and, and he is probably the only Ivy League trained sewage treatment plant operator in the entire country. So um, uh, those three men together, they're like a, uh, a group of superheroes, and those are the three guys who are unstoppable and who are really getting things done in Camden. So Frank was working on and solving many issues that were well outside of our traditional brownfields approach and the type of work that we were doing at the DEP. And my management was asking a lot of questions, and they were really, really unhappy. And I was always under the microscope trying to figure, or trying to explain what was Frank doing and why was he doing it. And it was at this point that I really understood my role as Frank's manager. I needed to trust Frank, I needed to get out of his way, and I needed to help remove obstacles and reassure the other managers in the other programs that his work was valuable and it was really consistent with the DEP's broader mission. So how did this really all begin? Well, this is Waterfront South. It's that neighborhood that I just talked about where Father Doyle has his church. Waterfront South is the likely the most distressed neighborhood in all of Camden. It includes two, two Superfund sites, 28 brownfield sites, a wastewater treatment plant, several scrap yards, the, the, um, uh, and an auto shredder. That's right. So uh, DEP had struggled to make inroads in this neighborhood despite the enormous environmental challenges for years. But Frank went into that neighborhood and he listened. And he learned that a single abandoned gas station was the community's priority. Not so much because of the specific environmental issues, although there were some, but because this one location invited illegal dumping, drug uh, sales and drug use, and prostitution. And it was the first thing that everyone who came into that community saw when they entered Waterfront South. So armed with a $100,000 EPA Brownfields Assessment Grant and a $655,000 settlement, a willing community partner, the same Andy Cricken who heads up the CCMUA, purchased that site for $1. He removed 12, ton uh, 12 tanks and tons of contaminated soil, constructed a rain garden, and simultaneous simultaneously addressed a flooding issue that was also plaguing the community. Considering the other sites in the neighborhood, contaminated sites in the neighborhood, this really didn't have a huge impact environmentally. More important to the community, it addressed several of their social and economic issues, but the biggest thing was that it was their priority. It was what they selected for Frank to work on. So this project catalyzed the creation of Camden Smart Initiative, a nationally recognized community-based infrastructure investment uh, initiative that has invested more than $250 million in the past seven years. And more importantly, it established a trusted relationship that allowed agencies to work on bigger issues. So this effort in Camden became known as the Camden Collaborative Initiative, which was formalized 
through letters among five local, regional, state, and federal partners in 2013, and was recognized by, with EPA's Environmental Champion Award in 2016 for most innovative and effective public-private partnership. There are currently more than 70 organizations, that's seven O organizations, active in the Camden Collaborative Initiative in seven distinct but integrated work groups. In 2015, the Camden Collaborative was duplicated in three additional cities, each with its own champion, its own Frank McLaughlin, under the Broader Community Collaborative Initiative, or CCI. So how does CCI differ from a traditional uh, government services approach for environmental protection? So I want to focus on two main areas. First, that it's a partnership based versus a regulatory relationship with the community. And second, a place-based versus media-specific. Uh, works on place-based versus media-specific priorities. Traditional programs do great work, but they're limited in the areas of their responsibility. I'm sure you've heard the term silos or lanes, and that's what we're looking to break. The Community Collaborative Initiative focuses on the efforts of traditional programs and aligns them with local goals and confronts issues that fall between programs to create new approaches and strategies to solve old problems, partner with communities to address their needs, leverage non-traditional resources with unexpected partners, connect complex problems with diverse expertise, resurrect stalled projects, and make good projects great, all with the goal of revitalizing distressed communities. So one of the goals of the CCI was to create a place-based collaborative model. Well, here was our laboratory, literally. The Camden Lab site is a four-acre abandoned brownfield in a residential, a residential area with nearby schools, another magnet for illegal dumping, drugs, and prostitution. Goals for the project were to demolish the seven buildings, halt the illegal dumping, and create desperately needed recreation and open space. Non-traditional partners for the DEP included the Camden DPW, the Camden Police Department, the Camden Redevelopment Authority, the US EPA that provided funding through brownfields and cleanup grants, and the hou and housing and urban development that awarded a $13.2 million choice implementation grant to really get the ball rolling. And what did we learn? That Brownfield's planning is a great catalyst for this kind of activity. And that participation and, and expertise from many diverse partners results in, a, results in a more comprehensive and permanent solution. Opportunities happen, and if you're not there, you miss them. The importance of being in the community really can't be understated. So let's leave Frank and Camden for a moment and go to Perth Amboy, New Jersey. While Bill Linder, another CCI team member, was working with the Perth Amboy community to remediate and transform a PCB-contaminated scrapyard across from an elementary school, a private developer purchased the adjacent brownfield parcel for industrial redevelopment. Immediately after that parcel was purchased, Bill met with the developer and started talking about how he might be able to modify his design. He wanted to help him incorporate green infrastructure and community amenities into the design project. As a result of Bill's meeting, the developer's design now includes community amphitheater and riverfront walking path. And this project that began as a good project creating jobs now a is now a great project with environment environmental and community benefits. So what started in one city with one person has now evolved into, th grew, eventually grew into three and then grew into four. 
Recognizing the enormous economic benefits of the CCI, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority recently signed an MOU with the New Jersey DEP to expand the CCI to eight additional cities. The MOU includes $1.1 million committed by EDA to fund six additional CCI team members and to expand the initiative statewide from the current four to 12 municipalities. The six individuals were selected just this past Friday from a pool of 44 applicants from across all DEP program areas. So, so as you can see, the Community Collaborative Initiative seeks solutions to a multitude of interrelated environmental, social, and economic issues, all designed to revitalize communities while staying within DEP's core mission to protect, enhance, and restore the environment. Are you ready to transform? Are you ready to make a change? Well, if you are, I encourage you to seek out the innovators and transformers and the risk takers in your own organization and cultivate their passion and their innovation and enthusiasm. They will make you uncomfortable at times, but their productivity, their passion, and their innovation is well worth it. And let me tell you, I would not want a whole staff of innovators. I would never survive having a whole staff of innovators but the ones that I would have, I would not trade for anything. So if you'd like to learn more about the, more information about the uh, Community Collaborative, the two men I have listed here are the real experts, and I encourage you to reach out for them, to them for more information. Thank you. So um, do we have any questions for VN or Ken about um, their approaches to revitalizing overburdened communities. Please um, introduce yourself before asking your question. Hafidi, thank you for um, your time and sharing your work. Uh, my name is Maribel Kinata, and I work with Friends of Reefs Guam. And this is a program uh, funded by NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Um, but my focus is on community outreach and involvement in conservation. Um, but I wanted to ask about what those early phases of even having conversations with the communities you work with, like what was the toughest part? Because I think a lot of people that do outreach um, immediately experience resistance because of not addressing previous concerns that have been like 10, 20 years, um, you know, festering. So I wanted to ask about what your process or the experience was like for your team or for yourselves? So um, the real challenge was gaining the trust of the community. We had always gone in thinking what we knew was best and we thought, you know, we were going to deal with all of the problems in those underserved communities. But having someone actually go into the community, spend time there and listen is really what changed everything for us. And now we're trying to duplicate that process. The individuals that we've uh, just moved into the office, their full-time job is going to be in each of those communities, and Frank is going to work with them to build the same kind of trust and to try to duplicate that model. But it was all about gaining the trust and showing the communities that we were there to listen and not as, government, uh, not as the government thinking that we knew what was best for them. I will add, I mean, I completely echo everything you said. And for us, it was um, trust is not a black or white issue. It's a building thing, right? It's not you trust them or you don't trust them. You build trust, and the more you build trust, the more you can do work together, I think. Um, but the building of the trust is a very slow on-ramp. And for us, it, it required really listening. And there will be a portion of time where you get 
flagellation, right? You get hit over and over again for the things that you didn't do, for the pains and the problems that people before you have caused and you're, you're inheriting. And you're going to have, for us, we had to take it. We had to take it and we had to accept the responsibility for it. We're not to blame, but we are responsible. And for instance, a quick story around New Orleans. After the BP oil spill, our organization wanted to help support the Vietnamese community that was um, devastated by the eradication of the sea life because of the spill. So I got sent in because my last name is Vietnamese. And I mean, really, they're like, your name is like their name. They'll trust you, go. And I showed up, <laughs> right? There's a lot of knowing laughter. I showed up and everybody's like, you're not Vietnamese. I'm like, I know, but my boss doesn't. <laughs> And they said, well, what are you doing here? I'm like, I don't know yet, um, but please don't get me fired. And, and they said, okay, well, what can you do? I'm like, I, I can listen and I can figure out from the experience of which we have, what of the menu of services we have that can actually make sense. So I literally, we were there for a week. I sat for three days just listening just going to meetings and listening, just going to meetings and getting hit over the head for all the things, our organization and our people, and all the other things that we did not do, we just listened and said, yep, that's right. And now what can I do? And from that, they said one thing that was key and I never forgot. A lot of people came to New Orleans after the Katrina um, storm and came and took their stories, came and took the resources, came and took the contracts and they left nothing, and they fixed nothing. And that pain and that trust hurt so deeply that it was hard for them to ever build trust with anybody else again. And for me, I felt a real responsibility to never do that, to believe better and to leave with more trust. And from that, we then said we were able to help the uh, community and the nonprofits in the area. A lot of Vietnamese families there, or 90% of the fa Vietnamese families there were dependent on shrimping. Because of the oil spill, all of that was eradicated. And when I asked what other jobs you have, they said, well, the nail salon, really that was it. And we were able to help their story get on news and get on um, YouTube and get on a bunch of other things so that we can help raise money for them. And we were able to leave a legacy of helping to fundraise for the organizations there. But not only that, the video we created for them, um, which is online under Green For All, got the most views in the world that week. They get 90,000 views in a few days. Because of that, people who didn't know that there was even a Vietnamese community in the Gulf Coast was sending in support. And so for us, we had to sit up, listen, apologize, know that we're not to blame, but we are responsible. And our responsibility carries not only to heal from the past, but also in moving towards the future to continue to safeguard that trust. Questions for? Panelists. Thank you. Um, this is actually more a comment than a question. My, I'm David Eisenberg. I'm uh, the, develop, the director of the Development Center for Appropriate Technology. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is David Eisenberg. I'm the director of the Development Center for Appropriate Technology in Tucson. And I'll be talking about building codes and green building later. But really, first of all, I want to thank both of you for the, for the work that you're doing, because it's fabulous. Um, years ago, a British architect named John Turner gave me a term, a word, that's been really powerful in our work. And the word is INPERT, I-N-P-E-R-T. So you have experts who come from outside with their expertise. And you have INPERTs who are the neighbors, the people of a community, of an organization, of a system. They actually know things that the experts don't know and can't know and need to know 
And the thing I love about that word is it gives standing in these processes to people who never have standing. And I've used it a couple of times in community processes where the experts are running roughshod over the, over the neighbors or the people. And just to interrupt and say, OK, you guys are the experts. These people are the inputs. One of the things that happened, I've done it a, a few times. The first time, the reaction was the same one I had, which was the experts were just kind of lit up. They just went, oh my god, that's, yeah, this is, this is terrific. The second time, they got pissed off. So it's also a really good tool to know whether or not you have the right experts. Um, and the other thing is just that you should always start whatever you're doing if you're going someplace that's not of your, of your place. You should start with questions. That's the most important thing. You don't have answers if you haven't asked the right questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Excellent comments. I love the term inpert, I have to say. We'll see if this is working. Uh, hi for day. Uh, Bradley Nolan from one here at all. I apologize for my horrible Australian accent. Um, I am uh, in the region to uh, implement a, uh, a waste management program across 15 countries. Um, obviously very excited to hear about placemaking making its way into the Pacific. It's something that I, I dealt with in Australia for a bit. Um, both of your presentations were talking about public private partnerships and making those uh, those activities work and engaging effectively in the communities and and the uh, and the, the public offices that are, are dealing in these spaces. I'm just wondering if there's one or two key lessons or advice that you'd like to give to people like myself in the room on how to have effective public private partnerships in delivering these types of projects. We do a lot of partnerships with different communities and um, including uh, with the public sector. The first thing that came into mind, because I think I'm standing next to Ken and um, our experience in working with agencies and with government, oftentimes we are, our initial work is to develop policy in collaboration with the imports in the world of the community. Um, we show up, we listen, what is happening? And then we take that information and we create solutions and we ground truth it. Does it make sense? Is this right? For a community um, in the United States, it's quite diverse. For California even, a lot of the policies we create is very diverse, right? 200 plus languages and communities where urban poverty is so different than rural poverty, where what economy works in one area doesn't work for the other area. So we talk to the community and to the different stakeholders and ask, what are the problems? Here are the solutions we think might work. Does that make sense to you guys? Does that, do you think it'll work? And then we work on passing legislation and we work on creating huge kind of uh, unprecedented legislation that will move billions and create precedents we can replicate nationally, federally, globally at times. And then we talk about um, to the government agencies once those policies are passed, here's what the intention was. Here's what the goals were. And I often think that the bulk of the work is in the implementation work. It's in the agency side, because all of that stuff may be sexy, but the real work, the real hard work, and the real possibilities and reality happens when it hits the ground. And Ken, I'd love for you to say a little bit about what that experience is like. Yeah. So yeah, you know, um, I think I would agree that, you know, a lot of the groundwork is done. Pardon? So uh, yeah, I think the government has to lay a lot of that groundwork and, and invest those initial dollars like that seed money to get things going. And then um, and I think once you start demonstrating success, those private partners, they want to be part of that because that's part of their image. You know, they, they, that's really important to them and that's when the dollars start to roll in. People want, you know, they say success breeds success. So as soon as you start having those wins and getting that first win is huge. 
and then people want to get on that train and want to be there with you. So that's kind of how our model has worked so far. That's how the public dollars have rolled in. Mm -hmm. But we do lay the groundwork with the government, uh, that seed money, whether it's state or federal, or, and the variety of federal agencies that we've had who've wanted to be part of this program. And then, like I said, those private dollars, they start to come in. Um, picking up on that strand, so one of the partnerships we created was um, with the Ecos, Earth Friendly Products. They're, one of, they're a global company, and they create um, laundry, detergents, you know, pet products, et cetera. They're the competitor to Tide. And we started working with a CEO there. Uh, they wanted to do what you were saying earlier about the co-branding. They wanted to have a win that they can be proud of. Our brand, and because we're known in the States as a very credible kind of player solving poverty and pollution, they wanted to figure out how they can support and work with us. And brand marketing and cause marketing is a huge thing in corporations right now. It's huge, um, especially with the kind of the advent of millennials demanding that from their, um, from their corporations. And so starting um, in a few months, when you go to any of the major stores like a Walmart or a Target and you buy earth friendly products, you'll see them list and portions of um, this laundry detergent is gonna go to Green For All, our company, right? Because it's an incentive. We did good work and that helps their brand in saying that they're gonna support us. We get some support in dollars, but we, it's a, it's a, the question earlier about trust, it requires a sense of mutual trust that we're continuing to do good work. Okay, I want to thank everybody for their thoughtful questions. Thank you to the panelists. And um, we're going to turn this over. Thank you, everybody. Who we'd like to invite up? Uh, Mr. Joaquin PLG Cook, Bank of Guam. Thank you, Bank of Guam, for being one of our sponsors. Round of applause. And I'd like to ask Mr. Cook to come up and share some of the, the good activities that his bank is undertaking with respect to sustainability. Thank you. Buenas and half a day, everyone. Uh, Jackie asked me to come and say a few words. We were invited, and I didn't know I was going to be uh, wedged in between a hungry mob and a buffet of delicious food served by, <laughs> served by Hyatt. So just real quick, uh, first of all, it's an honor. Um, to be with you here this morning, and um, is this still on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, at the 30th Pacific Islands Environment Conference. Uh, we're proud to be a sponsor of this event, an important week-long event. And I would like to salute the uh, Guam Environmental Protection Agency as the lead, putting this together. Good job, you guys. And also in partnership with US EPA, of course, as well as American Samoa and Sienna Meyer. Those we have our American Samoan group here and our CNMI people here. Everyone's here, so we're in CNMI. We're unfortunately not in American Samoa, but uh, uh, how do you say hello? Hello, 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 Talofa. Hello. Talofa, yes, I met Miss, uh, Miss Samoa when she was here at her fest pack. Very lovely lady. Uh, but most importantly, I'd like to particularly uh, applaud the efforts of Conchita Sinicolis Titano for all she's done. <laughs> to put this together, so thank you, Mrs. St. Nicholas Titano. The importance of this conference and conferences like this cannot be emphasized enough um, in today's day and age. Uh, as islands, as island countries, island communities, sustainability is at the heart of our survival. And given our isolation and the way we live, uh, we are, and as uh, leaders of our communities, we are responsible to um, to manage this and to promote discussions and conversations that we are having. For me personally, as the head of the largest locally owned bank on island, my responsibility doesn't just end with profitability. As a responsible leader, I need to be responsible to our employees. We have 625 employees and their families, but I also hold myself responsible to the impact our organization has on our island communities and our region. Together with my senior team, which includes Ms. Jackie Marathi, uh, and our employees, we have started having very, very meaningful discussions um, about our business practices, but most importantly, responsible business practices, and recommitting ourselves as a bank, as an organization in the region, to corporate social responsibility on an enterprise-wide level. These conversations cover topics and things we can do to support all the communities that we serve, 
and their economies through sustainable business model practices and advocating for all members, most especially our youth, and above all, discussing the interdependent relationship between sustainability and our small island economies. I'm very encouraged to hear the discussions we're all having and to see um, conferences like this as the volume, the tone, and the content of sustainability is heightened. As an organization, Bank of Guam stands by all of you in your efforts as we create a path towards a sustainable Guam, a sustainable Micronesia, and a sustainable world. We owe it to the next generation. I have children, I'm sure a lot of you have children, and their children, and their children's children, to do what we can. So together, please, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you for being here, and to do Masi. Thank you. And um, I'm not gonna open the table, I'll let someone else do that. We'll just wait for like 10 minutes, let everyone get rid Thank you very much. Thank you. Tess, thank you very much, Mr. Cook. Okay, so um, yep. we're gonna have Janice Cashew, the Director of CNMI Coastal Resources Management, to bless the table. So we can please all stand up and then we can partake in our lunch buffet for all of you. Here you go. You wanna use this one? I don't know, it doesn't matter. They actually put me in between everybody and the food. So if I could ask everyone to bow your heads. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come together this week to participate in the various trainings, workshops, and meetings for the 30th PIEC. Please guide our ideas, decisions, and actions as we work towards inspiring social change and working and charting a greener course to a more sustainable and resilient Pacific. We ask that you bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please proceed out to the main foyer for the lunch buffet and enjoy. And come right in, and we do have a special keynote, uh, lunch keynote speaker. Thank you. Half a day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Julie Carver, the, a principal with Congruent Environmental Strategies, and I am on the Jacobs team working with Guam EPA implementing their zero waste plan. Greening, the growth in, greening growth in the Pacific is a critical investment in our future that will have a direct impact on the Pacific Islands' economy and culture. The U.S. Air Force presence in the Pacific not only provides for the defense of our airspace, the leadership of installations like Anderson Air Force Base on Guam, and the Navy base on Guam also provides inspiration and leadership in implementing environmentally responsible practices. The experience the US Air Force has gained in the Pacific and worldwide leading the way with sustainability initiatives is something the Pacific Islands can benefit greatly from and that our keynote speaker has a tremendous amount of experience with. It's a great honor for me to introduce the Honorable John W. Henderson, the Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Air Force for Installations, Environment, and Energy. He is responsible for the formulation of plans, policies, programs, and budgets to meet the U.S. Air Force installations, energy, environment, and occupational health and safety objectives. Mr. Henderson was commissioned in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in May 1994 upon graduation from the South Dakota School of Mines and retired in the grade of colonel in 2017 after a 23-year career. Mr. Henderson commanded an engineer battalion during Operation Enduring Freedom and deployed with the 25th Infantry Division in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers during two tours supporting Operation Iraqi Freedom. He held multiple command and staff positions throughout his career, including five assignments with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, culminating as the Omaha District Commander. Mr. Henderson is, a registered, is registered as a licensed professional engineer in the state of South Dakota. In an interesting illustration of just how small the world can be, I'd like to make a remark about a fascinating connection 
between Mr. Henderson, Guam, and South Dakota. Mr. Henderson and I are both graduates of the South Dakota School of Mines, an engineering college with an amazing reputation in the Western United States, about 6,700 miles away from Guam. The chairwoman of this year's Pacific Islands Environment Conference, Ms. Conchita Taitano, her late husband, Fred Ott, was also a graduate of South Dakota School of Mines and a contemporary of mine. And their teenage son, Frederick, is considering continuing in his father's footsteps and attending the South Dakota School of Mines when he graduates from high school at St. John's here on Guam in a couple of years. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. John Henderson. All right, I guess the mic's about the right spot. I don't think I want to hold the mic. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk to your son about the South Dakota School of Mines sometime. I'm trying to talk my own kids into going there. So uh, anyway, it's a great school and it's, it's a great connection and um, uh, really honored to be here today. So uh, I know the governor was planning to be here today. I had a great opportunity to, to talk with her a little bit this morning. And um, anyway, uh, wish she could be here today. Uh, but um, a lot of the stuff that we're gonna talk about uh, I just finished with her also on the kind of the same subject. So um, in her absence, I just wanted to uh, welcome Speaker Munya Barnes, Administration, Administrator Leon Guerrero, Administrator Stoker, uh, Administrator Fenton, Miss um, Leon Guerrero. I think that, uh, did she come back? I didn't see her come back. I met her this morning. Um, and Mr. Bob Perone. It's, it's an honor to be here with you all today. And I'd also like to take this uh, uh, opportunity to recognize the, the PIEC uh, 2019 Organizational uh, Committee uh, Chairs uh, Conchita, uh, thanks again, um, and uh, Julie Mendoza. Uh, is Julie here outside? I don't know. I just want to say thanks for bringing us all together and thanks for uh, uh, all the organization and logistics that goes into these conferences. I know it's a lot of work, so thank you for, for everything you do there. Um, I want to say thanks also to all of you for investing your time and expense uh, to be here for this conference today. Uh, we consider it a great privilege to be here uh, with you all to discuss and to collaborate uh, the many important things uh, that we're all doing to be better stewards of our environment. Thank you for what you all do to, to protect, our, protect our environment, to make our ecosystems more resilient, and to find sustainable solutions to ensure our natural resources continue to provide for us for now and, and, and in the future. On behalf of the Secretary of the Air Force, the Acting Secretary of the Air Force, and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, uh, I want to thank the, the Governor's administration and her staff uh, for everything that they do for our Air Force. Uh, we appreciate all the, the support that they give our service members here at Guam, uh, our families stationed here, uh, uh, their support and the, the community support that we receive uh, from the local leaders of Guam and the, and the, and the people of Guam here are absolutely essential. Uh, the combined partnership of this community uh, the accept, is exceptional valuable from, exceptionally valuable from a military perspective, and we just wanted to publicly uh, thank you, uh, the governor's administration, uh, and let you know that we really appreciate the leadership of, of everybody here uh, to find some balance between the military service, uh, uh, the military presence here, um, and then the cultural and environmental resources here. Um, our mission in the Air Force is to provide our nation uh, the most effective airspace and cyberspace power in the world to be able to fly, fight, and win in support of our joint warfighting operations. To do this, it takes more than just aircraft and more than just warfighting platforms to get our mission done. We need to recruit the best people. We need uh, world-class training opportunities, and we need bases that can project combat power, that can help us generate readiness, and to provide safe and healthy communities uh, for our airmen and our families. In this regard, Guam is strategically vital to ensuring the regional security and stability, to, protecting, to projecting military force in support of operations throughout the Pacific area of responsibility, and for providing world-class support uh, to our military bases located here. 
The defense of our great nation takes a strong team of teams in which we are all contributing members. So thank you for what you all do to support our nation and to support our military. Our mission is executed by one of the largest and most diverse workforces in the world, and it's extremely energy and naturally, natural resource intensive. The energy requirements for our bases and the missions that they support can actually span across multiple installations and require considerable dependence on natural resources. In order for us to continue achieving our mission success, we recognize the need to find balance in our natural e ecosystems, to develop resilient, sustainable energy sources through common sense practices and new technologies. Air Force sustainability is not a standalone program, nor is it simply an energy or environmental initiative. Rather, it's a holistic philosophy, an integrated management approach that connects activities today with those of the future through sound business, environmental, energy, and material management practices. We also ensure compliance with several, several laws and regulations that direct hazardous and solid waste management, waste minimization, and the diversion of solid waste from landfills. We have implemented common sense initiatives that require the purchase of environmentally friendly and sustainable project, products. And we also ensure that new construction and major renovations adhere uh, to specific sustainability principles. Executive Order 13834 establishes statutory requirements for federal agencies that inc to increase the efficiency and optimize performance, eliminate unnecessary resources, and protect the environment. This new executive order, which was signed by the President last May, pretty closely aligns to the many, many of the initiatives uh, that Guam is pursuing through the Zero Waste Plan. Now I'd like to take some time today to discuss the status of a few initiatives that we're doing in the Air Force that are also along these lines and support this executive order. I'll start with some of our energy and water programs, and then I'd like to uh, move into a broader discussion about where, uh, what we're doing on the uh, natural resources side of our business. First of all, I'll acknowledge up front, uh, the DOD is one of the largest consumers of energy in the world, and the Air Force is the largest consumer of energy inside of DOD. We spend about six to seven billion dollars every year alone just on jet fuel and another billion dollars to power the missions that are located at our bases. So we have to work very hard to guarantee the supplies chain is sustainable and that it's resilient to ensure mission success. This means that every project we do is an opportunity to improve resilience and sustainability while reducing the demand on our energy resources. While ensuring the efficient use of energy we have is an important aspect of project planning, we must also ensure that it's resilient in the face of multiple threats to include physical threats, cyber threats, weather threats, and so on. Some of our most innovative solutions have come through public-private partnerships with the use of renewable sources in combination with traditional energy sources. Through these efforts, the Air Force has reduced our facility energy intensity by 2.2% since 2015 and 23.2% since 2003. A specific example in the Pacific region of this is a coal-fired central heat and power plant at Allison Air Force Base, which not only supplies the electricity to the base, but also provides, uses the steam byproduct to heat the facilities throughout the base to keep operations running in what is a, a brutal cold weather environment uh, in the Fairbanks area. As we were designing upgrades to this plant, energy conservation efforts had to include both steam and electricity reduction at the facility in order to result in the reduction of coal used uh, to power the facility. And the most effective way to do this was not only to improve the efficiency of the plant itself, but also to improve um, the, the efficiency of the steam distribution uh, utilidors. So in addition to designing turbine upgrades for the plant, we've also invested another $50 million to upgrade other internal plant infrastructure in the steam distribution utilidors, uh, which is projected to significantly reduce uh, the requirement for coal and ensure the plant remains a viable resource for heat and for electricity for decades to come. Last year, renewable electricity accounted for 6.8% of our electricity consumed across the enterprise, and we are working to increase this percentage as we see viable opportunities to do so. The Air Force currently has 325 renewable energy projects in operation at 114 sites through a variety of, uh, through a variety of project deliver delivery methods to include power, uh, uh, through, to include <laughs> uh, PPAs, enhanced use leases, and energy energy resilience conservation investment program projects and military construction projects. 
An example of this is uh, we recently awarded a 28.2 megawatt uh, power purchase agreement uh, for a solar, uh, solar photovoltaic project at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Vandenberg is a place where we have a high intensity uh, of space missions there. The solar array became operational in January 2018 and was funded using a third party contract model um, and an associated land lease. The power generated from this array will be used exclusively at the base and will provide a third of the power requirements uh, for the Vandenberg Air Force Base. The Air Force has also reduced potable water intensity by 23% from a fiscal 2007 baseline. A good example of this in the Pacific region is at Osan Air Force Base in South Korea where we are completing several conservation projects to, such as replacing shower heads and sink aerators, reducing water leaks from frozen pipes and mechanical rooms, reducing the number of pop-off valve induced uh, water losses and promoting base occupant awareness initiatives to conserve water. We've also reduced non-potable industrial landscaping and agricultural water consumption by almost 45% uh, from a 2010 baseline and 8.3% 8 since 2017. At Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado, we focused our efforts on reducing uh, turf grass irrigation requirements. Uh, this is a 10 acre project uh, that was completed last year and we're expected to save 14 million gallons per year just by that one small project. And finally, in, the, in this part of the portfolio, the Air Force has awarded over $1 billion in energy savings performance contracts and utility energy service contracts over the last seven years. In 2016, we awarded a $262 million ESPC at Tinker Air Force Base, which is the largest award to date and part of an overall $335 million of investment and awards in 2016. Last year alone, uh, we awarded $614 million in ESPCs and UASCs, uh, which include over $243, uh, $243 million project in Misawa Air Base in Japan and another $143 million project at Joint Base San Antonio. These projects are an important part of incentivizing ways to develop long-term, sustainable, resilient solutions to ensure that we have the energy and the water resources we need to ensure our continued mission success as an Air Force. In addition to the energy and water resources, the Air Force is making significant investments to sustain the natural resource systems that we need to be successful. The amount of natural and built infrastructure necessary to sustain the world's most lethal air, space, and cyber force is absolutely massive. We are stewards for over 9 million acres of land, including forests, prairies, deserts, wetlands, and coastal habitats. 600,000 of these acres is in forest, and 260,000 of these acres is in wetlands. We are also the caretakers for over 186 public drinking water systems, including 79 regulated water systems which serve over a million people. We help to protect 103 endangered species, which inhabit 54 of our installations. And finally, we consult with 319 federally recognized tribes which are affiliated with Air Force installations nationwide on a myriad of topics that, uh, that we discuss with them, but pre uh, pre um, Preeminently, those topics uh, center around cultural and natural resources. So we find ourselves facilitating this delicate balance between meeting our conservation obligations without diminishing uh, military readiness to train and defend the nation, uh, both now and the future. We're also required to be good stewards of the taxpayer funds and to conduct our mission in the most effective and efficient way possible. Our ability to sustain military readiness and other installation activities depends on proactive, ecosystem-based management strategies that help our installations promote healthy landscapes, maintain realistic training environments, and ensure regulatory compliance. We manage our natural resources to facilitate test and training, mission readiness, range sustainability, and de while demonstrating stewardship of those resources and complying with the applicable conservation laws to include the Endangered Species Act. Uh, an example, uh, our best example of this is right here in Guam where we work very closely with the Joint Re Region Marianas leadership and the government of Guam on the recovery of species such as the Guam Micronesian Kingfisher. The Department of the Navy and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service signed a memorandum of agreement uh, in June of 2015 regarding the conservation of the Micronesian Kingfisher. The MOA was put into place uh, to support the relocation of the U.S. Marines to Guam, as well as to ensure sufficient amount of suitable sur survival recovery habitat is conserved and managed for the reintroduction and recovery of the Micronesian Kingfisher. 
The Air Force is also working with Joint Region Marianas leadership and with the USDA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to fund, develop, and implement a unique and successful system to prevent the brown tree snake from being transmitted from Guam to any other of the Pacific Islands. Through the use of highly skilled and trained inspection dogs and handlers uh, and other preventive and trapping mechanisms, uh, we have prevented the escape of the brown tree snake from our aircraft cargo. And under the joint region construct here in Guam, uh, the U.S. Navy has continued to successfully administer this program both at Navy sites and U.S. Air Force sites uh, across uh, the island. More recently, the Air Force has contributed to the development of a portable drown, brown tree stake barrier that can be deployed to other Pacific islands and locations to ensure that there's an added layer of biosecurity uh, to ensure that the brown tree snake, um, in case a brown tree snake would manage um, to avoid detection and screening prior to departure from Guam. With regard to uh, environmental cleanup and remediation, the Air Force takes our cleanup responsibilities seriously and, and conducts them in an open and transparent manner and in accordance with federal cleanup laws and authorities. For us, this is about the health and safety uh, for the uh, how health and safe the health and safety of the places that we live and work, and it's about being good partners with the communities who support our installations. We are de demonstrating our continued resolve towards safety and environmental stewardship by addressing the hazards from wartime buried uh, munitions and explosives of concern, as well as remediating nearly 4,000 active contaminated sites around the world. We strive to minimize or eliminate the, the volume and toxicity of solid waste and hazardous waste generated by Air Force operations. This is, <laughs> is that my sign to get off? <laughs> I get it, that, that's like the gong show, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. All right, back to solid waste disposal. <laughs> We strive to minimize or eliminate the volume and toxicity of solid waste and hazardous waste generated by Air Force operations. This is a key element of risk reduction to maximize efficiencies while supporting the mission through innovative recycling and reuse tactics which reduce both the procurement and disposal costs. For example, last year the Air Force diverted 41% of almost 400,000 tons of non-hazardous municipal waste and 75% of its construction and demolition debris. One of our highlights here was uh, the Air National Guard base in Burlington, Vermont was recognized with the 2018 Environmental Protection Agency Federal Green Challenge Award for recycling asphalt, metals, plastics, cardboard, and concrete related to an apron and taxiway project that we were doing there. As the Air Force upgrades or rebuilds facilities, whether due to deterioration or natural disaster, they are designated to be, they're designed to be compliant with the updated unified facilities criteria and the guiding principles for high performance sustainable buildings. Last year, the Air Force completed work on several major high performance sustainable buildings projects to include a 45 year old pre engineered metal building used as a jet engine shop at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam uh, that was renovated to meet current codes, including high performance building envelope, uh, the uh, electrical and lighting upgrades, improved thermal efficiency, and new HVAC and plumbing systems. So I could go on all day about the things that we're doing across the enterprise. But these are just a few of the many initiatives the Air Force is pursuing locally and across our enterprise to ensure that our energy and natural resource systems are resilient and sustainable. I know that much of what will be discussed here today and shared and learned this week will involve a number of solutions and initiatives like these uh, that you all are working to implement with the organizations that you're here representing. This conference is a tremendous opportunity for us all to cross-level our best practices, to generate new and innovative ideas, um, and to help us all find uh, sustainable solutions to find balance with nature. I hope that this discussion will inspire, inspire some conversation and add some value uh, to your time spent here this week. So thank you all for your partnership and collaboration as we work together as a strong team of teams to support and support of the long-term sustainability of our natural resource systems, uh, the health and safety of our service members and the communities in, in which they serve, and the defense of our nation. These are things that the Air Force takes very seriously, and we're committing to doing our part in Guam, throughout the Pacific region, and throughout the world. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of your conference. It was great to hear about everything that the U.S. military is doing to help sustainability in the Pacific and throughout the world. 
All right, folks, um, that wraps up our keynote speech. You'll be going on to your next session, which I believe starts in about five minutes. Those who know about coral reefs, lagoons are the ones that heat up the most when bleaching or sea temperatures increases and corals died in lagoons. But I was able to see these in that area where they are supposed to die. Then move to the Solomon Islands, and for some this might be a weedy species, but in our case, when we got to see it, it was full of fish, and again, it was from the shallow all the way to 12 meters, 100% coral cover of this species, and about 100 meters wide. Again, and from the shallows as well, rich, dense corals. This one, I'm showing off now here. I got to see there, this one in Dobu Island in Papua New Guinea. Again, it was 100 meters in diameter patch reef, full, full of coral. There was not a single space open that wasn't covered on coral reef. As you may know, Papua New Guinea is one of the poorest countries in the world, and you still get to see these places despite our reefs people depending solely on coral reefs for surviving. They are destroying the forest because they don't have other means for mangroves, and you just get in the water and see these things. And when you hear news, you know, that coral reefs are disappearing, that they're dying, they're dying, they're dying, but you still see these things, you ask yourself, what's going on? Are reefs actually dying or not? And yes, in some places, they're dying but in other ones, they're developing. In South Africa, those who have been able to be in the border between Mozambique and South Africa, we have a subtropical reef that is becoming a tropical reef because of sea temperatures increasing. So what we're facing is a pro natural process, I believe, of uh, re redistribution of coral reefs. And I see it as a positive, as an opportunity, especially when you see that there is evidence that we still don't know much about coral bleaching. That in the last 25 years, the data shows that coral reefs are adapting to coral bleaching. So if you give them the opportunity, corals will adapt. Also, not only for bleaching, but in very difficult environments of future environments like acidif acidified oceans, you still see corals. In high sedimented areas, you still see corals. Just shows me that we still don't know much about corals, that corals will outlive us. Who we need to be worried about is us, you, myself, and those who depend on coral reefs. In the evolutionary record, coral reefs have come and go many times. And every time, they come back stronger, more diverse. That's a natural process if we look at it in a geological terms. So when I see this picture, yes, I cry. It's really sad to see this happening. But I see it as an opportunity. For some modelers, it's very difficult to decide where to build, where to intervene the coast, because you don't know if tomorrow that area is gonna be a new, new reef area. As sea level rise increases, there's gonna be new area for corals to settle. So we still don't know. The future is like this. A lot of bleaching, you know, that is gonna happen. But some areas will change, some areas are changing again, but other ones will develop new reefs. And that's the opportunity that we need to tackle. We need to understand that some people will suffer for the reefs that will disappear as they know them today. And we need to start thinking about how we're gonna keep those reefs going where we are in our garden so that we can continue enjoying those benefits. So my point here is that reefs will continue, reefs will adapt, they're showing signs already of adaptation. Who will not be able to adapt 
I think, are ourselves. We depend so much on coral reefs. The social and economic dependence of coral reefs is humongous. About one billion people depend on coral reefs. And in red is how vulnerable we are to coral reefs. We need to act. We need to find ways to rehabilitate live coral cover, the structural complexity, so that we can benefit from the ecosystem services that whatever reefs of tomorrow we're going to have. I believe that's the job that we have in our hands now. It's how we're going to ensure that the reefs, through that process of change, will continue providing us food, protection, and tourism. So for that, I have put together seven ways that we can restore reefs for tomorrow. And when I say for tomorrow, I mean how we can keep those reefs going for our own use. And that's just applying what we already know. Coral gardening and reef restoration has been happening for so many years. We already know what works and what doesn't work. Still some things that we still need to uh, uh, research and do, but there are basics that we already know how to implement strategies to use that will keep us going for a while. The first thing is control or reduce threats, obviously. It's still those places that are still doing well, we need to protect them, we need to conserve them, ensure that they keep as they are, that the impacts that we have in our reefs are controlled and are reduced. That plus other things will keep us going for a while. And an example, in terms of the biggest threat that coral reefs have, which is human population, in areas like the Pacific Islands, the South Pacific Islands, where this, the least amount of people after Australia, coral reefs have come and go in the last 25 years. They have seen disturbances like bleaching and cuts. They go up, uh, bleaching comes, the coral cover decreases, they go up again, cuts come, they go down, but they go up. On average, the South Pacific Islands show the same coral cover in the last 25 years. High resilience. Because there is few people, I believe, and few other um, conserve, um, um, threats. The same is with macroalgae. Still remains the same. And in the South Pacific Islands, we see the same results with inhabited and uninhabited areas. And it's just because People, even though use those reefs, they have this cultural strategy to select and regulate the use of the reefs, the taboo areas. So we need to look into those systems of protections. And the same is for marine protected areas. The second one, while we protect what we have, while we reduce the threats, the second strategy I propose is propagate the survivors. Nature is already selecting for us the species and the colonies and the individuals that are going to carry on. They're already doing it for us. We don't need to do much that monitor, keep doing what we do best, which is monitoring, identify those survivors, and propagate them. That differential bleaching or resistance happens at the species level and at the individual level. In the Seychelles, where I did a large scale reef restoration project, we propagate corals who survived the 1998 bleaching event, the 2010 bleaching event. We transplanted those in a, a reef and we finished transplanting in 2014. We had a healthy, healthy site that we monitor, natural, that we didn't intervene, and a transplanted site. Healthy at the top, transplanted at the bottom. In 2016, when the third massive or global bleaching event happened, we monitor what's going to happen you know, for those corals that we transplanted. 
which were naturally survivors of previous bleaching events. Somehow, they should have natural bleaching resistance. And what we found was that from dark is alive to very light green or white is dead with algae. If you see the two, it took longer for the transplanted corals to bleach. It took longer for them to die while bleach. They, at the end, they die because the conditions at that in 2016 for bleaching were really, really harsh. But the principle of propagating those survi survivors, which are naturally bleaching resistant, definitely holds here. You add a little bit of resistance to that reef. If you manage to find a way to reduce the stress that causes the bleaching, you buy, you already have, you're, you're already buying some time by transplanting those survivors. The third one is, so you protect. You find the survivors and collect them. Put them in a nursery, whether inland or land-based. It's up to you, depending on your budget. And use that as a species, genetic repositories, or, and or reproductive have. Hub. Imagine a Noah's Ark. Build that nursery as a Noah's Ark, where you have those survivors in terms of a species or in terms of individuals within a species. Doesn't matter if you use a small nursery, a basic nursery, but just keep those corals there that are survivors growing. Protect them. That's a strategy that one of the fathers of coral restoration, Austin Bowden Kirby, is doing now. Is when the bleaching comes, he goes and see which ones are surviving and puts them now in the nursery, trying to now provide a control environment for those corals and uh, propagate them once the conditions are back to normal. Or you can use a larger scale if you want, but imagine that you have that nursery with those survivors, and then you use that nursery as a reproductive hub, and then you move that nursery to whichever site you want to restore, and when those corals are mature, you let them reproduce, and then you have that genetic diversity that everybody you know, looks when doing reef restoration. So you use a tool that you already know that works with those corals that are already strong and use it to combine um, um, two strategies, coral gardening and sexual reproduction to increase that genetic diversity and improve the resilience of the reef. You control, you find the survivors, you put them in a nursery and use that nursery as a hub or genetic repository. The second, or oh, sorry, the fourth strategy that I suggest you do now is to increase the density of the fast growing corals that you have. And to me, everybody says, yeah, but what about the massive ones? You know, you're forgetting about the massive ones. You need to work with the massive corals. Yes, but the problem there is the concept of the chicken or the egg. What came first, the branching coral or the massive coral? I believe that the first thing to arrive on a place to colonize are the branching corals. And I see it on a sandy lagoon. Branching corals are the ones who dominate, colonize the area, and as they die, they provide that hard substrate that other animals need to settle. I see it, I have seen it in the youngest island in the world, only two years old, and the first thing that you find when you get in the water are branching corals. In Seychelles, in granite boulders, whatever substrate you find, what dominates there? Branching corals. Dead corals colonized by branching, branching corals. Wrecks, the first thing that you see are branching corals. Branching corals are fast growers that will change the ecosystem, will provide habitat and the structural complexity that will provide the cues, chemical and physical and biological cues for the other organisms to settle and take advantage of that new habitat. 
And the same is for recently degraded reefs. What you find, the first thing to arrive is branching corals. And as you, and what they do, or as you find these branching corals, what they're doing again is improving the structural complexity and therefore they are increasing uh, habitat, therefore fish biomass, and as these meta-analyses show as well, you decrease macroalgae cover as you increase structural complexity. So if you have a problem of pollution and then you find a way to propagate those corals that are already used to or thrive in polluted waters, you have a way to control algae just by transplanting corals. The problem is that branching corals are decreasing, especially in the South Pacific Islands. This report of 25 years of monitoring shows that Acropodas and Pocilloporid corals are decreasing. So we are losing the corals that actually create reefs. And that's the case, I believe, for Guam as well, that they're losing a lot of stagon corals. So those are the ones I suggest that we need to pay attention if we want to restore these reefs. Increases scale and diversity of the interventions. We cannot achieve any result with two or three corals per site. We need to it at a scale that is similar to the problem. And we already know how to do it, build large scale nurseries. We already know through fragmentation how to do it faster. We already know several techniques to reproduce coral sexually. If you increase the scale and the diversity and combine interventions, you definitely have results. And we saw that in the Seychelles. I think some of you have already seen this, but nevertheless, 2012, that was the reef. Back then, we grew 40,000 colonies of 34 species in a period of a year and a half and transplanted 25,000 of those in an area the size of a football pitch. We managed to increase coral cover from 3% to 17% in the first two years, and it went up and it looked like that once we finished. Small fish, yes, but after small fish comes the big fish. We got to see uh, sharks and octopus and some other animals coming. The paper that shows the benefits, the long-term benefits after the exercise at the ecological level and after natural disturbances that kill the corals that we have transplanted is coming out now. Even though the corals die because of bleaching, the benefits of having do it massively and change the structural complexity are still seen post-disturbance. We still see natural recovery as a measure in natural uh, or coral recruitment. There, each coral that you see there or each uh, point is a coral polyp and three sites that we monitor, the healthy site, the transplanted site, and the degraded site. Clearly, where we transplanted, we saw more coral settlers. That's more coral larvae that were attracted to the site that we have transplanted. And the last, the darker points in the top one are corals belonging to genuses that we didn't transplant. So we attracted species that we didn't transplant, providing that chemical, physical cue for the corals to settle. Those were the massive ones that everybody says you should be working on. So naturally, the process of producing those branching corals in mass and transplanting provided that structural complexity, again, that propagated the corals. And the same for the coral recruitment. Another exercise that was done at large scale as well was for blast fishing using an artificial structure. And they also saw, because of the large scale intervention, they saw an increase of up to 60% coral cover, increase in natural recruitment, increase in fish density, because of the exercise of transplanting massively these structures and on top of that, corals. They did two hectares 
7,000 frames all together, and in a period of uh, three years, if I'm not mistaken, involving the community and whatnot, and they also saw positive results because, but we argue, because of the size of the exercise. Before that, everybody was saying that coral restoration doesn't work. But when we look why, the project, the biggest project that, that was done was about 200, 200 meters only, and a few thousand corals being transplanted. So you need to do it in mass, but you also need to combine strategies. Again, we already know how to do it. We already know what works, what doesn't work. Combine strategies. You protect, you grow corals, you add microfragmentation, you promote sex, so sexual reproduction. All those strategies combined will give you, will take you really far. One more. This is a, an idea after hearing yesterday about chronothorns that came into my mind. Still to be tested, but it's a concept of ecological engineer. I think you hear about fire breaks, right? To control fires in the wild. What if for Guam's reefs that have problem with chronothorns, the same in the Seychelles in many places, now in Fiji too, you have your reef that you want to restore, or that you're restoring, and then you plant those fast-growing corals. That yes, they're gonna die, most likely. Yes, they're gonna be eaten by chronothorns, but you know already how to grow them in mass. We already know how to do it. We can grow easily 40,000 corals in two years. We can grow branching species really, really fast. And if you use them as fire breaks and attract those chronothorns, you can Remove them, concentrate and remove it, and they haven't reached the reef that you want to restore. Fire breaks, it's a concept of ecological engineering, and it works on land. What is, if it works on water, maybe we can test it here in Guam. Then connect things. Single sites will not work, reefs are not on their own, they are all connected. That's your reef. That's what it is, patchy reefs. And if you connect those transplanted sites, you increase the area of your intervention. You provide that connectivity that will help you increase the genetic diversity and the gene flow so that you promote ad um, coral adaptation. And finally, involve, engage reef users. What do we do, what we do if it's not for people? Don't come and tell me that you're doing reef restoration or this because you wanna save the reef. You're doing it for the people. You're doing it for you, for the, the politician is doing it to gain some votes or because he wants to serve uh, his community, so the manager needs to do it to keep happy, you know, the people who depend on the reefs, the dive center wants to do it because he, they need to sell a, a, a diving. So we do it for people, so engage them. Once you do so, you get buy-in for your project, you get support, you get votes, you get compliance. So always engage people. So with that, I wanna leave you just to wrap up. The seven ways to restore the reef for tomorrow, I believe, it's just applying what we know. Protect, we know it works. Propagate the survivors. Build those nurseries with those survivors and use them as species genetic or reproductive hubs. Increase the density of fast-growing corals so that you can change the structural complexity very quickly. Increase the scale and the diversity of your interventions. Establish a transboundary network of Rehabilitate, rehabilitated areas, talk between islands, and then you connect that with an oceanographer model, modeler, and then you connect those transplanted sites, and finally involve and engage reef users. I believe with those seven steps, we will be very close to restore the reef for tomorrow so that we can continue enjoying the benefits of those reefs regardless of what kind of reefs we're gonna have tomorrow. 
Thank you very much again for, to Whitney for bringing me here and to all the organizations that work with me. Thank you. Any questions? And let the, coral, let the coral adapt to how the people live. In other words, you know, are we trying to change the coral? Huh? No, just let it be. And so as the population grow, the coral will adapt to how the people live in that area. Is that an option? If, if I was, do nothing. <laughs> do nothing. Just sit and wait. Yeah. We, I think that somehow that's what we're doing with no managing the greenhouses right now. Just sit and wait to see what happens. Um, I think we, can, we don't have the luxury just to sit and wait. Um, we definitely need to intervene. We already know the risk that we're facing. Land restoration has been in place for so many years and they have made so many mistakes that um, we have where to learn from, try to avoid some of those uh, mistakes. Um, the body of knowledge now suggests that we're ready to uh, intervene in, at a larger scale, is finding what will be the best strategy, not in a, um, a biologi biological way, but in a practical, feasible way that actually can reach the scale that we need. And yes, we can stop and no, nothing, but then we're going to keep, you know, having people losing those ecosystem services and having some social problems in the future. So I think we do need to uh, take action. It will be more, much more costly to just sit and wait. Oh, over here, sorry. <laughs> Um, from your years of experience, what was your biggest challenge? A human commitment, <laughs> political will. We we know we know what to do. Seriously, I I I believe that we have the answer to to our problem. Let's uh, without starting a, an argument, but control population. You know, that's, that's the top on the list, priority. Greenhouses, right? If we were able to do that, I think we, we would be fine. But we know that it's going to take a while to do that. While we manage those problems, you know, we need to intervene. And when we intervene, in, we need the political will, the human commitment, you know, to understand that this is a long-term effort. I'm lucky, and I think those who are working in restoration, we have work to do for the rest of our lives. See? But finding the funding to do it, the commitment of the people, you know, when things go wrong, because they will go wrong, and understanding that it's part of the process, you know, and doing it in a proper way. It's not only human commitment as in stay in the for the long run, but understanding that, you know, when it fails, you need to still keep trying. So. Any more questions? I guess my question is kind of along that those lines. Is, is basically, is this on? It's on, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I'll yell. Uh, is, is dealing with human commitment and cultural biases. Uh, we, uh, we, 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 our division does a lot of uh, management of coral reefs and all that. And what I find as a, a, a constant obstacle are the cultural biases and things that are set in stone that's sometimes very difficult. Uh, you talk to the local fishermen, you know, they don't, they, they go out there and do what they want to do as far as catching. But here we are on our end trying to maintain those resources. And so I guess my question is, what are those challenges and how did you deal with those in, in your endeavor? 
as far as uh, coral reefs and, and all that? Um, I think people at the ground level, people are understanding that things are going wrong, that we're losing corals, and they're more aware of that. As, at least I see it in the places where, where I work, in the Seychelles, in the Maldives, in Colombia. Um, people know that things are going wrong and they want to take action. Um, I don't think an artisanal fisherman is the problem. You know, things are, the problems are at larger scale and when we overlook uh, the, how the communities can manage themselves. And um, the challenge for me, again, is the government believing, or the management agencies believing that their way is their only way to do things. And sometimes not involving the communities, you know, and the traditional knowledge they, they, they've been around for many years and they create these taboo areas, you know, they, they know how to rotate areas. They've been practicing adaptive management for so many years in the French Polynesia, you know, in, in the Caribbean, in some places in the Pacific too. And we tend to forget about that and, and, and miss the point that they already know how to, how to do it, you know. It's when we start doing that top-down approach that we create problems because we are not acknowledge that knowledge that they have. And I think- you know, Just to follow up on that, I think what was an issue, what, what I find is always an issue, is crossing cultural lines, per se. Uh, with the traditional local uh, fishermen, uh, you know, they, they know what they do and all that. And sometimes I think what it is is they blame, or there is some blame going on, you know, to other uh, ethnic groups or, you know, it's not my problem. They're the ones that are doing it, not me. And I think that's always a challenge, trying to convince um, the, the various groups on the on island that, that oh, yeah. That will go for step number five, increase the scale and diversity of interventions, involve some social scientists that know how to handle people. You know, they, they do well, so, yeah. Thank you very much. I now have the great honor of introducing my friend, colleague, and mentor, Dr. Lori Ramundo. She is a professor of marine biology at the University of Guam and interim director of the UOG Marine Laboratory. She is a coral ecologist whose work focuses on interactions between corals and their environment, coral health, culture and propagation, and reef restoration. And she didn't write this in her bio, but she is the champion of coral reef restoration here on Guam. OK, then I'll wander. So um, I'm here to talk, uh, give you a little, a very wee story about a very small project that we're doing here. It uh, does not approach the scale that Fenner talked about, and it doesn't address the scale of what's going on in Guam that Dave talked about. But it is, so far, a success story. And so it's a nice little project that I'm very happy and very honored to be running. Okay. All right. So a lot of you on Guam know about the telecommunications table that has been installed and will link us to various parts of the world, which is really exciting. And this is basically where it's going. And it's starting in PD Bumholes, which is a marine preserve, and that area outlined in yellow. And there is a cable raceway that is being laid across reef bottom, and it has a disturbance footprint of about 3,000 square feet, hard bottom coral uh, community with about 5% live coral cover, so not a lot of coral, but it is an MPA, and uh, the management agency wanted to mitigate the damage that's being caused. So uh, Dave Burdick and I were contracted to mitigate the loss of habitat within this area, originally at a ratio of one to one. So for every coral that was impacted, we were supposed to plant another one of the same species in the same area. So it kind of looks like this. And as you can see, it's not a terribly productive looking environment. It's silty. There's very little coral. There's not a lot of habitat that's created. Um, so when we were swimming around, OK. We were swimming around trying to figure out what our general goal was, what we were trying to do. The overall goal was to replace what was lost. 
And we kind of had this question, well, but what if what was lost wasn't that great? And what if we could perhaps put something in there that was even better? So original plan, replace one to one, 5% over a 286 square meter area. And what we decided was maybe we could make something that looks eventually like this. So our plan that we put to DCA was, okay, wait, what if we scale down to a smaller size of benthic cover and put in some higher quality corals at a higher density and tried to shoot for about a 20% cover over the course of the project, knowing that if we got good survival, we'd eventually have a lot more than 20% cover. And they said, sure, that sounds like a great plan. And so our revised goal was to replace low quality with high quality habitat and then monitor how everything was doing and maintain as much as we needed to um, to keep things uh, healthy and, and going fine. So we decided on staghorns. For one reason, DCA wanted us to use corals from our nursery, and that's primarily what we're growing. Staghorn is high complexity, essential fish habitat, and you heard about uh, this just now from, from uh, Fenner. They're fast growing, they fragment easily, they're easy to culture. And we have some populations that have survived fairly well. We also have some populations that have not survived very well. And so, um, not to belabor the point that we've all been hearing about, but we are going to revisit just very briefly. So, um, between 2013 and 2017, we lost a lot of these corals from specific areas. We had some that did survive. Those are the ones that we've had in the nursery, which is why we put them in the nursery. And so there was a lot of mortality between 2013 and 2017. In 2015, we did a rapid assessment to see how much we lost. And since football fields have now become a unit of measurement, we basically lost 33 football fields of coral over these two years. Um, we then went back a couple years later and kind of re-estimated how much we had, and it was a total of 36% because we did see that there was some recovery going on in some of these populations. Um, we are now, we also noticed that we are down to three species out of seven which are limited to one single population, which means they are very uh, at risk of local extinction, and so these are also species that we need to get into our nursery. We've got a couple in there, and there's one more that we need to start culturing. So we did see that there is some recovery. So that's a, a fragment that is basically resheating over dead skeleton that had previously died, and it's come back. But we are also seeing other species come in and take over and recruit onto the dead skeletons. And while this is good, uh, these are fast-growing species that do not have the habitat characteristics of staghorns. And once they come in, it's unlikely that they will allow staghorns to get reestablished in these areas. So that is also of, of concern. So when we started doing this, uh, I, I liked this particular graphic. It came out um, in LAD. Uh, at all 2018, and it just shows a sort of community-based approach to rehabilitation, mitigation, restoration activities, where you're really trying to promote the development of a community, not just plant corals in some monospecific stand. So what we're trying to do is transplant corals that will survive, hopefully reproduce, and recruit a community that will develop in association with the corals. So uh, we're trying to make use of uh, positive interactions. We're trying to promote herbivory. We're, we're creating habitat for, for fish, and we are trying to create sub substrate services that promote recruitment, and by planting corals, uh, they may also uh, attract more recruits. And we are... In the per in, during our maintenance activities, we are managing the negative interactions, and we'll hear a little bit more about that. <laughs> okay, so how we did it. So we developed, we outlined three square meter, uh, three 25 square meter plots on the channel uh, wall of the Tipungan channel, which flows through PD bomb holes. And 
Once we delineated them, we did a little bit of substrate preparation. We went to our nursery and pruned a bunch of fragments from three different populations. And then we got additional corals of opportunity from the Tapungan channel itself. So these are just small fragments that are lying around that are likely to not survive if they, if they get tumbled about too much. And we stabilized them onto substrate in these plots. We used nails and cable ties, which we know the corals will eventually overgrow. And so they won't even be visible. They won't even be, they're just, just the initial anchoring. <laughs> oh, technical difficulties during talks. How lovely. OK, so we go and maintain. Um, we weren't really sure how, how often we would have to maintain. It turns out that during the warm season, uh, there's a lot of algae that comes through that uh, channel and a lot of uh, fouling debris from the river. And so we uh, visit them once or twice, well, once a week to every two weeks and just remove a lot of the debris that catches on them, which we saw was being associated with uh, tissue loss. And uh, we also remove predators and what other problematic things that might be associated with tissue loss. And we monitor. We monitor for survival. We monitor for recruitment of fish and invertebrates. And we look at um, reasons for tissue loss. And we look at changes in li live coral over time. So the live coral over time bit was principally the work of Dave Burdick who swims back and forth along each plot, taking video. He then stitches that video together to get this lovely mosaic. And then Claire comes in, and she uses image analysis to basically calculate the surface area of, that's occupied by each of those fragments. And then we can sum those together and figure out how much coral we have over time. So this is a picture of a video mosaic, and you also get a very good idea of how badly we plant corals in straight lines. <laughs> but that's why the good high-resolution camera is really useful. <laughs> OK, so preliminary results. We've had two samplings now. We've been doing this since last April, a year ago. And so we've uh, gotten video mosaics twice. And they're growing quite a bit. Now, this is a little bit of an underestimate. Those are the number of fragments that we were able to see. There was a few that we weren't able to find. And so we see that they've basically, OK, so that's a one-month picture with, 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 before we got the GoPro. You can see the resolution difference between you know, the two cameras. So the GoPros really work for this quite well. So that's one month to seven months. That's the same colony. And you can see that it's, it's almost doubled in surface area within six months. So these things really do grow quite flat, fast. And we've found that, um, the, at least for plots A and B, somewhere between 2.5 and four times the amount of surface area in six months of growth. So this is, this is pretty effective. It's, it's, uh, it's working. OK, so reasons for mortality. What, what kind of problems are we running into? Uh, there, is, there are some that don't make it. There were some that were transplanted in that just failed to thrive, if you want to use that term. Um, they, the tissue just died back, a variety of reasons. Some of it might have been fouled. Uh, we did have one of our plots that was covered significantly by sand as during Typhoon Mankot. So we had to actually adjust the position of that plot. There was a lot of sand in it. It was near the bottom of the channel, and the fragments were basically just kind of covered after this. So lessons learned, we, we, had, to, we, we had to move that plot. Um, we see that, as you can see here, Within a couple of months, the wound from any kind of uh, fragmenting that we did started to be covered up, and the coral is now growing over the nail and over the cable ties and cementing itself down and resheeting here. So uh, this is what the algae looks like. So you can see that it's, it's quite problematic in certain seasons. This was uh, taken last Friday. So we're into the summer season when there's a lot of algae. So we spend quite a bit of time cleaning right now and just making sure that the colonies themselves are free of algae. 
Uh, so that's, that's a, a big bit of effort early on. And then we had a little bit of disease, but not a lot, so it doesn't seem to be too much of a problem. The algae seems to be more of a so source of tissue loss. Okay, fish, it's really exciting. This is work by Dalia Hernandez. She just did um, her second survey, and we started seeing fish recruit very early, and they continue. And so when we look at just uh, our control plots, which are just on the side without any coral planted, we see that there's about twice as many species within our plots and uh, 15 times more individuals per meter square of fish in these plots than as compared to the existing control plots. So that was a really exciting uh, result that we're very happy to see. So they're definitely uh, a, a community developing. Now plot C is the one that was uh, disrupted by Mankut, so that one is still trying to catch up. It's somewhere in between a control plot and the ones that are, are growing quite well. Okay, invertebrates are also recruiting. Uh, the commensals that are characteristic of this species have recruited, and there's a lot of other things that have started to come into the plot, so that was really interesting. Um, in February, we saw our first coral recruit. Now, I, I realize that this is probably sort of my, my joy at this is inordinate compared to the scale at which this is actually affecting anything, but it was a very exciting thing, and we went back uh, last week, and we saw that this recruit was still surviving, so we know that there's a little bit of recruitment that's starting to happen within our plots. Okay, so the lessons that we learned, uh, it's working. It uh, does seem, pulchra seems to be a very good species to work with. We want to introduce more into this channel because we think this is a really good site for Acropora. They just do really well here. Um, fish and invertebrates have started forming uh, a, a di diverse community. Uh, it does require some uh, whiffery and some care in the beginning. So we, we think that it's worth the investment to actually take care of these things because we're just seeing much better performance and much better growth when we do the actually go through the, the process of taking care of them. Uh, we don't anticipate that that's going to have to be continued for a long time, but when they're small, we think it's important. Um, Fra mobilizing the fragments was really important. This is a lesson that we learned uh, in 20 years ago, that we know that corals have to be firmly attached. And if there's any movement, they're just going to abrade and they're not going to get established. And lesson learned from the typhoon. Uh, the rubble actually worked better as a more stable substrate than the sand. The sand was much more prone to movement and, and actually buried a lot. So we you have to be careful of that. And also, finally, um, it was a really interesting experience working with a private company who has this commitment to environmental conservation and wanted uh, a local agency to carry out this work and they wanted to use local species from our nursery. So it's been really, really good working with them. And um, the permitting process is probably the thing that's taken the longest. <laughs> and we very much... Bao, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for your help getting these things through. I know it's been kind of a painful process, but we're very glad that we've got the permit now. Okay, and that's all. I just wanted to say, whoops. Sizuz Masi to everybody that helped. Mayor Jesse Alec, who always has the gate open. Uh, fish eye that has allowed us access to our nursery through the boardwalk, which has really, really made our work a lot easier, and a bunch of students and other volunteers who have helped at various stages with this. Thank you. Uh, how you actually quantify habitat value, both existing and then future, mm. to see whether you have actually compensatory mitigated your loss. Great question. Um, I guess the way that I would do that is just we've got, we're, we're looking at what's happening in our plots. And I think that if I looked over the same square meter area, 
uh, in the adjacent site where the work was done and where the habitat was lost and looked at what was growing there, that would probably be the best way to evaluate that. Yeah, I guess I'm, I guess I'm leaning towards what efforts have been made to develop like a habitat suitability index or use under habitat, under habitat to develop habitat units of value. And then I, I imagine that that's probably in the works. I don't know of an actual reference. Um, I would probably turn that question over to Val Brown if she was here. I don't know if she's here. Um, you're here. Oh, that's right. You're sitting right. Do you want to answer that question? We actually did, I actually did scale it out and looked at growth rates and density and compared it to the area that was impacted. So we did scale it up. And but, you're, but you're looking into density and percent cover and you weren't really looking at coral health. Um, um, that was taken into account so I could make sure that they had enough density and that the growth rates were going to compensate enough to actually um, offset what was lost. So, and like she was mentioning, they were replacing a much higher value habitat function um, with the staghorns than what was lost. So the stuff that was lost was a lot of like small encrusting level pasture yeah. and um, some of the um, small pans and stuff. So um, we did put a lot of thought into that. And, um, and it was actually, <laughs> we had to go back and forth. That was part of the permitting. Because it's a novel approach, really. I mean, you know, basically, hey, why don't I just do this? But we decided to take more of that. Yeah, trail operations have been used a lot without, I don't want to say this, without thought. I mean, obviously, there's been thought. But in, you know, subjective at that point. You don't know whether you truly replace the lost habitat function at that point, or whether it just kind of feels right, done something good. I would, I guess I'm more complicated. question I had too, though, if I could. Uh, you mentioned recruitment, mm -hmm. and was there any effort to see whether do you really have recruitment, or are you simply attracting from your buyers? Uh, well, that could only be determined. I mean, the, there are certain fish that are associated with these particular corals. Um, what we're seeing so far are larger than spawn, larger than fingerlings. So yeah, they are coming in from the surrounding reef, but they seem to be residents there too. So they're associated with those particular species. I guess what are my count of that? To that then, you decline the value of the adjacent reefs by passing the line. I doubt that at this scale that's an issue, and fish reproduce, so I don't think that's really going to be an issue. Yeah, production, production versus recruitment has been an argument for 40 years mm -hmm. since I've been doing this. I, I understand the difficulties. Yeah, so they're res resident, but it gives them more habitat, and the more habitat they have, the more successful their own reproduction is likely to be. And briefly left, there's a niche now available in that as well. Yeah. Yeah. For some of the fish that you uh, observe coming into the planet area, uh, the palmer fish, are they getting into the growing algae on your algae? So far, no. There are quite a few palmacentrids, but none of the damsels. We don't have any damsels, the farming damsels, yet. We're keeping a really close lookout. Yeah. Yeah, one of, the, one of the challenges you mentioned um, uh, after you do a translocation is uh, related to the, uh, the algae growth on the reef, and that seemed to be uh, one of the challenges that we're facing. We have, uh, uh, the Navy has two translocation projects that we've undertaken, and that seems to be the biggest challenge of literally physically removing the algae on a frequent basis. Um, is there any... Um, any type of study from like a from a biological standpoint on ways to control that algae or uh, introducing uh, recruitment fish that that will actually uh, eat that algae itself without having to do that that constant maintenance until it finally becomes robust enough and the fish community uh, uh, starts to propagate that area and then make it the algae kind of uh, becomes uh, not an issue anymore after maybe a year or two years. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, you mentioned a couple of different things that are all important. Um, Tipungan 
is a channel that is influenced by a nearby river. And so there is naturally, it's kind of like an underground, it's, it's an underwater river. And so it gets, it does transport a lot of debris and these guys snag uh, debris on a regular basis. So that's probably not going to go away. But we do see that the colonies, the large thickets that are further upstream, don't have any problem with any overgrowth. So for one thing, I think there's, there's a seasonal component to algal abundance. So sometimes we kind of say, OK, it's, it's going to go away this season. So that's why we didn't remove the stuff that's there now. Um, what we have found in our nursery is that we spent quite a bit of time in the beginning with a lot of husbandry, woofery, cleaning, maintenance, and this kind of stuff, because it, it attracted a lot of algae right away. But as soon as we had a resident fish community that came in, we don't clean the nursery at all anymore. The fish take care of all of that. So because this is an MPA, um, we're, we predict that over time, uh, as, as more habitat is created by coral growth, we predict that the fish herbivory will take over. But when you get that much, see the fish can only control it when it's early in the season and they can't control it when it gets to be that huge biomass. So it's a timing thing that has to die off seasonally or we might have to take it out and then as the fish develop, as the fish community matures, they'll be able to crop it down. That's usually what I've seen happen. Okay. And just a follow-up question. Is there any, uh, I know that the UOG and the no, and NEPS are, are doing the coral, re, uh, coral uh, propagation and recruitment in nurseries. Um, what about the actual fish itself? The ones that are, that would be feeding on the, uh, the natural growth. Is there any efforts towards that front to actually uh, generate uh, fish itself and then introduce them into the environment so that maybe they could help with it? Yeah, no, not propagate fish. Um, I, we are at this point relying on natural recruitment. Yeah, we're not. I mean, it's it's interesting. You know, people have started propagating things like sea urchins and, and various other herbivores. Um, fish move a lot, so telling them to stay in one place is probably not going to be very successful. But I yeah. yeah, I don't want to fence them in. But I mean, they're naturally recruited. They they nat they like habitat, and we're planting things that they like. So we're predicting that as the coral starts taking out more space. We'll have more fish there. I mean, that's why we're monitoring. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Anna Marie Cook. She works for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Research and Development and provides scientific support for the EPA Region 9 San Francisco office. She previously held the position of Marine Debris Program Coordinator for Region 9, developing a program to embrace uh, embracing source reduction, prevention strategies, and research. The Region 9 program has expanded to become the EPA National Trash-Free Waters Program. Anna Marie, Anna Marie is EPA's subject matter expert on microplastics and is investigating the potential health of this form, the potential health impacts of this form of ocean pollution on the food chain with the Region 9 microplastics team. I too like to pace around, so uh, off comes the microphone. So thank you so much for the welcome and I'm absolutely delighted to be here today uh, in beautiful Guam and talking to a room full of people who are as concerned about the environment as I am. Um, I'm going to be talking today a little bit of a, in a different vein from some of the other talks that we've had, most of the other talks we've had um, on the technical uh, aspects of coral. I'm going to talk, talk about the emerging environmental threat that plastics, and especially microplastics, are potentially posing to coral. Um, to do that, I wanted to just start off sort of with a higher level uh, explanation of why this emerging environmental threat is of such concern to EPA. 
and uh, give a little bit of background. We heard some information this morning and um, I just wanted to kind of go over that uh, a little bit more. So it's generally acknowledged that the majority of plastic pollution entering the environment comes from post-consumer, you know, post point of sale products that escape, either uh, deliberately escape or accidentally escape the waste management system. Um, and then there's a lot of information out there that is uh, not exactly founded in good science. Um, that's mostly because the methodology to measure plastic in the environment has not yet been developed. Uh, EPA is developing some standard methodology for finding uh, microplastics in different water media, wastewater, drinking water, uh, surface water, but we are still a few months out from getting the first one rolled out with ASTM. Um, so there's actually no standard methodology yet in the international arena to measure microplastics. So therefore, a lot of the numbers, a lot of the statistics we hear are frankly uh, best guesses um, and maybe just made up in some cases. What we do know, though, is that plastic production continues to increase year after year at rather a frightening rate, actually. It is, it is going up exponentially, and our ability to deal with the waste products that result from that has not kept up. Um, we also need to acknowledge, and I think that uh, China's national sword uh, sort of new policy that came out in 2017 has really forced the world to acknowledge this, that collection does not mean recycling. Uh, we have a lot of collection facilities going on, especially in areas like the Bay Area where I'm from in San Francisco, um, where collection is really ardently pursued. Um, and some places are even privileged enough to be able to throw their recyclables um, into all, you know, all into one bin. So that means you get glass, you get aluminum, you get plastic, you get paper, all in one bin. And somehow there is some economic uh, way to have that all be separated out and sent to different areas. That is starting to become actually just a big problem for municipalities. They're starting to see that this is not uh, an economically viable way to move forward. And with China closing its doors, they also now realize that there's not really any good options for plastic recycling. And so that's just sort of made the world in general face facts a little bit more and um, by so doing start to look at solutions that really work. So the other thing that we do know is that what we sort of call macro and mesoplastic um, pollution actually does cause and has you know long documentation, many decades of documentation for causing harm to wildlife and potentially to human health. We see animals suffocating, st being strangled, um, having starvation issues from ingesting plastic. These are all physiological threats. Um, but we don't know a whole lot about the toxicological threats of much smaller pieces and also the physiological aspects of smaller pieces. So I'll get into that in a little bit. So where does all this plastic end up? Well, it generally washes into our rivers, systems from the land uh, during big storm events and out into the ocean and into the five gyres that you know make up the um, in, they are made up of a series of currents, essentially, that are in all of the world's major oceans. So there's five of those. And depending on where you live, and especially if you live in the Pacific Rim, in the North Pacific, and then the South Pacific, you do have a lot of plastic in those gyres. And if you live in Hawaii or you know any of the islands, actually, you do end up with plastic washing up from other places, not necessarily from your own land, um, but washing up into the shoreline areas. And so this is something that we have been sort of looking at to try to get a better understanding of which areas, which watersheds are contributing the most plastic um, into the into surface water bodies, and then looking at ways to try to reduce that. So let's just quickly go over sort of the size ranges of, of ocean debris. And again, here, the lack of standardization, uh, not just for methodology, but for terminology, comes into play and is a rather challenging thing to deal with when we're talking across um, sort of our scientific uh, colleagues and conferences because we use different terminology. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. In general, macro debris is the really large debris. And we can go all the way from abandoned and derelict vessels 
vessels, and I have a picture here in the upper left-hand corner of Opera Harbor with you know one of the or a few of the vessels that uh, have been abandoned and derelict there that we've been as an EPA team trying to work for a few years to try and figure out some creative ways to remove that. Uh, those are very expensive to remove, and. The reason that we're concerned at EPA about abandoned and derelict vessels is because the vessels tend to harbor uh, what we would call hazardous substances, uh, things like PCBs, mercury, lead, uh, none of which are great to have in the environment, um, and you know which they continue to leach off of these vessels. So that's you know potentially a threat to coral because a lot of times these vessels end up on the coral reefs. American Samoa has had the Seahawk sitting there for a number of years now, and again you know the damage is something that's hard to assess. The other type of macro debris, which I think most people are quite familiar with, are the sort of abandoned and derelict fishing nets and the lines that get caught on the coral reefs. And NOAA has an extensive program to pull those off the reef when they can, when they have the funding and they have the resources to be able to do that. They do routine trips, especially around the Hawaiian Islands, to remove the abandoned and derelict gear. And then we have more what I call the meso debris. Now, this is the, the tendency of plastic when it gets into the environment is it weathers due to the sunlight. Um, if it's in the ocean, it has the wave action on top of that, and it disintegrates into smaller and smaller pieces. So on the way from being a laundry basket, a plastic laundry basket, it starts to get smaller and smaller, and it becomes something that's a meso debris. Now, these are the pieces that you can generally pick up in your hands and your fingers. Um, some of these sizes are the right size for, say, birds like albatross to go and forage and pick up as potential food for their young. NOAA has a calculation that the albatross every year, the adult albatross every year, bring back 10,000 pounds of this meso debris to feed their chicks, um, which is a really staggering amount. Um, that's in addition to the amount that washes up onto the islands. Then once you have your meso debris, the fragmentation, the weathering continues to happen. It becomes smaller and it becomes smaller, and you get into the you know sort of range of what we call micro debris. Now this is where the standard terminology starts to go a little sideways because there is a standard out there that says anything less than five millimeters is a micro uh, plastic de debris size. Um, However, your methodology for being able to find and identify those pieces of plastic is actually quite substantially different when you get below the one millimeter range. You need to have a very a much more powerful and naturally much more expensive instrument to be able to get down into the lower micron range. And then you can go even smaller than that. You can get into the nanoparticle range. Um, this is our sort of new concern at the agency at EPA. We're starting to think that we might be seeing uh, micro and nanoparticles in not only um, the ocean, but also in potentially our source, source water that we use for drinking water and potentially in air. Um, this last slide that you see here over to the, the very far right here is actually pieces of plastic that are in that sort of weird uh, above one millimeter and below five millimeter range. Um, and that was picked up off the surface of the North Pacific Ocean in a trawl, which is a very typical case. Um, the one over to the left is on those, it's, it's um, again the same size range, uh, but washed up into tide pools in Camillo Point on the Big Island of Hawaii, which, which gets just inundated with uh, plastic as it washes around in the, that North Pacific uh, gyre. So here's the sort of major concern with microplastics because not only do they break up into these smaller and smaller and smaller particles, but they have this uh, interesting reaction in the water. They are essentially a piece of solid oil and they serve to attract contaminants that in, are in all of our water bodies. So if you take a sample pretty much of any water body anywhere in the world and you analyze it with very, very, very low detection limits, you will find things such as poly uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, which were used, it's a legacy contaminant, and it was used uh, in previous decades as a lubricant for transformers and electrical equipment. Um, you will find things like flame retardants, you'll find pesticides, you will find metals in trace, trace quantities in all of the surface water bodies around the world.
And those contaminants are very often hydrophobic, meaning they don't like to be in the water column. They try to find some sort of fat, some sort of a lipid to attach to, to stick to, to get out of the water. And plastic particles are the perfect landing spot. So what we found in our sampling in the North Pacific, and this has been uh, corroborated and, and actually done way before we did it by many other researchers, is that the contaminants that are in the water body adhere to, sorb onto those plastic particles and concentrate there at concentrations that are way, way higher than we see in the surface water. So we can find pesticides up to a thousand times higher concentration than we will see in the surface water. We can find the PCBs, the polychlorinated biphenyls, at levels that are up to a million times higher. So then the next sort of iteration as you think about this is, okay, if you have these little tiny particles in the water, and we know the birds like to eat those pieces of plastic. And then as they get small and small and fragment down, perhaps the fish like to eat them too. And indeed, that is what we're seeing. We're seeing that as the particles become smaller, the fish eat the particles as well, mistaking them for prey. And then our question at EPA is if those fish are eating those particles that are loaded with those contaminants, do those contaminants desorb in the stomach, in the digestive tract with the digestive juices, and get reabsorbed into the fatty tissue of the fish? And if that is the case, are we going to see a bioaccumulation effect up the food chain and potentially all the way up to humans when we eat those fish? So this is sort of just a little graphic to show, really, it can start at the zooplankton level. We actually have evidence that zooplankton do eat microplastic. Um, and it continues up into ever higher levels of um, the food chain. And it, it actually becomes a biomagnified effect because at certain levels of the food chain, not only are the fish eating the plastic, but they're eating the fish their prey that is also eaten plastic, so it becomes sort of this double dose. And we did some field studies in both the uh, North Pacific and the South Atlantic on lanternfish, we call it lanternfish. Um, mostly it was uh, sort of a fishing expedition of uh, opportunity, but also we wanted to look at lanternfish because they comprise the largest species of all fish, about 20% of all fish species, and they're found in every single ocean. They're really you know, low on the basis of of the, of the food web. And we figured if we could find evidence that those level of fish were eating plastic, then, then we could be pretty sure that every level up from that was going to be exposed to plastic. So we analyzed the tissue. We first dissected out the stomachs, which are tiny, tiny stomachs in lanternfish. They're about the size of angel hair pasta, and they're black, just to make things a little more difficult. So um, we, we dissected those out. Then we ground up the rest of the fish, and we looked at their tissue and every single one of the fish across with two different species in the North Pacific and then one, um, actually I think two other species of lanternfish in the South Atlantic. Across every single uh, specimen that we looked at, we found PCBs in every single one, which wasn't too surprising. We, couldn't, we sort of expected that. Um, we also found trace quantities of pesticides in all of them. But what really was surprising to us was that we found plasticizers of some sort in every single one of our fish. So that was something like uh, alkaphenols or flame retardants or BPA. Um, this, was, this was shocking. Um, what it meant was that the fish had either been exposed to plastic through the water column or through ingesting pieces of plastic. We couldn't you know, tell for sure which one. Um, so our next step, once we had secured funding, which was no easy task, um, was to go back and look at the stomachs. So we opened the stomachs up, and we had to use spectroscopy for your transform infrared spectroscopy in Raman, which is um, basically a sort of a uh, it gives you a, a signature using um, either absorptive or reflective rays, um, a definitive signature on particles so that you can tell what they are. And we use this for things like in our environmental response work for identifying anthrax versus baking powder. You know, we need to know for sure what the white substance is. But in this particular case, we wanted to know was this plastic or was it not? Was it a shell? Was it a part of a critter? Um, you know, yes or no. 
Um, and so using the, the spectroscopy, we were able to definitively find plastic particles in the stomachs of these little tiny lanternfish. And I just threw one up here just to show you what we found. So this was in our South Atlantic fish. Um, this was a fiber, it was polypropylene fiber. It's about 200 micron six, so just for perspective, everyone's hair is somewhere between 60 and 100 micron six, so this is like double the thickness of one of your strands of hair. Um, and it was 13 millimeters long, it was, it was pretty long for, for a fiber. But it had filled the entire stomach of the fish, and that was all that was there. So we don't know if that was what killed him or whether actually being fished out of the ocean was what killed him. But um, anyway, regardless, this is what we found in the stomach. And we used um, a, a stereo zoom, which is 3D sort of microscope, to be able to see the fiber. And then what I find fascinating is this on the lower right here. That's a scanning electron microscope, which is pumps it up 2,000 times magnification. And you can see these fissures on this little piece of, of fiber, of plastic fiber. And those fissures are what causes the plastic to continue to fragment. So those are weathering fissures. And actually, we found that particular type of characteristic on every single piece of plastic that we looked at under a scanning electron microscope. Everything that's out in the ocean looks like that. All the weathered plastic that we collected had that definitive characteristic. So it just keeps going into smaller and smaller and smaller particles. And this is what starts to make us also wonder, you know, what is the impact on the coral? Because we have marine snow, those are probably most of you here are scuba divers, and you know what marine snow looks like. So you can imagine just sort of thinking, which is how I unfortunately think these days all the time, I look at marine snow and I say, how much of that, those particulate matters are actually microplastic and nanoplastic. Well, I wouldn't be able to see nano, but you know, micro. And then how much is the coral being subjected to that? How much is it mistaking that for the food particles? And we had those lovely school children yesterday doing that wonderfully sort of demonstrative uh, exhibit of throwing food particles at the coral. So you can kind of see, you know, how all these plastic particles out there, you know, some of them are going to land in with the coral. Now, all of you know this, I'm absolutely sure. I um, know not nearly as much about coral, very little about coral, um, compared to what I do about microplastics. But it, there's still, you know, an incredibly, incredibly valuable resource around the world. And we've done a lot of work in uh, the French frigate shoals, which have a beautiful coral reef system. And so, you know, the, the impacts of microplastic on these beautiful systems is something that is definitely of concern for EPA. So, you know, we know that there are many different stressors on coral with the warming and the acidification, um, but pollution from land-based sources is absolutely certainly nothing to help coral. And the impacts of plastic pollution, and especially that of very small particles, might be quite severe. We know just sort of anecdotally from studies that we've done um, and other people have done that the spiky coral species are more likely to snag the uh, mesoplastic range and probably the macro too. Um, and then we know just sort of the basics that it depri the plastic deprives the, the coral of oxygen and light and that it can transport these, especially these small little pieces that we know can harbor all sorts of types of contaminants, um, pathogens and also uh, uh, toxic contaminants into the coral. So. Um, We've done a few studies at EPA that show the coral do indeed ingest plastic. And I wanted to talk about one of our case studies that we have um, in Turn Island. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Turn Island, have heard of it or, I, okay, cool. That's actually larger than I expected. Um, so Turn Island, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is um, in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. It's part of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And it is um, sort of halfway between Honolulu and Midway. So Midway is the one up to, you know, closest to Japan. And then we have the main Hawaiian Islands with Honolulu. So about halfway through there is French Frigate Shoals. And within French Frigate Shoals, 
There's this little tiny island, Turn Island. So Turn started its life as a six acre coral atoll. And then in the lead up to World War II, the Navy decided that they needed a refueling station to get their planes from Honolulu to Midway. And so they made a double seawall around Turn Island and they dredged the uh, coral in front to bring their ships in and then they put that coral into Turn Island to make essentially a 33 acre uh, landing strip for their planes. And they stayed there for a few years during World War II. And then after they left, um, they turned it over to a variety of federal agencies to use for various purposes. And then in 1956, they turned it over officially to the US Coast Guard to use as a long range aid to navigation. And so the Coast Guard stayed there until 1979. Then in 1979, they decided to close up shop there. Um, they didn't want to, to suffer the expense of bringing back all of their equipment to Honolulu, so they buried it on the island. So they buried transformers, they buried batteries, and closed up shop. Fish and Wildlife Service took it over as a refuge in 79 and can still continue to this day to have it as a refuge. Um, it is home to the largest, it, well, the French frigate shoals is home to the largest pupping population of the most endangered marine mammal that the US has, which is the Hawaiian monk seal. It's home to 18 of the 22 Hawaiian bird species, about 500,000 birds nest on Turn Island. And it, the French frigate shoals themselves, including Turn Island, are home to 95% of the uh, green sea turtles that nest there. So it's incredibly critical and um, valuable habitat. It is also inundated with plastics from the North Pacific. And this picture that you see here in the middle there is an actual picture of the plastics on the ground. This is just what you can see. So keep in mind that, of course, these degrade into smaller and smaller particles, and you probably have a greater, much, much greater number of particles that you can't see. There's a penny in the lower right-hand corner there, just to give you a sense of scale. But this is what is on the island. So now we have an interesting situation. Um, we have buried contamination, which is actually ever increasingly daylighting due to the high activities, the storm activities, and the you know, the weathering of the seawall. Um, so the, the contaminants are increasingly daylighting and we have you know, sort of an increasing inundation of, of plastics onto the island. And in 2000, the Coast Guard came back and they did try to remove the contamination that they'd left there in 1979. Um, they spent twice what they had budgeted for the removal and removed half of what they were planning to do and then said, that's it, we're done. So the half of it is still remaining there. And at the same time, there were a few researchers, a couple of researchers that went in and decided to do some sampling for PCBs around the island. And they sampled the seawater. They sampled the coral, they sampled moray eel, and then also we got Hawaiian monk seal um, data from uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And you can see, it's sort of fascinating, if you look at the sea, wall, uh, the sea water, and you look at the polychlorinated biphenyl concentrations there, they are incredibly low. So it's 0.005 or 4 or 5 parts per billion. So infinitesimal concentrations. But notice, when you, when you look for the same contaminant in coral, how much it jumps up. It jumps up 10,000 times. And so that for us was kind of like, what, what is going on here? Then you look at the moray eel, and it jumps up another 1,000 times. So now we have the moray eel with concentrations of PCBs that are 10 million times higher than what we're seeing in the seawater. And it's just, it's just confounding to us. It's been confounding to our project managers for a number of years, looking at these islands like Midway and Turn, you know, very, very low concentrations in seawater, but sky high in fatty animals. And then if you go and look at the Hawaiian monk seal, it does drop by, you know, 10 times, but it's still very high. And so our theory that we work from is that we, we do believe that the microplastics that are endemic in the islands there are actually carrying the PCBs into the food chain um, along with the prey that the higher level predators eat and that this is starting to reside in their blood and blubber and magnifies through the food uh, chain this way. So 
we have been going out to turn, we went out last summer to do an assessment of the island. I have to say sort of the startling takeaway from that for us was that even after 40 years of having buried contamination there, there we still found the PCBs and some of the other contaminants at levels that were significant. Um, we're looking at doing some follow-on work, removing that potentially next year if we can do it. Um, it is an area where we have a huge amount of corals, we have a huge amount of you know, amazing sea life. There's 7,000 different marine species in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, 2,000s of, of which are endemic to that area and can be found nowhere else. The coral is highly valuable. And so what, you know, what lessons can we learn here for the microplastics and their um, transport of contaminants that are everywhere in the environment through aerial deposition, through stormwater runoff, um, into the food chain, into the corals. Um, I know this may not be the, sort of the most pressing stressor that is um, facing the corals or facing our wildlife, but it is certainly an additional one that we perhaps have the power to change, um, maybe not immediately, but in the very near future. So about half of what we use in terms of plastic um, can probably be dispensed with and not used ever again um, starting tomorrow. The other half of plastic uh, products are incredibly useful and I, you know, we couldn't perhaps imagine our lives without them. So then for those kinds of products, we need to figure out a better end point, end of life for them. Um, I wanted to say that you know, individual actions make a difference and lead to group and uh, mass changes. And I just, and Walter's not here right now, but um, he actually talked to the, the administrator of Guam EPA, talked to the Hyatt uh, here um, just under a year ago. And he said, you know, why do you use plastic straws? You know, this is something that you don't need to do. And if you've noticed, at least I noticed yesterday when I went out to the pool bar there, um, they are using uh, uh, paper straws now. And they, they're highly effective. I mean, for the amount of time, if you need a straw, for the amount of time you use one, they're not going to dissolve or do anything like that. So that is a, a, an idea of a source reduction and a product change that's easy to implement almost instantaneously. And my hope is that because the Hyatt is doing it and it's a beautiful hotel, that the other hotels will want to follow suit. So the individual action of one can influence the actions of many. And that's just one, one little area. You know, I did notice that they served all their drinks in plastic cups. So next step. How about we change that either to you know cups that we can reuse or you know paper cups? So something that you know just you can build and build and build, and it's not the only answer. There's not one solution, but there are many solutions that are very sort of specific to the area and the region that's involved that can be brought to bear to reduce this problem. So that at least one of the stressors that we have on our beautiful coral can at least be reduced, hopefully over the next decade. So with that, I will just say thank you. This is from a sunset on the journey back from Turn Island. So um, one of my favorite sort of memories and pictures. But with that, I will end my talk and take any questions. Yeah, so the question was, in terms of bird mortality on Turn Island and Midway and other islands, do we have any data on, on that, on the mortality? And there is quite a lot of data on that. Um, Midway Island um, is actually just littered with, uh, you know, the chick carcasses. Um, from the parents feeding the birds uh, the plastic. So wherever you go, you will see that. And whenever they start to disintegrate and decay, the um, stomachs are just filled with big gliders, with bottle caps. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. On Turn Island, what we saw was um, 
our, I was, I went on, there was two trips last summer. We went once in July and once in August. So de July, we deployed a bunch of sampling equipment. August, we went to pick it up and I was on the August trip. And when I went there in August, a lot of the birds had fledged at that point. And when a bird fledges, it generally um, bolluses, meaning it throws up uh, what's in its stomach. And what we saw, the bolluses that were left behind, without exception, every one of them had some forms of plastic. Generally, it was fishing line, but embedded in that were other types of plastic. So those birds, I would say, were probably the survivors, because there we were seeing, um, you know, the bird wasn't uh, with its bolus, um, although we did see carcasses as well. But um, so th there's definitely a, um, a mortality issue, and who knows sort of what the non-lethal effect could be as well. I think, you know, there's lots of people who study the bird issue. So, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so if you look at your region 9, um, are there any efforts that still need to be made to sort of make the region 9 more sustainable? Um, So the question is, is there any grant programs in EPA Region 9 to help clean up the ocean and for the islands that are, are hit by all of this um, debris? And I would say that there aren't any programs to help clean up in the ocean. And I think that the focus of cleaning up in the ocean is something that is a very challenging thing to look at and to implement, if not impossible. Um, the, the pieces are so, so, so small. If you think about trying to clean up marine snow, it's very, very, very challenging. So the grant programs that EPA does tend to give are associated more with the upland portion of it, where the problem starts, with source reduction and with prevention activities. So we have our um, stormwater programs where we ask for best management practices to be put in place to reduce the loading of trash into stormwater. So that's an area where we potentially could uh, sort of garner some sort of a grant program. We also have uh, just along the lines of doing the zero waste, which you know is a big part of this conference. And EPA is very, very embedded with the zero waste idea and the, the sort of proliferation of that. Those kinds of grants, I think, are available. So I would say if you really want to make the difference and you really want to implement some sort of a program, then you need to go upstream and stop it more at the source. Um, and on the back end, it's a very sad thing to acknowledge, but I do think that on the back end, it's just understanding the exposure, understanding the problems informs people upstream to do a better job, but I think cleaning it up on the back end down, once, you know, once it's got into the ocean, I, I don't see how that can be done. I'm an engineer and I love to see, you know, things being created to solve problems like that, and I, I can't come up with a way to do it. Yeah, I think in, yeah, doing, doing it um, sort of on a local basis, um, in your bay, in your river, um, putting in booms. Um, Bill Robertson gave a talk yesterday about booming rivers. That kind of thing actually makes a huge difference because every time you catch a piece of the macro or the meso debris, it then doesn't become the micro. So those kinds of upstream changes are very, very, very helpful. Okay, yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's a popular um, way to kind of emphasize a point, perhaps, but there is no island really per se. What it is is that, yeah, the, the particles are caught in this ever, you know, 
forever going on cycle of currents. And as they wash up onto the beach, you know, they are in smaller particle sizes, sometimes with big pieces of debris, just depends on the winds and, you know, sort of what the inputs have been from different nations around the Pacific Rim over the last, you know, year or so. Um, so that washes up and then it washes back out again and it goes around again and comes back in again. But there's no, if you sail across the Pacific, there is no place that you will like go, oh, this is it, I've, I've found the garbage patch. Um, you can find um, typically what would happen and maybe how it sort of became an, uh, an idea that it was an island is that there were maybe some ghost nets, you know, some abandoned fishing nets that had caught a lot of other things with it. Like Charles Moore has shown, <laughs> he, he actually, do you know who he is? He's the one that first sort of came up with the garbage patch idea. So he actually showed a video of him planting his flag of, of independence on his island. Um, and he's, he's amazing. Um, and it was just basically a major, major fishing net that had caught all this other debris in it. And so that, that really did look like an island. I and mean, he knows you know, that that was only part of the problem, but he was just you know, sort of making his point. Um, so by far, I think the greater quantity is in the smaller, smaller, smaller science range throughout the water column and on the seafloor. Because no matter how buoyant the plastic starts out, it is going to biofile very, very quickly, and it's going to sink until it hits the floor. And it may get resuspended at wave action, but it's going to stay there. Yeah. So I had read something, you know, someone out in California who developed a kind of like vacuum to suck up uh, surface plastic, um, but it seemed like it could have a really negative impact on like the Newston community at the top of the water column. Is that I haven't I haven't heard of that one. I've heard of sort of various types of skimming devices and things like that. And I, I absolutely agree. I think the collateral damage is probably just I you wouldn't even want to necessarily get started on that. I mean the sea surface layer, which is that extremely thin layer, is so important. And I, I imagine that would be incredibly disrupted by some kind of technology like that. So yeah, I I've looked at this for 10 years and tried to, you know, I've come all the way starting with let's clean it up to, because that's, you know, part of the Superfund program. It's a cleanup program. So let's clean this problem up all the way back to, no, we've just got to prevent it from happening. So that's really where we are now. Oh. Oh, sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so we we work obviously very closely with Coast Guard and Navy and Army Corps, and um, you know we have one of our former EPA people who ran the Oceana Regional Response Teams for a number of years, just sitting next to you there, Bill Robertson. Um, we we definitely are, especially in Region Nine, with all of our you know the the, the islands and the territories and the amazingly uh, sort of difficult task of dealing with ADV, abandoned derelict vessels. Um, we are very interested in that and we try to be extremely creative in terms of working with other agencies to leverage their resources where we can to help out. Um, I'll give you an example. In um, Oakland, in the Bay Area, we had a, uh, a partnership with Cal Recycle and with um, Coast Guard to remove about 70 derelict vessels in the Oakland Inner Harbor and estuary. So we pulled those all out. Um, there's you know, some sensitive habitat there that they were very interested in protecting and trying to get the ADV out from. So that was a very successful endeavor. Um, there's been, there was, actually I don't think EPA, Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think EPA was necessarily part of this, although we supported it. It was mostly a, a Coast Guard effort to remove the longliners in American Samoa after the tsunami in 2009. Well, 
we, and we, we've been trying to work with the Guam EPA for Opera Harbor because um, NOAA has the um, sort of map of all the abandoned derelict vessels and Guam EPA has prioritized which ones, you know, they, they would really like to get out. So we've, we have been trying to work with them. Um, one of our colleagues who's on our plastics team, Harry Allen, has been out here a couple times to try to assist with that effort. Um, the expense and the sort of logistics difficulties are, are not insubstantial. But it is something that we are very interested in trying to keep moving forward and do more on. Anything else? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Vaid Sharayath back to Guam. Um, he directs the Laboratory for Advanced Sen Sensing in Earth Science Division at NASA Ames Silicon Valley. His research is directed at inventing next generation advanced sensing technologies for NASA's Earth Science program to better understand the natural world around us, extending our capabilities for studying life in extreme environments on Earth, and searching for life elsewhere in the universe. Which is very fancy. <laughs> He leads a multidisciplinary team developing new instrumentation for airborne and spaceborne remote sensing, validates instrumentation through scientific field campaigns around the world, and develops machine learning algorithms to process big data on NASA's supercomputing facility. He invented the fluid lensing algorithm and is PI of the NASA Flu fluid cam instrument. He is also the inventor inventor of the MIDAR system for active multispectral remote sensing and PI of the MIDAR instrument, which we'll hear more about during this talk. Um, and he was also a speaker at last year's fourth Guam Coral Reef Symposium. So. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's my co I cheering in the back, uh, Romina King, who wrote to me into coming to Guam not once, not twice, but three times in a very short period of time. So it's lovely to be back here. Um, thank you for having me again. I will just preface this by saying I'm an, an astrophysicist that got pulled over to the blue side. So you'll forgive me if I don't know um, that much about coral. I'm still learning. But I wanted to share three different uh, technologies that I'm developing at NASA. And if you'd like to collaborate afterwards, please approach me. I've got some flyers about some of our materials. I would be happy to, to look at how we could work together. Uh, if you look very closely in the background, there's actually Romina's husband's feet um, <laughs> helping us test this instrument in Tumon. This is from a, um, a March campaign. But I'll start with talking about fluid cam. This is a passive uh, imaging system that looks at coral reefs primarily because they're in shallow marine systems and they're easy to image as they don't move generally. Uh, the second system is MIDAR. This just got its patent uh, middle of last year and is a new invention that uses active multispectral illumination instead of the sun to illuminate things in the water and on land. And then the third technology is actually a neural network. Uh, this is something we run at our supercomputer at NASA Ames. Uh, this is a, in the Bay Area. And we're trying to process data sets from fluid cam and MITRE, which can be very large on the order of a few hundred to thousands of terabytes per island. So as we generate these large data sets, we're getting a lot of new insights into coral, new, new data sets, but we need a tools to auto automatically process them, which can be very tedious. So I'll just remind everyone, um, this is the state of affairs in 2019. We have mapped more of the surface of Mars and the moon in optical frequencies at a resolution of 10 meters or finer than we have of our own ocean floor. Uh, as of this year, we're at about 5% of the ocean floor mapped, which is, is just startling to me. This is why I moved over from astrophysics uh, into uh, Earth science, because there's just a huge knowledge gap. We, we do not have data about um, a system that our lives depend upon. So if you look back at Earth's history, um, this is a, from a campaign in Australia. These are stromatolites. I don't know if you're familiar with these, but you're all related to them. They oxygenated our planet. They were actually, um, if you look at NASA's search for life in the universe, they are one of our primary targets because they terraformed our planet. They took it from 0% free oxygen to around 20% today. So if you look at pre-Cambrian oxygen production, for about 3 billion years, these organisms um, changed that oxygen content from 0%. They killed off a whole bunch of species in the process, so there's just oxygen-loving species. Um, but they really created the planet we have today. T um, right now, 
the global modern oxygen production is still dominated by the ocean, still more than 70 percent comes from the sea. So this is just one reason why you know, we should all care and particularly why NASA cares about earth science and studying the ocean is that we know <laughs> this is our astronaut support system and there's, there's not really a second option. Uh, we've looked and found thousands and thousands of planets in our solar system and, sorry, not in our solar system, beyond our solar system, but nothing that looks like Earth. Um, so just keep that in mind, you know, the next time you buy something that's got plastic in it or, or anything else, you know, you're, you're on a spaceship, it may seem big, but it's very small. Um, all right, the other reason why I like the ocean so much is if you're looking for life, uh, on our planet in particular, you would start in the ocean. 99% of the habitable volume is there. So everything that you uh, have experienced thus far in your life is just 1% really of the bigger picture. And that's why I think it's so important to study systems. The final reason is that they are changing uh, at a rate that we've really not seen um, on any naturally occurring time scale. The last time we had change of this event, um, there were large extinction events, and it still happens slower than what we're seeing with human-caused um, anthropogenic climate change. So corals in particular are undergoing um, heat stress. They're, um, ocean acidification due to CO2 being absorbed by the ocean. Most of the CO2, roughly 80% of atmospheric CO2, gets directly absorbed into the ocean, um, which is something that coming into this field I didn't fully appreciate until I understood some basic chemistry and realized this is, this is a problem. Um, if you change the acidity of something, you can make coral skeletons dissolve and entire life system that has evolved for a long time disintegrates. Studying these systems though from space and from the air is very hard. Um, there's two main challenges. The first is just, uh, from a physics point of view, not much light gets down into the bottom of the sea. Um, there's a narrow band of frequencies of light, that's at the top left, in which light penetrates the atmosphere. The radio band there we actually use in radio astronomy a lot to study things very far away, and that's a very fortunate band. Um, unfortunately, once you hit water, all of the radio frequencies are absorbed, thermal frequencies are absorbed, you're just left with the frequencies on the top right, roughly from 380 nanometers to 720 nanometers. Uh, this is visible light in UV that penetrates it all. And then as you get deeper in the water, just nothing really gets through. So at the bottom you can see what traditional attenuation with depth looks like, and this is coming from absorption as well as scattering and uh, dispersion. The second challenge, and this is something that I studied as part of my doctorate for a long time, because I assumed this was solved, but it, it is not, um, refraction. You learn about this in high school. You have two different fluids, let's say air and water. There's a refractive index jump. Light travels at different speeds in these media. And the result is if you have a, a moving surface, like um, this ocean water, in this case this is in an aquarium, and you just introduce some waves, you get significant distortions in light rays that penetrate um, through the water. So you can imagine if you take this now to the real ocean where there's much larger waves, that distortion can get very large. In fact, it's the limiting factor in resolution when you image something underwater from space or from an aircraft. So a lot of our systems on the very far right hand side Landsat has a resolution of about 10 to 30 meters. It's just starting to see the ocean distortion. Uh, when you image using commercial satellites that have a resolution of about half a meter to five meters, it completely distorts what you see and really um, the image quality depends upon the sea state conditions. So this is something that if you're studying coral reefs is a big problem because corals grow at roughly a centimeter per year. So you have no way to detect whether they're growing, they're dying. In fact, it's very hard to even repeat image a coral because satellites view the coral from different angles and that causes um, a movement of what the satellite sees, whereas on land they appear stationary. The other reason uh, why you want to image at very fine scales is that we're not assessing these systems accurately. So if you just look at coral cover, um, there's a piece of coral there in the left. And on the right hand side you can see the identification of the living structure, what is coral, what is not coral. Right now uh, most of our satellites, global satellites, at the 10 to 30 meter resolution, they're imaging percent cover with an error of 40%. Um, coming from physics and astrophysics where you needed five sigma significance to publish an article, um, this was very surprising that you can get by with one sigma significance. Uh, this is 40% is well below one sigma significance. Uh, this is just shocking to me that we think that this is acceptable to understand the near ocean system. To get to one sigma significance, that's 95% confidence, or 4%, 5% error, you need to image these systems at a centimeter, which is very, very fine scales, but 
Some argue, a lot of choral biologists argue, you still need to go further, you need to go down to the micron level to detect things that are more important. Um, I would like to get down to that regime sometime in my lifetime, globally, so we understand how uh, the ocean drives our climate. All right, so to address the challenges of attenuation and refraction, I started studying something called the fluid lensing phenomenon. NASA headquarters made a nice animation, so I don't have to explain this quite so much. But um, when waves move around, they cause refraction. There's a lot of weird phenomena that they, they introduce into a system. So the first is you'll see magnification and demagnification as waves pass over an object. This on the supercomputer at NASA Ames. And here you can see a test pool getting deeper and deeper and a number of test targets, as well as coral targets, and a 3D coral on the right. And you'll notice this magnification and demagnification as waves pass over, and you also see the formation of these bright bands of light, which are called caustics. They're very interesting caustics. Uh, you can see them out in Tumon, if you just look out from the hotel balcony. They can concentrate sunlight to 100 times that of the intensity at the sea surface, which is very interesting. That's one of the things we learned from this simulation. So with fluid lensing, I wanted to look at that phenomena really closely, the magnification and demagnification, as well as the caustics, and actually exploit them. In astrophysics, we use something called gravitational lensing to see galaxies behind galaxies very, very far away. We use them as free telescope lenses to focus sunlight, uh, to focus starlight in that case. Here, I wanted to use waves uh, that magnify the object to see deeper in the water column, to be able to get a higher spatial resolution than the sensor could provide. And then I also wanted to track those bright bands of light, caustics, to um, light up the deeper benthic environment. So I came up with an instrument called FluidCam. Uh, it's built into a CubeSat form factor. This is NASA's sort of microsatellite uh, configuration, and it's much, much cheaper for us to keep flying these in orbit than it is things like Landsat that cost about a billion and a half dollars to fly. And right now we've been flying them on, on drones or unmanned aerial vehicles. And essentially what the instrument does is it takes very high frame rate multispectral imagery. Um, the top middle frame you can see what a coral looks like under typical ocean conditions. And it solves the fluid lensing equations to create the image in the top right, which shows a corrected geometry of the target. And then the final step it does is it tracks those caustics to recreate um, a picture of the benthic environment that's much higher in signal to noise ratio and contrast than you would get even in a flat fluid case if you look at the bottom left. So we start off with um, the middle picture at the top and we end up at the bottom right. And that gives us a very accurate picture of what the system looks like. This is refraction corrected, we're exploiting positive magnification events, and we're exploiting caustics. So we fly this on multi-rotor aircraft. Um, I was just here about a month ago flying this just in Tumon and in PD. Um, this was actually from Puerto Rico, the imagery you're looking at. And here's a, a flight from American Samoa in Ofu Island. So the aircraft flies around the reef in a, a lawnmower pattern. And in a moment you'll see what the imagery looks like from the sensor. So you've got reflection also on top of refraction and uh, caustic distortion. And then the next scene shows you the 3D mosaic from fluid lensing. So this would be multiple fluid lensing scenes that are computed uh, for each area and then stitched together to create a three-dimensional map of that benthic environment. Uh, this particular one was validated to about half a centimeter resolution. So you can see there's a sea cucumber at the top right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Romina. <laughs> um, so there is a sea cucumber up there. Essentially, it gives you a diver's perspective of that environment, and it doesn't take as much time. We can, you know, it still takes a little while. Uh, we can cover Tumon in about a day and a half or so, um, but we're trying to image things at the centimeter scale. You can see uh, what it, how it compares to the state of the art on the left. So this would be a, a commercial satellite sensor operating at 30 centimeter resolution on the left. Um, the second to left is the fluid lensing result for that same region. And you can see in the detail there's a number of different uh, very fine scale features you can see. Typically fish do not get resolved by the system because they move with respect to the waves. Sometimes they do, if they're stationary like the parrot fish at the top, it gets resolved. Sea cucumbers are everywhere because they just sit there. Um, a shark did emerge. And the other thing it gives you is this bathymetry map, which we've been using to study uh, flow, hydrodynamic flow over reef structures, which is actually really interesting to understand how they adapt to a high heat environment and also how pollutants flow around a region. Um, this is key to understanding how to protect reefs if you're, for example, putting in a sewer uh, pipeline like they did in Hawaii right next to a coral reef. <laughs> 
So FluidCam gets you to that level in the ocean, the first uh, 30 meters, but the average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters, so there's a long way to go to fill in this gap in the habitable volume of our planet. And that was really the motivation behind MIDAR. Um, this is the multispectral imaging detection and active reflectance instrument. Um, actually, the acronym my husband coined, who's standing back there. So thank you for that. Um, the idea from MIDAR came straight out of Star Trek, if you're familiar with <laughs> active sensors. So a lot of technologies you're using now, iPads, etc. Um, it's very easy being a technologist at NASA because I just have to invent what's, what's dreamed up by science fiction authors. So MIDAR is one of those. Um, it uses an active transmitter um, to illuminate an object with structured optical radiation. So this is light that has a very specific mathematical pattern to it and I can vary the intensities, the polarization states and the frequency of light that is hitting an object. The object reflects that light and is measured by a passive receiver. Now the receiver can be pretty stupid. Um, it can be actually your iPhone or it can be, um, we actually use FluidCam because it operates a little bit faster than your iPhone and it creates a multispectral picture. So there's really three main innovations behind MIDAR. The first is in the source. Um, humans are very good at <laughs> generating artificial things. Um, one of those is light sources. Creating narrow band light is very difficult. You don't see it often in the natural world. The sun, for example, produces broadband lights or produces light across the electromagnetic spectrum. Producing light within a very specific frequency window requires the development of laser diodes and light emitting diodes. So uh, most of these light emitting diode chemistries that we identified were individual Nobel Prizes to other people that did a lot of work on these. So we're, we're really inheriting all of their expertise. And really the way that MIDAR works is it illuminates um, a certain band of light at a very high intensity, much higher than the sun can provide. So for example, in the ultraviolet, there are UV um, LED diodes that can operate at optical efficiencies of about 20%, which means that for every 100 watts of power, electrical power we put in, we get 20 watts of light. That allows us to really just blast the target with photons, which is very difficult to do when you're using the sun that doesn't you know, obey your commands. Um, the second innovation is in how we illuminate the target with light. So this is called structured optical illumination and essentially if you look at um, the power of the MITRE transmitter over time, it will follow a certain mathematical sequence. Now the camera itself is black and white, it does not have any perception of color, um, it just sees this changing intensity of light. But it can measure those intensities, um, the grayscale intensities and discover that, okay, it's got a certain pattern. Red, um, we can correspond to 3142, this first burst, then we can match the next code to green, and we can actually then colorize all of these grayscale intensity peaks with a certain band, and that gives us color. So at the bottom you can see what um, the camera sees after it's been color identified. The third innovation is really also in that same pattern. Um, in addition to illuminating a target with this code, we are able to pull out um, multiple versions of each color. So for example, for red, we have two different uh, intensity structures that correspond to red, which means that we can tell the receiver a bit of information for every pulse we give. So you multiply this a few million times per second, you can transmit quite a bit of data on top of the signal. Um, and that can tell the camera calibration profiles, how far away the transmitter is, properties of the transmitter, and now the transmitter and receiver can send a message that encodes binary or hexadecimal data. So this is what um, one of our prototypes looks like that was just flying in Tumon about a month ago. There's the MITRE transmitter on the left and the receiver is on the right. This receiver is actually a commercial camera. Here you can see um, what the structure looks like when it's pulsing. This has slowed down a lot from where we actually, we, we image, <laughs> when we're operationally imaging, um, we're imaging about a thousand to a million times faster. So the, you don't see the individual colors of lights, you just see one white pulse and then the receiver can decode all that information. So that's what it looks like in flight at nighttime. Here you can see the individual frequency bands that it's illuminating. And this is what the receiver sees. So if you have a transmission on the left that's slowed down a little bit, um, the receiver again sees this black and white image. It doesn't know a priori what these bands correspond to, but it can figure out with its library of codes 
um, which pulse corresponds to near infrared, for example, or visible light or UV light, and then we can create a multispectral picture. What's exciting about this is that we can, because we're controlling the light source, do this at very, very fast timescales. So the sun is limited to about 1,300 watts per square meter. We have no such restriction on our light source, so we can image this thing at a, at a picosecond, and we can do high speed spectral video, things that we really haven't been able to do thus far. So if you're a coral biologist in particular and there's something that happens on fast time scales that you'd like to observe, uh, please come talk to me because I'd like to image it. <laughs> um, here are some results with MITAR. So this is a seven channel version in our lab. Um, the other thing that MITAR can do is because we're transmitting an active source, we can measure what the ambient contribution is and remove it. So in this case, um, this target was actually lit halfway with a flashlight, a broadband source, um, and you don't see that in the MITAR picture because we have a completely different structured um, illumination source. It also allows us to go into frequency bands that the sun does not uh, illuminate with. So since we fixed mostly the hole in the ozone layer, we don't have much UV frequencies penetrating anymore. Um, and UV contains a lot of information, particularly in marine systems that have UV pigments about the health of an object. For corals, it can be used for identification. So we're looking at pushing into frequencies that we don't traditionally think of for remote sensing, but they actually have a lot of applications if you, if you have the source with you. So right now we've actually gone down here, I think only to 365 nanometers, but we have instruments that are going down to 260 nanometers, and that can tell you uh, mineral types as well as things about coral. Uh, this is what a coral looks like. This is with an airborne uh, MIDAR system and an underwater receiver. So this is actually transmitting through the surface and then illuminating a Parietes coral uh, just here again in Tumon. And when we did that experiment, we also sent um, data through. So here in this case, we have an airborne uh, transmitter with an underwater receiver and we're creating these images on the left and also transmitting the data package on the bottom right. So this should excite you, particularly if you work in the Navy, because this is communications through the air-water interface without having to break the surface of the water. So we can send that data down, we can also send it back up, and you can, because you're doing this optically, send data at pretty fast rates. So there's a number of different applications we're looking at with MIDAR. It's still very early technology, so don't expect you know, big maps of coral with it just yet. Um, but you can see what the results look like in, if you illuminate corals just in the UV frequencies. They look very, very different than they do in the RGB frequencies. And that can, again, be used to identify their health, their, their bleaching status, as well as for us, the species type. We're looking to put this on underwater vehicles and submarines so we can do some deeper benthic imaging, much like we do on land with Landsat, but in the very, very deep. And then we're trying to fuse MIDAR with fluid lensing to gain a multispectral view with augmentation by waves. So those are the two instrument developments. Am I doing it on time? Okay. Um, and then NASA headquarters said, you're producing <laughs> terabytes and terabytes of data, you have to do something with it because coral reef biologists do not want terabytes of 3D data, you have to make it a little easier. Uh, so they encouraged me to create something called NEMONET, um, and we call this the Fluid Lensing Neural Network for Global Coral Reef Assessment, which sounds very wordy. Uh, essentially, this is a technology development that's purely mathematical. It's all machine learning, and we're just processing these massive data sets. So the goal, number one, and this is not a small goal if you work in corals, um, develop the most accurate algorithm for mapping reef systems. Reefs, as I learned to appreciate after proposing this and recognizing how difficult this is going to be, they have about 100 times the biodiversity of the Amazon rainforest per square meter, um, which makes classification of data sets very difficult because there's so many options, right? Just coral families globally, there's roughly 190 of them. Um, if you try to study this in a machine learning context, it's very difficult. So we, we said we want to do this. We're not going to back down. Um, two, we want to assess globally the dynamics of coral reef systems using technologies like this. The last two ones I won't talk about because they're more machine learning focused, but if you have questions, you can ask me later. I'll give you a, a little bit of detail on how we, how we do this in the background. But essentially, we're trying to classify the globe, all shallow reef systems, into these six different levels. So for the finest scale data we have, fluid lensing data, uh, we would classify corals into their families, level six data. Um, then going down in resolution um, to worldview, we would classify the globe at level three data. 
This would be geomorphologic zones of, of reef systems. And then globally, Landsat resolution, we're looking at level one data. You know, are we looking at land or are we looking at sea, salt ponds, inland reefs, um, these kinds of things. So um, what this allows us to do, NemoNet, is take very fine scale data from fluid lensing, which is captured only in small areas, right? I need hundreds of people like Romina King to take me to an island and map that reef, but we can't possibly map all the reefs with our aircraft at once. So the idea was can we somehow just distribute these samples globally in a way that is, captures the diversity of coral so we can use it to augment all of our satellite data sets, which do have global coverage. So there's airborne data sets we've got from USGS um, as well as NASA, and then we've got a number of commercial instruments like Pleiades 1A, uh, Worldview 2, 3, and 4, and then uh, we've got Sentinel and Landsat. So we have resolution scales that go across the board, and really the question was can we take, you know, 1% of the world's uh, corals and use it to somehow augment these lower resolution assets. So we developed a convolutional neural network architecture. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is how ads are targeted to you so effectively. <laughs> um, it's very popular in Silicon Valley to use these uh, machine learning networks which are modeled on human neural circuitry to process data sets, particularly image data sets. So our CNN takes in data from all these different instruments, FluidCam, MIDAR, uh, the Global Worldview Archive, as well as Sentinel and Landsat. That data set volume is roughly 12 petabytes of data. Um, and puts it all into one giant architecture. Then we implement domain adaptation, transfer learning, and super resolution. If you're familiar with those, I can go into them if you have questions. But essentially, these are ways in which we can interpolate between two different instruments that have different spectral properties. So for example, uh, Worldview sees in eight different spectral bands. Landsat sees in eight that are slightly shifted. You have to make them compatible. Uh, transfer learning allows us to interpolate between resolution levels. So FluidCam operates at the centimeter, sub-centimeter level. Um, airborne imagery is at the 10 centimeter level. So that's an order of magnitude jump. Landsat's at 10 meter level. That's another few orders of magnitude. So there's multiple problems in one. Um, and CNNs need training data to work. So if you right now go online and look up Chihuahua versus Blueberry Muffin, this is an unsolved problem in machine learning. It is very difficult without training data to separate these classes. Um, and I check and challenge you. If you think you're good, you will, you will realize it's not so easy. And there's multiple examples. You can look up bagels and sleeping dogs, or my favorite is the Hungarian sheepdog and mops, which is still difficult to do. Um, so we recognize that corals will have a similar complexity. Of, of false positives where you will not classify the right thing. So we need training data, but we also need to actually look at the environment like animals look at the environment. So we need to use the 3D nature of our data sets. And that's really um, what I think is the greatest contribution so far of NemoNet is we are asking users in a video game to train data in 3D, not 2D. So the, um, I'll give you a link at the end. You can download this, and I also have a demo here. Uh, you can start training data for us. You get trained and you level up as you play. You start off on a research boat that my designer created and I told him this is unlike any research vessel I've ever been on <laughs> and how pretty it looks. Um, but we could all dream <laughs> that that's what it could look like. You start off on that boat. There's a field guide that educates you a little bit about it. I think he put in a rocket. Um, there's different, uh, you rank up in the food chain as you get better at classifying corals. So you start off as a plankton and you go up to a whale shark. Uh, for older users, there's a tutorial that shows you how to navigate on iPads because I know this is not intuitive for a lot of people. Um, it's funny, we've done plane testing with second graders and they instantly know how to navigate in this 3D world. And we've done the same thing with PhDs in coral reef biology and they're struggling. Um, so we had to introduce, we had to introduce these concepts. All right, this shows some of the um, training and levels. So every time you, you classify a piece of coral, we get a little more confident in you. Just know that in the background we're measuring how well you're doing. We know the answers to the first 100 or so puzzles. And we're on the back end we're measuring, you know, how good are they? Are they getting to that 
confidence threshold. Once you reach that level, in the background, we start trusting you more, and we start taking in your inputs as real, and then using them to classify data sets. So as you get better and better, you'll get more and more classes. It'll get more complicated. You'll start getting to classify things like sea cucumbers. Um, we have eventually a class that is marine debris, for those who are interested in the room. And you, in the beginning, are shown the accuracy meter, just so you know, you know, we're very fair. <laughs> we say this is what the platonic ideal is, and you need to get there. So as you start classifying, you realize, okay, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. This is mounding coral, this is not a sea cucumber, and your accuracy starts going up slowly. Um, then we compare all of your inputs with other players across the network. So right now we have a few thousand people who are playing this, contributing results. If there's a large variance in, in two people's responses, and interestingly enough, the most dis discrepancies are with the professional coral reef biologists who <laughs> vehemently say that this is one type of coral and it's, it's not. Um, they all get sent to our server. Our server says, there's too much discrepancy, send it out again, and it gets reclassified. So this is one way in which we're able to clean the data to provide the, the neural network very clean training data. And then once we get a very clean result like this, um, we'll send it out again to the game, and you can then upvote or downvote um, your colleague, <laughs> and that then comes back to us. So if you upvote it, we think, okay, there's a little bit more confidence in this training, um, we'll, we'll consider it. If it gets upvoted enough times, eventually we'll, we'll pull it into our neural network and use it as a training model. So this is um, one of the prototypes of some of our data products. We start off again with the raw fluid lensing data, produce um, a distortion-free 3D map, take in all of the color data as well as the bathymetry data from that model, couple it to all the user inputs, and then perform our uh, neural network classification. So we can do this to get coral family. Um, I'm going to show next percent cover. What's interesting about this is the error bar at the bottom is 5% classification error. We can also look at morphology types. Um, this is at a 9% error. And the error usually goes down the more inputs we have for training. Once we have the model trained at really fine scales, we can then use our transfer learning and domain adaptation to look at the satellite resolution scales that don't have the benefit of knowing the 3D morphology of a coral, but we can classify a pixel confidently because we know we're looking at the same thing. So here's what a worldview scene looks like typically. I believe this is in uh, Paris Banjos. And this would be the NemoNet product for that region. So this is our 24 class product. Um, that's been trained again with only about 1% of that region being mapped with fluid cam and then being used to augment it. So I encourage you to download this if you'd like. Right now it's unfortunately only available on iOS, so you have to have an iPhone or an iPad. But uh, we will release an Android version later this summer and there'll be a desktop version also um, in fall and the final results will come out in December. You'll be able to not only train the data but view the product. So on the right hand side, there'll be a global viewer where you can go into your own backyard and say, How, how's my reef doing? And go back in time. Uh, one of the key advantages of using an augmentation approach is you can train data sets now in the present with 2019 data, but go back 10 years, 20 years to the Landsat archive and pull up data sets that you can augment because coral reef reflectances haven't really changed. The physics has not changed. So as long as you create enough training data for the present, you can go back in time and look at how these reef systems have changed over that period. So we're hoping this will be the follow-on to the, the last time an assessment this big was done was the Millennium Mapping Project in 2010, which identified where all the coral, um, shallow coral reefs are in the world. This would extend that further and try to go back the last four decades and look at how these systems changed as a function of human inputs or policy decisions. For example, sewage drains in certain islands in this world. So our upcoming and future work, um, we were just here a month ago and we'll be coming back through here again in September um, to go to Palau for our last NemoNet field campaign. This is to gather um, data in that one area. And then in, in December we'll be releasing some of our, our global products at AGU. So if you're there, come find me. Um, and we're also developing some new MITRE transmitters and writing uh, two proposals to extend this work to higher altitudes. So if anyone would like to collaborate, in particular we're looking for um, people who, who do coastal management as well as uh, reef systems around the world, we would love partners. So thank you very much for your time.
Oh, okay. <laughs> Questions? Have you tested during a bleaching event uh, or a coral dye that right after a bleaching event versus the lab? I'm very similar to the found. That's, that's a great question. And we strategically have not because we have a proposal currently in review that will address that topic. <laughs> so we're working with Coral Reef Watch and Mark Eakin to, to look at extending NemoNet into becoming a predictive neural network. So coupling it with ocean um, current models and temperature models, sea surface temperature models, we're trying to then predict and project for a particular area what the bleaching impacts will be, and then follow that up with satellite observations to validate and verify that, that was, the prediction was correct. Um, so talk to NASA headquarters and say, hey, you should fund this work. Uh, that would be great. Any other questions? All right. You're getting off easy. No other questions? All right. Here, here you go. I'm over here. I'm here now. Um, I'm wondering. Because I'm really an idiot with, about all this, I really don't know. So I'm going to ask a stupid question, probably. Um, how will this work, or will it work, with uh, LIDAR, data from LIDAR? So LIDAR uh, is subject to the same physical laws <laughs> that I'm working with. Uh, one of the reasons why terrestrial LIDAR does not work very well in water is because of refractive index jumps and waves. So uh, to give my frank opinion, I don't think LIDAR is right now anywhere near the resolution capability that we can get uh, with this system because it's not correcting for refraction. Uh, particularly in really shallow regions where the refractive distortion is large enough to confuse the sensor into thinking the time of flight measurement is, is different than what it actually is, it's really difficult. In deeper environments, it tends to work better, um, interestingly enough, until you get to the cutoff where there's not enough light coming back. Um, but I think an active sensor like LiDAR would be the best solution for this if there, if there can be some refraction correction. And right now, fluid lensing isn't directly compatible with LiDAR. It uses a very different method to measure reflectances. But it's a good question. Any other questions? I hope I didn't offend any LiDAR people in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to put all of the coral field biologists out of business with this technology? No, no, because we need, we need to know what we're looking at. We still don't know. We can fly the drone, but it, you know, unless it's classified correctly, it's not correct. Um, I do have some flyers, and I have a demo, and I just want to say that we spent extra effort to get all the new Guam data sets in before this conference. So if you want to play, you are playing when you, level one is Tumon and PD. So you should go online and take a look. Um, and there are dive tapes in it. Don't be alarmed. That's, that's meant to be there. Those are calibration targets. Um, but please, please do play. Thank you. OK. I would am very happy to bring up our last speaker of the day and of the symposium. And then we can all go thaw out outside. <laughs> Um, Dr. Yimnang Galbu is the CEO at the Palau International Coral Reef Center. His research interests include marine protected areas, impacts of local and global disturbance on reefs, and status and recovery of reefs over time. In 2013, he was awarded a Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation. He is a member of the Northern Reef Co-Management Committee, the Palau National Commission of UNESCO, the Palau National Marine Sanctuary Executive Committee, and Palau's point of contact for the US Coral Reef Task Force. He received his PhD in coral reef ecology at Southern Cross University in Australia. His invited talk was made possible by the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center at UOG through USGS grant number 31K315052R. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, staying this late uh, to hear this talk. And uh, thanks to University of Guam for uh, uh, supporting my uh, presence uh, here today. So when we talk about coral reefs, uh, I think for uh, people of, uh, of Palau and Guam and, and the Pacific Islands, uh, we're really talking about people. Uh, it's uh, people that depend on these uh, very important uh, resources. Um, they provide us uh, with many of our needs, uh, uh, food and nutrition. 
And they're also very important in uh, providing ecological services. And one of the important things that coral reef uh, can provide is coastal protection. We uh, look at the uh, um, protection that coral reefs uh, provide to the east coast of Palau, uh, Malgayok State, our capital building. And the coral reefs are able to reduce wave energy by uh, 80% uh, and protecting the coastline. So they're very important for that. And more recently, uh, they're very important to our economy. So I know here in Guam, we have a lot of tourists. Uh, in Palau, uh, when we ask people who come to Palau, why did they come to Palau? 86% uh, of, uh, of them said they come to dive and snorkel in the coral reefs. So very few people come to Palau for, for any other reasons. And so our uh, president uh, always joked that, uh, you know, Palauans, uh, we think we're attractive, but people don't come to Palau to see our faces. Uh, they come to see our coral reefs uh, and our marine environment. In 1998, we had a, a worldwide bleaching of, uh, event that affected the many reefs around the world, and it also affected uh, Palau. And this, uh, and this was uh, very widespread and very intense. 48% uh, of our coral splits, and 41% of those corals uh, eventually die, so 41% uh, mortality. This is a picture of a uh, Ngrumgal, uh, or long channel in Palau, a uh, uh, spawning aggregation site. Uh, and we have a picture on the left. This, uh, this was how it looked before 1998. And after 1998, right after 98, that's how it looked like. So uh, total um, devastation of the reefs, a uh, lot of that, uh, uh, mortality on the reefs. So after 1998, uh, the Palau International Coral Reef Center was established, and we started uh, looking at the reefs and looking at the recovery uh, from the 1998 bleaching event. So on the left is a map of Palau. Those uh, yellow dots are the, our monitoring sites. And on the right were the first data that we looked at uh, about the condition of the reefs. And if you see on the very right side, uh, um, you see the, uh, those high bars. Uh, and those are bay reefs, or these reefs that are uh, uh, in the bays, uh, mainly in the south part of Palau, in the Rock Islands. So when we were starting to look at the reefs and we look at this, uh, we, we were thinking that uh, either these bay reefs uh, did not bleach in 1998, or they were just recovering really fast uh, from the 1998 bleaching event. Uh, because uh, everywhere we saw very low uh, coral cover, but when we went to the Bay Reefs, we saw high coral cover. In 2010, we had another bleaching event, uh, and this was not as bad as 1998, uh, but we were able to uh, do surveys and understand uh, how this uh, 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 bleaching event affected the reefs. So we went to uh, around 80 sites around Palau, uh, um, over 200 transect, and look at thousands of corals uh, uh, to understand the effect of this bleaching event uh, uh, on the reefs and the corals in Palau. And this is a map of that event. Uh, this is work done with um, uh, Dr. Peter Hauk at the University of Guam and uh, uh, Fan Wo Sik at the uh, in Florida Institute of Technology. But when we look at the maps of Palau, so these are two maps. Uh, on the left side uh, is the temperature around Palau during the 2000 bleaching event. And on the right is the condition of the corals uh, around Palau. So if you look at the map on the left, uh, the areas that are in red, uh, those are in the areas that really got hot uh, during the bleaching event. And if you look uh, at the map on the right, uh, the blue areas are the areas that didn't bleach uh, when we did these surveys. And so if you see on the southern part, uh, you have these areas that are really red, and yet if you look on the map on the right, they're blue. That means that they did not bleach as much, uh, but it's not because the temperature did not get hot, that they uh, really uh, got uh, hot uh, during that time. So this, uh, uh, this show that the data that we initially had when we look at the recovery from 1998 is that we have these areas that 
seems to do better uh, with warm temperature. So it's not that they recovered really fast. Uh, it's because they just survived and they didn't blitz like other places in Palau. So this is a picture of this um, uh, of this area. One of this area uh, we used to call this uh, Nico Bay, but it's really a uh, Hermit Bay. So uh, you might see a lot of papers which says Nico Bay, but now we call it uh, Hermit Bay, the name of the village. Uh, but this is an area near land and uh, a lot of bays, a lot of rock islands in this area. But if we look at, if we do a transect, and I have that uh, yellow arrow going out to the ocean, if we look at the transect from inside the bay going out also, uh, we find that uh, there is a, a change in pH uh, as you go out from this bay. So inside the bay, the pH inside the bay uh, is equivalent to what is predicted for the end of this century. Uh, and this is the pH that in all uh, laboratory experiment, uh, they have shown that corals do not do well in this kind of pH. Uh, and the pH in this bay is also the same pH that you find in the carbon dioxide vents uh, uh, in Papua New Guinea and, and other places. Here in the Marianas, they also have uh, uh, carbon dioxide vents. Uh, and, this, and in this area, you find very low corals, uh, very low coral cover, not much corals. Uh, uh, but yet, in this space, uh, you see this very high coral cover. This is uh, a picture of this space uh, in Hermit Bay, uh, Hermit. And we've done surveys uh, all over Palau. We've done uh, surveys around Micronesia. Uh, we've done some surveys here in Guam. And this space has some of the highest coral cover uh, anywhere that we've seen. And yet, uh, they're not supposed to be like that uh, if you look at the pH of this bay and the temperatures uh, uh, in this bay. So what this tells us is that there are areas that uh, we can call um, resilient areas or refugia, areas that just seems to have corals that do better in terms of uh, low pH and low temperature. Uh, this is the area that I talk about in Papua New Guinea, uh, where you have this, uh, on the right side is a picture of this uh, uh, areas where you have carbon dioxide. Uh, these are natural areas where you have carbon dioxide coming out of the water and making the uh, pH of this area very low. Uh, and this is the area that uh, the pH in this area is similar to the pH in the base that we find in Palau. And then as you see from these pictures, there's very low coral cover, very low diversity, uh, a lot of um, uh, macroalgae in this area. And so, why is these areas in Palau different? And why are they able to survive when you have these carbon dioxide vents that uh, have the same pH and the corals are not uh, doing uh, quite as well? So one of the ideas that we came up with is that uh, this carbon dioxide uh, vents area, uh, they're, uh, they're not isolated. They're, connect they're connected with the areas that are normal areas uh, nearby. So the corals from outside this, CO, uh, this vent area, uh, th when they reproduce, you can have larvae coming to this area. And the corals in this area have larvae that goes out of this area. So there is really no strong uh, selective pressure on the corals in this area. But if we come to the bays, uh, these bays are very uh, isolated uh, because of the rock islands and because of the reef in this area. So we did some uh, modeling uh, in this space, uh, and we found out that it takes up to 72 days uh, for the water in this space to exchange. Now, there's some coral larvae that can survive that long, but most of the corals lar uh, coral larvae can settle within 72 hours. So they're ready to settle. And then the longer the coral larvae are in the, in the water, uh, the less successful they will be uh, in settling. And so we're thinking that was the isolation uh, from this space has allowed these corals to evolve and to, sur uh, to survive in this uh, condition. And so this is, uh, uh, in a way, uh, a good news uh, that shows that, uh, that corals might be able to, to evolve, uh, to survive in conditions that a lot of laboratory studies have shown that they're not able to survive in. This is a picture of a, a patch reef in Palau. Uh, we have a lot of patch reef in the lagoon, especially in the southern part of the Palau and west coast of Palau. And 
On this patch reef, we have this uh, crab wrasse and other species of corals. Uh, and during low tide, uh, uh, this patch reef get really hot. Uh, the temperature gets really hot. So on this patch reef, you also find corals that can uh, uh, tolerate uh, higher temperatures. So it's not just in the bays, uh, but in patch reefs all over uh, uh, the lagoons in Palau, you have these uh, tolerant corals. And if you take pieces of these corals and you put them in a, a tank, and you put the here in that tank and you raise temperatures, you find that some corals can survive up to 36 degrees Celsius. And that is very hard for corals. Most uh, uh, corals would uh, bleach at uh, uh, like 33 degrees or even lower than that. So even in this patch reef, we have uh, corals that are um, uh, very resilient to high temperature. And if you look at the, so this is a map of, uh, of Palau, the northern and the southern part of Palau. And if in those, all those red dots in this map uh, are places where we have uh, seen these uh, heat tolerant corals. So it's not just in the, uh, not just in the base, it's just not in the south, it's basically all over Palau. You have these corals uh, that are uh, heat tolerant. And this, uh, and this map shows some of these areas. So one of the, the work that uh, is being done with this information is the Coral Assist Program. This is led by uh, uh, James Kess from Newcastle uh, University. Uh, Laurie Raimundo is uh, part of this uh, group also. A lot of people are working on this project. And the idea is that if we have these corals uh, that we find here in Palau that uh, are heat tolerant, can we breed these corals Breathe the heat tolerant corals, and is that trait for heat tolerant? Uh, is that then transferred to the offspring? And then, if it's in, and if it's transferred to the offspring, uh, are there any trade off? So the uh, corals that are heat tolerant uh, would they be weaker against the wave, or or they wouldn't be able to grow as fast or reproduce? Are there any trade off if we if we have that trade? So this is one of the work that is uh, being done in Palau to to try to breed these heat tolerant corals and grow them. And then eventually the idea is that if we need to do restoration, if we need to do transplant, uh, we use corals that will be able to deal better with uh, uh, the projected increase in temperatures uh, that, is, uh, that we're faced with. Uh, now there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on how to make uh, restoration um, uh, at a scale that we need. And I think we already heard talks about that earlier. Uh, but at least this is one of the ways that if we figure out how to do restoration at a scale that needs to be done, we can use these corals uh, that are uh, uh, heat tolerant. So this is uh, uh, a picture of the, uh, some of the work that's been done, uh, reading the corals, uh, having them settled, and then putting it in the field and to look at uh, how successful they are. And the goal of this is that these corals would eventually uh, grow and then uh, reach the reproductive age, and then we can test their offsprings to see if that trait uh, for heat tolerant was able to transfer uh, to the next uh, generation. So we have these uh, heat tolerant corals. We have corals and sites that uh, can survive in lower pH, but it's also important that we minimize other threats. Uh, and we need to address all the threats. It's not just climate change threats, but we need to minimize local uh, threats. And one of the way that Palau uh, has decided that uh, 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 to uh, address some of the stress, uh, threats is the establishment of uh, protected areas, uh, but not only protected areas, a protected areas network. And the idea of a network is that there are other places, if we have these other places that have corals that are heat tolerant, those places can recede other areas uh, uh, during times uh, uh, after, like uh, after a bleaching event or after a, a disaster. So we've also uh, done some modeling looking at the uh, movement of fish and coral, car uh, uh, fish and coral larvae um, among the MPAs. And so these areas uh, that you see in red are the MPAs that are connected to each other uh, with the movement of their larvae. And we see that uh, uh, for the 
MPAs, we still have some gaps uh, in Palau that we need to fill, but a lot of the MPAs right now are connected, and it is important to have these connected uh, MPAs, uh, like I said, so they can help each other, uh, uh, help receive each other after uh, disturbance. And so uh, this is uh, my last slide, and I show you this earlier, uh, before 1998 and after 1998, and the, the bottom uh, picture is now. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, and we have, uh, uh, we have looked at this recovery, and uh, right now the eastern reefs, the southern reefs, most of the reefs of Palau have fully recovered uh, from that 1998 bleaching event. The East Coast uh, hasn't really, well, it recovered, but then it got destroyed by the two typhoons that we had, and uh, now it's starting its recovery. But all over Palau, the recovery has been really well. And so I think this is also uh, uh, good news uh, that uh, if we uh, minimize other local uh, threats, uh, coral reefs uh, left alone by themselves are able to recover. And the, uh, uh, they can reach the conditions. And this process of recovery uh, took nine to 12 years uh, for this to, to, to fully recover. So that is also the timeline that uh, we don't want uh, bleach, with the predictions with the future bleaching event, if they become, uh, very, uh, uh, if they occur uh, more often, uh, coral reefs might not able to recover. Uh, because in, in this, uh, we saw from the reefs in Palau that it took tw uh, nine to 12 years uh, for them to fully recover. Them. That's it, thank you uh, very much. A uh, lot of the work uh, that we're doing in Palau is really through partnership with a uh, lot of different universities, a lot of different organizations, uh, uh, people from the University of Guam and other places. Uh, and I think uh, the, the problems and the issues that we're facing, uh, it, it is uh, uh, important that a uh, lot of different groups uh, come together and work uh, on this issue. And that uh, we do not say that uh, uh, that is not uh, uh, some ideas we shouldn't try. I remember a while back that a uh, uh, lot of uh, people didn't believe in restoration and they, they said that it's a waste of time, it's not practical. Uh, but uh, every meeting I go to now, uh, everybody talks about restoration. And it's because we realize that uh, we don't have any other choice. Uh, with the increase in carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide emissions and all the threats that are facing coral reefs, we need everything. We need marine protected areas, we need uh, restoration, and we need uh, to address plastic pollution, and we need NASA to come up with uh, the new technology. <laughs> and, and we all need to come together to, to to address all the challenges facing us. Thank you very much. I, I was curious if you knew the heat tolerance of the, the corals that, that seem to be more tolerant for high temperatures. Is that a, a character of the corals themselves or is it a character of the zooxanthellae that are living within them or could you tell? Yeah, um, so there's also uh, a group uh, from Penn State uh, looking at that. And in the base, there seems to be a unique uh, zooxanthellae um, uh, uh, that most of the corals have uh, in the base. But uh, the, the work that has been done doesn't show that it's a certain sosanteli uh, that is resp responsible for the heat tolerance. So, so it's probably something uh, with a coral animal itself. Here. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, great talk. Uh, my question was about also those, those heat tolerant corals. I assume those differences are uh, intraspecific, so, so within, within one species there's places where there's, there's more resilient corals and then there's places where there's less resilient corals. Are those patterns consistent across species? Is there like... I guess that's the uh. Uh, like if you find certain places to have a lot of heat tolerant corals, 
is that true for multiple different species or is that something that you just looked at in one species so far? Oh, no, there are several uh, species uh, that have those. So every population, you would have some uh, colonies uh, that, that have that uh, heat tolerant ability. And so the idea is that uh, uh, if we identify those, uh, and uh, uh, we had a bleaching in 98 and uh, a small one in 2010. So we're not waiting for the, another bleaching event to, look, to identify those heat tolerant uh, corals. So we're collecting uh, small fragments and bring them in the lab and then uh, put them in this uh, um, like coolers and, 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 and uh, heating them up to see if they, if they survive the uh, increase in temperature. Thank you. It's amazing work and makes me feel hopeful <laughs> for once. Um, do you know if any of this work has applied to Gorgonians or soft corals for the Caribbean? We've, yeah, uh, I don't know. We haven't uh, worked with uh, Gorgonians, uh, but I would assume they sh we should, uh, just because on um, natural variation, we should be able to see that also in soft corals. So. Hi. Uh, Curious about the recovery on Kyangal. Have you been up to Kyangal uh, after Haiyan? Uh, how are the corals doing up there? Yeah, the the recovery has been uh, it's been slow on the whole east coast uh, and even in Kyangal. Uh, what is interesting is Norwangal, even further up uh, north. Uh, uh, Norwangal used to have this really big staghorn uh, uh, corals. And now it's coming back with the different corals, more like the uh, digitif rather, digitate corals, and those staghorn corals are not coming back. And so the people of Kayangl are uh, concerned that maybe that's why, even though Rwangal is a marine protected area, uh, uh, the recovery, the fish populations are not at the level that they would, uh, that they would like to see. Uh, and the, when we were doing the modeling work, it seems like uh, Ngarwangal is not really not connected. And a lot of the uh, larvae just goes off into the ocean and it's not connected uh, with other islands. And so we're thinking that's uh, one of the reasons why the recovery of Ngarwangal is not the same as in the main island. Thanks. Mm. Any more questions? Okay, thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. Okay, um, I thought that was a really fantastic day with some really amazing talks. So thank you all very much to everyone who spoke. Um, we had a really good diversity of speakers and topics covered. Um, Fenner talked about the adaptive capacity of coral reefs, hope for the future, the importance of rehabilitating live coral cover and structural complexity to maintain ecosystem services and protect human communities. He presented us with seven ways that we can help preserve reefs for tomorrow by reducing threat threats, propagating survivors, et cetera, engaging reef users. So again, coming back to human beings. Lori, Dr. Ramundo, talked to us about compensatory mitigation, uh, transplanting corals to improve habitat condition here on Guam, using a holistic approach that considers not just corals, but the entire coral reef community, the fish, the invertebrates, et cetera. And she is working uh, with this work and other projects to develop um, best practices for reef restoration on Guam. From Anna Marie, we heard about how macro debris and meso debris degrade to become micro debris, how these uh, particles can enter our water and air, become consumed by fish and birds, and contaminate the food chain. Also, how they uh, can impact corals when they're um, ingested as part of marine snow. And um, plastic can also cause coral diseases um, and further damage corals. 
But again, going back to human beings, these microplastics are getting into our food system and into our bodies, and uh, the full effects of that aren't known yet. And then from Vade, um, how we can overcome distortion in caused by refraction using fluid lensing technology and MIDAR to get better imagery of corals and find more efficient and effective ways to monitor, the, monitor them at larger scales. And then how the NemoNet neural network can be used to map reef re reef ecosystems and assess change, again, using people, harnessing the power of the public and our communities to get involved. Um, and also how challenging it is to distinguish a chihuahua from a blueberry muffin. <laughs> Um, Yim talked about the impacts of the 1998 bleaching event on Palau's reefs and their surprising recovery. So sometimes these systems that we look at and we see their mortality and it's so upsetting to us. Sometimes I think if I didn't study coral reefs, I would study the people who study coral reefs because <laughs> sometimes it's pretty depressing. But these systems are shockingly adaptive and resilient and they have survived for uh, Billions of years, millions of years, million, hundreds of millions of years. So, um, and in Palau, they found these shockingly healthy corals in low pH conditions and in high temperatures. So these corals do exist, these survivors. So, um, is there hope for our reefs? I think there is, and I think that maintaining this hope is absolutely vital to the success of the work of all of the people in this room and coral researchers and managers around the world. Um, we know that we are going to lose some corals and that corals are going to change, but I think what we really need to focus on is how can we help the survivors survive better? How can we reduce local stressors? How can we increase protection? And how can we rehabilitate and restore our reefs as needed? And once again, this all relies on people. The coral reefs are not the problem, but we are also the solution. So we need to do outreach, we need to do education, and we need to be effective science communicators. Um, and I wanted to end with a little bit of a call to action, because I'm bossy. And <laughs> um, something that we need to do is make changes in our own lives. So um, we should all calculate our carbon footprint. We, many of us traveled to get here. Can we consider buying carbon offsets? Can we reduce our meat consumption? I'm a vegetarian, not wasting away, doing fine. Um, can we decrease our plastic consumption? So not just straws and grocery bags. Um, Val Brown always has Tupperware in her purse. So every time we get takeout, Val whips out her Tupperware. It's a great habit. Um, so how can we think about these little things that I do think all make up to make a difference? Uh, how can we share conservation messages and stories on social media, at parties? on dive boats, I'm not very popular on dive boats, but how can we really get these messages out at every possible opportunity? And then I encourage all of you, before you leave tonight, or before you leave this week, to meet someone new, form a new partnership, build a new collaboration, um, and see how we can work better together to inform our work and our efforts. And if you need a little liquid courage for that, there is a poolside reception from six to eight. So hopefully everyone um, will make it out there tonight. And I just wanted to say thank you all very much for coming out. I think this has been a great event. Um, and hopefully we'll see you, hopefully we won't do this next year, maybe the year after next year. Um, so Sisu Asmaasi, thank you.